Hello guys, welcome to the channel today we are talking about. What if Luffy and Zoro went back in time part 2? Luffy and Zoro awaken in two different parts of East Blue, both with the same thing on their mind. Protect the crew. There would be no failures this time around, Captain's orders. As bits and pieces of the unknown past that the two comrades share are gradually revealed, the rest of the crew can only speculate. For all their absolute resolve, they're hiding something. If you enjoy the video, please like and subscribe it will help us make more videos for you now let's begin, they had to make it out. I couldn't help them. The battle that ensued on the sea leading up to last island of a new world changed everything. It was truly the turning point of an era. It just wasn't what the Straw Hats had had in mind when they'd thought about it. Akainu, Kizaru, and Ryokuju were relentless. They tried to escape on the ship at first with a coup de burst, but the admirals would have none of it. They soon found themselves far too preoccupied with staying alive to even think about escaping, their only choice being to fight. Zoro and Sanji would have actually had the latter two admirals at disadvantages despite their own fatigue if they weren't constantly distracted by the peril that the other straw hats were in. I couldn't protect them. Luffy tried to fight Akainu. He really did. But his body was running on dot no, he didn't even know what it was running on anymore. He didn't even know how he was still standing. Much less attempting to ward off volcanic eruptions. He could barely feel the burns anymore. His body was numb. His senses were numb. And as the battle continued, his spirit numbed as well. I couldn't save them. Six times Zoro and Sanji lost their heads and attempted to ditch their fights in favor of running to the side of a fallen comrade, and six times they were rewarded with pierced organs and crushed bones. Six times Luffy lacked the strength to even let out an agonized wail. Chopper was the first to fall his desperate rumble having left him defenseless. Usopp was next, and then Nami, Robin, Brooke, and Frankie all followed. After half an hour, six were left standing. Zoro and Sanji locked eyes, and a long conversation seemed to pass between them in a few seconds as Zoro's expression changed from desperation, to fury, to agony, and finally settled on resigned acceptance. Luffy could no longer resist enough to refute the plan the two had forced upon him. Sanji held the fort against two winded admirals and one fresh one as Zoro grabbed Luffy and fired off one last wind slash as he fled. The admirals dodged, mindlessly jumping off the small, restricted space of the Sunny's deck, and Sanji quickly followed. The marine warship that Ryokuju attempted to land on was fried by Sanji's explosive kick. And after one last charge in the name of mindless justice, the devil fruit user was kicked into the sea. Akainu and Kizaru lost their heads for split second, and that was the deciding factor. They charged Sanji, knowing they couldn't recover their comrade without losing this fight themselves. Whatever mobility their devil fruit allowed them couldn't compare to Sanji's skywalk and he relentlessly kept them at bay despite the damage his body was taking from the laser and magna blasts. Live on, Luffy. If you ever gave a shit about any of us, you'll live on. Luffy's eyes were forced closed by the weights of his exhaustion, and in that moment, his entire world was the demeanor of his crewmate in his last act of martyrdom. The thousand sunny shot off into the atmosphere with a coup de burst, and Luffy knew no more. I let them die. Luffy woke up in a cold sweat and immediately shot upright in his bed. It took his brain a moment to process the concept of a nightmare and another to convince himself that th. Flashback had been just that. The dreams were always so vivid. Even the pain that his mind invented didn't wake him up. He raised his hand over bloodshot eyes and slowly climbed out of bed, taking a deep breath. He walked out the door and onto the deck of the Going Merry. He spotted Zoro leaning over the railing, green hair following the path o. The cold night wind. Luffy walked up beside him and stared out over the sea, still trying to get the images out of his head. Couldn't sleep? Zoro asked. Luffy shook his head. Which one of them was it this time? All of them, he replied. 
Zoro was silent for a minute. It won't happen again. We're here for a reason, Zoro reminded him. That reminder alone seemed to give Luffy strength, and he nodded. For a long while, they silently looked. Out over the dark waters, leaving each other to their thoughts. Luffy finally spoke up. Hey, Zoro? How strong do you think you are right now? Zoro thought for a moment. A little stronger than I was after our two years of training, I guess, he answered. How about you? About the same, Luffy replied honestly. They were thinking the same thing, but Zoro voiced it. We really need to get into shape, he said. Not just us, Luffy replied. Zoro shot him a curious look. Tomorrow, we start hockey training with the rest of the crew, he said. Zoro blinked. Already? The sooner the better. An excited grin made its way onto Zoro's face. Sounds like fun. Luffy smiled despite the lingering tension in his mind and body. Go easy on them, he said as he turned and walked away. No promises. Nami, Usopp, and Sanji stared at Luffy and Zoro in confusion. Haki? Usopp repeated. Those techniques that you use? Can we really learn those Luffy? Luffy nodded. Zoro has mastered them too. There are three types of Haki. One is Conquerors, which isn't an option for you guys unless I've completely missed something, but... Anyone can learn the other two. I'll demonstrate those now. Which of you wants to volunteer? Nami and Usopp both turned to Sanji, who shrugged and walked up to Luffy. Luffy turned around so that his back was facing Sanji. Try to kick me. As many times as you want. Sanji raised an eyebrow. Is this dipshit serious? Yes, Sanji, I'm serious. And I'm not a dipshit. Not unless I want to be. Sanji blinked in surprise. Did he just... Read my mind? Luffy finished. Not exactly. If you want an explanation, you better start kicking. Sanji, who was extremely curious now, started doing just that. He started. With one swift kick, expecting Luffy to get shot overboard. But Luffy swayed out of the way of his kick, coming back to his initial position once Sanji brought his foot back. Sanji frowned, and then kicked three more times. Three more times Luffy dodged. A tick developed over Sanji's eye. He attempted to sweep Luffy's legs only for Luffy to jump over his foot, and then launched into a full-on barrage of kicks, which were all dodged as well. Finally, he stopped. This game sucks, he said plainly. It's no game, Luffy said, turning around. That was observation hockey. It allows you to sense a living being's aura as it radiates off of them. The most obvious use of this skill is that you can sense where people are, and the most practical use is arguably that you can predict what a person is going to do next in a fight before they even start doing it. But those are just the most basic uses. Once you get really good, you can sense things like the type of being, its strength, and its emotions. With full mastery, you can even hear individual thoughts as they go through someone's mind if you focus hard enough. The straw hats were silent as they took in this information. Sanji himself was getting kind of excited thinking about the potential of such a skill. So, you really were reading my mind earlier? Sanji asked in amazement. Luffy shook his head. It's not really reading your mind. I can't tell what you were thinking a minute ago, just what you're thinking when I listen in. And even then, it's a much more vague feeling than that. It's not as if I'm hearing what you're thinking. It's more like I'm feeling what your emotions are with extreme precision. People who train in observation hockey, along with training to suppress their auras so that they're more difficult to keep track of, usually trained to control their emotions so that it's harder to know what they're thinking. I'm not much good at that, though. But anyway, that's observation hockey. Next. Luffy pointed to his forehead with his thumb. Kick me in the head as hard as you can. I won't move this time. Sanji didn't question it this time, his curiosity getting the better of him, and he spun around on his palm for momentum before kicking Luffy's head full on with a kinkus. Luffy didn't budge. 
Sanji grimaced and got up. How'd it feel? Luffy asked. Like I was kicking a steel wall. Hurt like hell, Sanji replied. Right. That's armament hockey, Zoro cut in. It allows one to coat a body part in an invisible suit of armor to strengthen both attack and defense. Unlike observation hockey, which is pure mental training, this is half mental and half physical. Your mind and body have to be in sync for it to work. Doubt is your worst enemy. Even a true master of armament. Haki can lose to a novice at it if he's hesitating. Unlike Conqueror's Haki, which is fully powered by one's will, armament is a power that's fueled partially by will and partially by bodily training. Once you get good at it, you can imbue weapons and other objects with it, and with enough mastery, you can use armament hardening. Luffy brought his arm up at his side, and the straw hat swatched as it darkens to a shiny obsidian black. That lets you harden the entire mass of a body part or weapon wraith. Then just coating it, making it preferable in some situations. If you're using hockey on something extremely large, like a giant inflatable limb, go with hardening if you can. Luffy almost laughed as Nami, Usopp, and Sanji looked at Zoro like he was an idiot. Usually for strengthening solid objects, hardening is the best choice. It's not an option when strengthening non-solid or immaterial attacks though. Zoro turned back to Luffy, who was thoroughly impressed. Zoro was good at explaining the stuff that Luffy had ingrained without really thinking about it. Did I miss anything? Devil fruit defenses, Luffy stated, and Zoro nodded, giving him the floor. Sometimes you'll run into devil fruit users who can change the nature of their very bodies. Sanji, you might kick someone only for your leg to go right through them and burn in the process when they turn into fire itself. Armament hockey allows you to bypass devil fruit defenses and attack the dormant human body. I'm actually a pretty good example. When Nami masters armament hockey, I'll be in deep shit. Usopp snickered at this while Nami looked a him indignantly. So, that's hockey, Luffy finished. During our journey, Zoro and I will be teaching it to you guys so you can learn it early. If you master it soon, it will be a huge advantage in the early stages, but once we get further into the Grand Line, it will be an absolute must. Most people who enter the second half of the Grand Line and survive either know hockey or learn it sink or swim. Most people specialize in one of the two types. Um, Luffy, Nami began hesitantly, is there any reason why you're teaching this to all of us? Luffy smiled at her reassuringly. If you're worried that you don't have what it takes, don't be. I've seen what you guys are made of firsthand. You can do it. Nami smiled softly back at him after hearing this. But as for the reason, I won't lie to you. Our journey is going to get dangerous. There will come a time when every member of our crew will need to be able to defend themselves against powerful opponents. I can't be everywhere. Nami and Usopp's eyes widened at this revelation, and they both adopted focused expressions. So, then, when do we start? Sanji asked. Luffy thought he detected a hint of eagerness in his voice. He grinned. Now. It was an interesting training session. Nami checked the log pose every now and then, but most of their time was dedicated to getting the concepts down. Basic observation ha. Huh? Training involved putting on a blindfold and trying to move out of the way of an approaching object. Luffy decided to get creative and have them play tag with each other with blindfolds on. That was the most hilarious disaster he'd ever had the pleasure of directly causing. By the time Zoro called for them to stop. They were all pretty pissed off. Especially Nami. Armam and hockey training usually involve taking blows from a sparring partner head-on without dodging until you build up a resistance to them, but Sanji would never agree to. Zoro hitting Nami, so they basically set up training dummies and had to three-punch them with their bare hands. Eventually their fists would build up a resistance to the hard material. Eventually. By the end of the day they were all mentally exhausted, the result being dot absolutely nothing. But Luffy had expected that. No one had a breakthrough on his or her first day of 
draining. It simply didn't happen, unless the power was already awakened on the battlefield. Good first day, everyone, Luffy commented. And don't be discouraged. I felt like I was making zero progress when I first started, but this practice will pay off soon enough. H. Smiled cheerfully and he walked away along with Zoro, leaving the three in an exhausted heap on the deck of the ship. Luffy frantically jumped behind his cover, analyzing his surroundings and options at speeds that made his brain want to go on strike. He could jump out and try to land a hit. Before he was hit himself, but he knew his opponent would be waiting for him. That was asking for trouble. He considered his other options. Armum and hockey would do him no. Good. If he took one more hit he was done. Using his devil fruit was out of the question right now, so he couldn't even stretch. What did he have left? A plan quickly formed in his mind and he smiled vindictively. I've got you now. He only had one shot at this. His opponent was in almost as bad a shape as he was in right now. He would have to slow him down long enough to land the first hit. He rose up from behind his cover, and saw the sign of his opponent's assault, the tensing of his arm muscles. He quickly let out a burst of conqueror's hockey. It wouldn't be enough to stop him, but it would slow him down long enough for him to dodge in and this. His opponent faltered, and Luffy sidestepped the threatening projectile that came a second too late. He coded his own weapon of choice in armament hockey and hurled it at his opponent. Only the man's face was visible over his cover, but the hardened projectile shot straight through his defense and hit him right in the chest, stunning him long enough for Luffy to get two more shots to his face. The man's eyes widened as he realized it was over. Ha! Take that! Luffy shouted. That's 10-9 Usopp. You lose. Usopp stood up and pointed accusingly at him. You cheated, you bastard. You used that conqueror whatever thing on me. He shouted indignantly. Oh, come on, you sop, Luffy said in annoyance. You banned me from using Soru, Jeppo, Observation Hockey, and my Devil Fruit. You have to give me something to work with. Here. Do I look like I have any of those things at my disposal? You sop grumbled. Luffy and Usopp's snowman making contest had quickly led to a snowman vandalizing contest, Wick. In turn had escalated to an all-out snowball fight in which Usopp had the advantage due to his higher ground, sniping skills, and discipline to save up his ammo rather than randomly chucking snow all over the place and yelling snow gattling like Luffy. I still say you cheated, Usopp complained. Best two out of three. You're on. I'll beat you three out of four if I have to. Luffy yelled. You mean three out of five, Usopp corrected. Oh, yeah? Well, guess what? What? Usopp asked lazily. Nami watched from inside the ship in exasperation as Luffy tackled Usopp into a pile of snow. How can those two have so much energy in this weather? Hell, how can the weather even be like this? It was sunny ten minutes ago. Suddenly a large hunk of snow hit the window, rattling it and startling her. Annoyed, she opened the door. If you two have time to play in the snow, why don't you make yourselves useful? Oh, yeah? Well, what about you? Luffy said with a pout. Shouldn't you be checking the log pose? I checked it two minutes ago. Nami yelled. A lot can happen in two minutes, Luffy replied. Usopp just lost his two-point lead in two seconds. Something like our ship getting turned around isn't anywhere near as miraculous as that. Nami looked at him as if he was an idiot and walked back inside to check the log pose before shrieking. Turn our ship around 180 degrees. We're going the wrong way. Usopp looked at her skeptically, but Sanji just shrugged and obliged. How did that even happen? The waves have been completely steady. For our ship to get turned around like that. The Grand Line sure is interesting, Luffy commented. As if to challenge his nonchalance, the wind suddenly picked up, and a storm seemed to brew out of nowhere. Nami quickly took command and the crew took action, 
closing the sails and constantly changing their course to account for the supernatural waves that seemed to throw them off at every turn. Iceberg, dead ahead. Yusov shouted. I got it. Gamu Gamu no pistol. Luffy's punch shattered the iceberg and the ship sailed through without a scratch, only to be taken off course again. After moving the rudder, few more times and then supervising it to make sure their course was steady, they finally unfurled the sails again. The storm left as spontaneously as it had come, and all but. Luffy and Zoro collapsed to the deck, Luffy having laughed through it all, and Zoro having slept through it all despite Nami's several shouts for him to wake the hell up. Finally, H. yawned tiredly and opened his eyes. He took a look around and frowned. What, sleeping on the job? Look alive, guys. Nami slowly turned her head towards the hypocritical and borderline narcoleptic swordsman and stomped her way over to him. There was a large splash behind the going Mary. Man overboard. Usopp shrieked, and Luffy started laughing again. Zoro climbed back onto the ship as Nami stomped away angrily. What's her problem? She eats some bad meat or something? He asked yawning again. Impossible. No such thing, Luffy said firmly. Land ho! Usopp's shout brought everyone to the front of the ship, where they all stared out over the horizon at their stop in the Grand Line. Luffy grinned in excitement. This is gonna be fun. Welcome, pirates. Most of the straw hats looked on in confusion as the entire town met their ship at the docks, waving, whistling, and cheering. Welcome to the Grand Line. Welcome to Whiskey Peak. Welcome, Warriors of the Sea. A town that welcomes pirates? Sanji asked skeptically. The Grand Line sure is a strange place. We should probably sleep with our eyes open, Zoro commented. Sanji and Usopp thought he was joking of course. Unbeknownst to them, Zoro was half serious and Nami was. Already planning on doing just that. Sanji quickly forgot his skepticism as multiple women waved and blew kisses at him, and Usopp was a lost cause after the warriors of the Say. Comment. A tall man with freakishly curly hair met them at the docks once they dropped anchor, and greeted them cheerfully. Welcome, pirates. I am Mayorai Garapoi. This is Whiskey Peak, the Grand Line's most hospitable rest stop. We invite you to take a rest from your courageous and weary. Adventures to enjoy the food, drink, music, and cheerful atmosphere before you resume your journey. There was a moment of pseudo-hesitation before Sanji was flirting with a multitude of women and Luffy and Usopp were dancing through the streets as the townsfolk cheered them on. Nami face palmed and sighed. Are they all idiots? She whispered to Zoro. He shrugged. Either that, or they're much better actors than the people in this town. Nami frowned and thought. Now that she thought about it, Luffy was usually more insightful than this. Despite his cheerful and carefree persona, she didn't have much hope for the other two, but could Luffy just be going along with it? He was being very convincing if he was. She decided to go with the flow as well, resolving to milk the situation for whatever it was worth once given the opportunity. There was no way anything could happen with Zoro on guard at the very least. But she still found it strange. Zoro had made that comment in a lazy tone, but she somehow got the feeling that he had been referring to Luffy to begin with. She frowned again. As she thought about the nature of the two's interactions, she sometimes felt like they could communicate telepathically or something. Her eyes widened as she remembered. Their lecture on observation hockey. Masters of the skill could apparently read thoughts via the emotions that drove them as long as those emotions weren't being suppressed, so. Theory, Luffy and Zoro could communicate non-verbally in a limited fashion. That was how they always held conversations without a single word. They were speaking with each other through conveyance of emotions. But something like a conversation still wouldn't be possible with emotions alone. Something like that needed context. She thought back to that day in the bar in Shell's town and the first interactions she had witnessed between the two. For the first time she wondered when they had met. Did they really know each other so well that they could make an 
educated guess as to what the other was thinking and only need a quick confirmation using observation hockey to signal messages? If they really deserved the credit that she was giving them right now, then there was really no doubt that Luffy was acting. If Zoro knew, Luffy knew. Suddenly, the thought of what her two crewmates could supposedly do made her self-conscious. She peeked at Zoro through the corner of her eye and tried to get a read on him. If he was reading her emotions right now, he didn't show it. It wasn't that Nami didn't trust them with that kind of knowledge, but it would take quite a bit of restraint for her to not exercise a power like that liberally if she could use it. As they continued walking, Nami turned to Zoro, her curiosity getting the better of her. Hey, Zoro? How long have you known Luffy? Zoro looked at her curiously, but responded truthfully. About two and a half years. That made sense. Bonds like that could be developed in less time depending on the circumstances. This simply confirmed her suspicions. Luffy and Zoro knew each other as we. If not better, then they knew themselves. Once Luffy had cleared all the food from the premises and caused the chefs to faint, their hosts started a drinking game with the prize of 100,000 belly. Nami readily took part. Luffy and Zoro followed suit, staring each other down from across the table. Once it started, it really started. The three straw hats had the rest of the participants puking and passing out in a matter of a minute, and they continued to chug, eventually abandoning the cups in favor of the bottles, as it was taking too long to pour. As the drink off continued, the mayor seemed to be more and more troubled by something. Inwardly, the mayor was fuming. The three should have passed out long before now. They had been strengthening the concentration of the alcohol in their drinks discreetly and he. They started drinking right from the bottle and taking away the opportunity. But even without that added punch, they should have passed out ages ago. What were these three? Made of? He signaled to Miss Monday to initiate Plan B, and she rigged the next batch of bottles with sleeping drugs. It was right as the swordsman and the straw hat kid got ready to chug those bottles as well that they finally collapsed to the floor. The woman seemed to frown at the sight. What was that about? Was she disappointed in them? No, it was more like dot confusion. Mr. Eight filed away the observation as irrelevant as the woman passed out as well. He scoffed. What an annoying coincidence it was that they had all passed out right after they'd taken the effort to rig the booze. Mr. Eight would face palm in embarrassment when he thought back on this later. It wasn't long before the other two pirates had fallen asleep as well, content expression on their faces. Too bad those won't last, I Garam thought grimly. He met up with Miss Monday, Mr. Nine, and Miss Wednesday and described their victims to the Nine couple. The two seemed to be disconcerted when they saw them, but they didn't voice it, so Mr. Eight ignored it. Was all this necessary, Mr. Eight? Miss Monday asked in a slightly annoyed tone. We could have taken care of them at the port. It was only five people. You should know well by now not to carelessly underestimate our victims, Miss Monday, he said as he pulled out two wanted posters. Three pairs of eyes widened to epic proportions at what they saw. A total bounty of 73 million belly. Miss Wednesday whispered in awe. Them? Looks can be deceiving, Mr. Eight said simply. Miss Monday nodded apologetically. No matter. Hurry and search their ship while we restrain them. It's preferable to take them out of. The rewards will be 30% less if we kill them. Sorry to interfere with your plans, a new voice came, and the four bounty hunters stiffened as they turned toward the roof of the nearest building. But would you mind letting them sleep for a little while longer? They're pretty worn out from our trip here. What in the world? Mr. Aids exclaimed. How is that swordsman still conscious? How did he escape? What happened to the idiots who were watching them? Oh, those guys were guards? Zoro asked lazily. No wonder they attacked me. He scratched his head, and then a cold, bone-chilling smile stretched out across his face. The apostrophe V. Seen better days. It seems this man has seen through our fabrications, 
Miss Monday assessed calmly. We will simply have to kill this one. Mr. A nodded grimly. Too bad, Zoro said. As a rule I don't like cutting up people who give me booze, but I can't have you killing me, now, can I? He paused. So, I guess I'll take you on. H. Raised one sword out of three and pointed at the four of them. Baroque works. Mr. Eight's breath caught in his throat. How dot how did you know? He asked in horror. I know a lot of things, he said simply. Some of which I could use to kill every one of you without having to lift a finger. There are only about a hundred of you. Taking into account the size of your organization, you all seem pretty expendable to me. Mr. Eight's eyes widened as he actually started to feel an irrational fear of the man's words. Was it? Because he had hit the nail on the head? But what more could he possibly know? Zoro's smile turned menacing as he pointed off to the distance. Mr. Eight slowly followed his finger to a nearby tree, and his fear multiplied. There, perched in a tree, were an otter and a vulture. The unluckies. I wonder what would happen to you all, he began, if I revealed the identity of Mr. Zero to you here and now. The terror on the four number agents' faces grew with every word as the unluckies listened on intently. Mr. Eight felt his heart beat in his throat. He knew the answer to that. Question. He habitually calculated the risk of knowing who the head of the organization was every day. But how could this man possibly know who their boss was? He wasn't Eve. Part of the organization. It was impossible. And yet, he already knew so much that he shouldn't. Who is he? Of course, Zoro continued, it won't have to come to that, will. It? His smile vanished and their blood froze as he glared. After all, this is just the Grand Line's friendly local rest stop, right? They all gulped at the open threat. If they let these high bounties go, their standing within the organization would be at risk. But if they pressed on and it turned out the man wasn't bluffing, they were all as good as dead. Mr. Eight gritted his teeth in frustration. They couldn't take a risk like this. Not now. Call off the others, he said quietly. These pirates leave unharmed. Mr. Nine and Miss Monday looked at him like he was insane, while Miss Wednesday just nodded slowly in. Understanding. It seems you can be reasoned with. Smart choice, Zoro said smugly. Mr. Eight turned to the still staring agents. What are you waiting for? Go wake up the pirates and tell them they can't stay any longer. He shouted. Realizing that he was leaving no room for argument, Mr. Nine and Miss. Monday left in a hurry. They arrived back where the pirates were being kept, only to find not one, but three of them missing. They seethed. Would their humiliation never end? They quickly ran back out to locate them, and found the kid with the straw hat, the one with the higher bounty standing on the docks with his back to them. He was pissing in the water. No, it was clear that their humiliation would not end anytime soon. Hey, straw hat kid! Mr. Nine yelled. The kid ignored them as he continued emptying his load over the docks. M. Nine recoiled at the sheer idiocy of the situation and was about to shout again when the kid finally turned around and faced them. You know, you really shouldn't disturb someone. Who's trying to take a piss, he said. Now that I'm done, what is it? Miss Monday looked like she was trying extremely hard not to kill the kid right then and there. Mr. Nine took a deep breath. I'm afraid our town cannot accommodate your crew in longer. We must ask you all to leave. Luffy hummed thoughtfully. Well, that's too bad. The food and drink here are really good. At least when they're not sabotaged. The two agents' eyes widened at the implicatio of the statement. The kid smirked. So, I guess Zoro talked some sense into you guys, then? Don't feel too bad. It's not just you. A lot of people think he's scary. Their minds were going haywire. How many of them had seen through the charade? What was it about this crew that continued to blow their expectations to the wind? I'll go. Wake up my crewmates. The kid continued. Thanks for the party. It was fun. 
And with that, he walked back into the building where his comrades were located. Mr. Nine and Ms. Monday ran back to meet Mr. Eight only to freeze upon their arrival. It seemed their bad luck just wouldn't run dry today. Standing across from Miss Wednesday and Mr. Eight, who by all rights should have been suffering from an aneurysm by this point, was their collective death sentence in the form of a couple by the code names of Mr. Five and Miss Valentine. Mr. Five, Mr. Eight choked, barely getting the words out, we can explain. There's a reason why we failed our mission this time. Failed your mission? Mr. Five asked in a bored tone. I can't say I really care about that. We're here for a different reason. A different reason? Mr. Eight repeated dumbly. Miss Valentine laughed mockingly. You didn't really think we'd come all the way to the beginning of the Grand Line just to supervise your unimportant mission, did you? She asked. Then, why are you here? Miss Wednesday asked carefully. We've been assigned a mission by the boss, Mr. Five answered. His exact words were someone knows my secret. Miss Wednesday and Mr. Eight had both adopted expressions of horror once again, while their partners just looked back and forth between them in confusion. Now, I don't know what that secret is, but I do know that Burrow Quirks is an organization sworn to secrecy. If someone were to find out something that the boss didn't want, them to know, they'd have to be eliminated. Isn't that right, Miss Wednesday? He smirked. Or should I say, Princess Vivi of the Alabasta Kingdom? Mr. H reacted immediately, launching a series of bombs at the pair. Miss Valentine jumped into the air while Mr. Five took the blast head on. I get him. Vivi yelled in worry. Run, Vivi. Take the eternal pose to Alabasta and flee this place. I'll hold them as long as I can. The smoke from the blast cleared to reveal Mr. Five standing completely unharmed. It would seem you fools know not your place, he said calmly, as he pulled out a small pistol and brought it up to his face. Breeze breath bomb, he mumbled, before blowing. Into the gun. The pistol shot the volatile air towards Igarum and Vivi. Vivi ran, but Igarum was slow to react and couldn't get out of the way as the explosive breath flew in his direction dot and hit two people in front of him. Igarum and Vivi looked on in horror as Mr. Nine and Miss Monday took the full force of the blast for their old comrades. Vivi felt tears escape her as their bodies fell lifelessly to the ground. If they took another hit like that, they wouldn't make it. Mr. Five just scoffed at their stupidity and shot off another round of breath bombs at Igarum who was engulfed in series of fiery explosions. I get him. Vivi screamed in desperation. The explosions continued, and Mr. Five spoke up. The Bomu Bomu no me. It turns my entire body into a bomb waiting to go off, Mr. Five explained. He stilled though, as the explosions suddenly died out. Vivi looked on in amazement. The spot where Igarum had been standing was now engulfed in a dense whirlwind that seemed to have overfed the flames from the inside of the blast. Mr. Five's eyes widened under his sunglasses the whirlwind dissolved to reveal Mr. Eight, or rather, Igarum, completely unharmed. In front of him stood a green-haired man with a sword drawn a his side and pointed at the ground. Wow, what a night, Zoro said with a grin. Sorry. But for reasons I can't reveal, I can't let you kill them, he said as he faced Mr. Five. No need to apologize, a voice said from above. That just means you'll die with them. Miss Valentine floated above their heads with an amused smile on her face. Surprised? She asked. The kilo kilo no me. I can change my body mass from 1 kilogram to 10,000 kilograms at will. It makes for a pretty deadly fighting style if I do say so myself. She smiled widely. 10,000 kilogram press. She dropped through the air like an anvil, aiming to drop down on Zoro's head. Zoro casually tilted his body to the side, and Miss Valentine completely missed him, getting stuck in a small crater in the ground. Zoro turned to Vivi and I Garam and scratched his head. What should I say? He wondered aloud. I guess I didn't really think this part through very well. Well, whatever. 
I think I can speak on behalf of my captain. When I say we'd be willing to give you a lift to Alabasta, Igaram's eyes narrowed. Why would you go to such lengths to help us? He asked in well-founded suspicion. Zoro shrugged. If you need a reason, then let's just say it's to thank you for the sake. We could have gone without what happened afterwards, but you guys couldn't have killed us even if you tried. So, taking into account that you didn't even try. We'll be forgiving. That doesn't explain why you'd go out of your way to help us though, Vivi said cautiously. Zoro tilted his head. What should I say to get them to trust me? He idly wondered. Before a loud shout broke him out of his thoughts. Zoro. The voice of his captain pierced the air, and Zoro turned toward Luffy. Oh, hey, captain, he said. I thought you'd still be sleeping. Since you didn't wake up earlier, I just assumed you'd leave this to me. What's up? Luffy's hat shadowed his eyes. After a few seconds, he raised his head and a wide, mischievous grin spread across his face. He raised his fists in the air and shouted. You. Bastard. I'll kick your ass. Zoro didn't have much time to try to puzzle out this statement before his reflexes screamed at him and he moved his head to the side to dodge it punch that sent ripples through the rock formation behind him and shattered the stone, toppling nearby trees in the process. Luffy's stretched out fist rushed back to his body. And Zoro pulled two swords out, his mind finally catching up to just what the hell was happening right now. Oh, he cannot be serious. Luffy was very much serious. Zoro watched as his arm took on a reddened tint and steam started rising from the limb. Gamu Gamu no. Zoro got his swords at the ready. Jet pistol. Zoro blocked the attack using a cross formation with his two swords. His feet gave way and he slid back a few inches, but he was unharmed. The strongest attack he's used since coming to the past. And he's using it on an ally for shits and giggles. Sometimes, his captain really frustrated him. Why are they fighting? Aren't they comrades? Vivi asked in confusion. Suddenly. A new voice spoke up from behind them. Hey, miss. Vivi turned to face the new rival. It was the two pirates that had easily fallen for their tricks. So, it's you, Usopp said. The weird lady who we met inside Laboon. Before Vivi could ask what they wanted, as she was extremely pressed for time, the other one spoke up. We have no idea what's going on here, but our captain has ordered us to protect you. Would you please come with us, miss? Sanji asked politely. More fool show up to die, came the annoyed voice of Mr. Five. When will you no name pirates learn not to get in our way? He raised his pistol to his mouth again and Sanji's eyes narrowed. He didn't know what that was, but anyone could tell it was a hostile move. It was a shitty pistol. He quickly kicked Usopp out of the way and grabbed Vivi as the man fired jumping out of range of the following explosion. He set Vivi down and turned a scathing glare towards Mr. Five. Before the numbered agent could blow into the pistol. Again, Sanji jumped high into the air, performing a series of front flips. Mr. Five's eyes widened as he approached with surprising speed. He raised the pistol a second too late, and... Sanji's downward spinning heel connected with the dome of his head, shattering his sunglasses in the process. Mutton shoot. Mr. Five slumped to the ground in obvious pain while Miss Valentine watched in mix between shock and rage. You bastard. Vivi looked on in awe. The Mr. Five pair had never lost two. Any pirates as far as she knew. Who were these people? Miss Valentine proceeded to perform another 10,000 kilogram press, which Sanji hopped out of the way of. She didn't. Stop though, continuing to jump into the air and attempt to flatten Sanji. Sanji continued to hop out of the way as Vivi watched in shock and Usopp in annoyance. Hey, Sanji. Why don't you attack back at some point? The long-nosed man shouted, but Sanji just yelled back, telling him to shut it as he continued to avoid the blows that were making numerous craters in the ground. You'll have to do more than dodge if you want to beat me. Miss Valentine said, still seething. Sorry, miss. 
I don't kick women, Sanji replied. Would you consider not trying to crush me anymore and perhaps cradle my head against your chest instead? He asked the question in the most innocent of tones, but that just seemed to infuriate the woman more. Suddenly, she stopped, taking a deep breath. Then she started running in Vivi's direction. Usopp yelped and held out his slingshot with a frightened expression, and Sanji's eyes narrowed as his coat of chivalry clashed with his captain's orders. Usopp shot a flame star at Miss Valentine, only for her to jump over it and soar high into the air. She was directly above Vivi before she increased her weight again and crashed into vacant ground once more. Sanji sat down Vivi carefully and frowned, knowing he wouldn't be able to keep this up forever. One sword style, bird dance. The wind blade, which Luffy dodged, continued on past its target and hit Miss Valentine dead center. She gasped as blood seeped from the wound, and fell to the ground, breathing heavily. Sanji rounded on Zoro. You bastard. That had better have been unintentional. Zoro paid him no attention, though, still locked in his ongoing fight with Luffy. Vivi got over her shock at seeing the Mr. Pair defeated, and turned to Sanji. Why are those two fighting, anyway? Sanji blinked. Oh, them? He asked nonchalantly. They're idiots, he said as if that explained it all. It was that that Mr. Five recovered and looked at Sanji in fury. That fucking hurt, he thought. If it weren't for my devil fruit giving me increased resistance to blunt force, I'd be out cold with a concussion. He ran toward Sanji in frenzy, attempting to take the man out with an explosive punch. Sanji raised his leg in preparation for another assault. Gamu Gamu no dot whip. Zoro jumped over Luffy's leg, which crashed into Mr. Five and sent him soaring through the air before he finally crashed into a rock, and didn't get up. Again. All eyes turned toward the escalating conflict. They seemed to be at a temporary standstill. Fine, Zoro said. If we're gonna do this, then I hope you're ready, Luffy. He unsheathed his third sword and placed it in his mouth before tying his bandana around his head. Luffy grinned widely, and his entire form seemed to redden as steam slowly rose from his body. Three sword style.1080 caliber phoenix. Gamu Gamu no dot grizzly magnum. A large, dense wind cannon shot towards Luffy at the same time his arms blackened to obsidian and grew to the size of houses before their eyes. He threw his arms forward and met the wind cannon head on. Everyone in the vicinity was blown off of their feet as the ball of condensed air ruptured from the force of the blow. That's new, Sanji commented. Luffy's arms were blown backwards, and quickly shrank back down to normal before he leapt into the air. Zoro barraged him with a storm of large, fast, deadly wind blades, and Luffy danced through the air weaving through them gracefully as his blackened arms blurred out of sight and rebounded off of Zoro's sword. Zoro quickly sheathed two swords as Luffy landed. One sword style. Lion's death song. Luffy leapt out of the way of the deadly blade, whistling as the buildings behind him were cleanly sliced in half as a side effect of the swing. He landed behind Zoro and prepared his own attack. His blackened arm erupted in flames as he reared it back and launched at the swordsman. Gamu Gamu no dot Red Hawk. Zoro too jumped out of the way, and Luffy's arm left a long explosive trail in its wake, reducing the buildings that had already been cut in half. Rubble. Zoro sighed in exasperation. Are we done here, Luffy? Luffy shrugged. I guess, unless you want to get serious. I don't feel like destroying the island, though. Zoro sheathed his swords, and Luffy grinned with mirth. Well, if Zoro's done messing around, what do you say we take a princess to her kingdom? He asked. I'm gonna kill you one day, Zoro mumbled, and Luffy burst out laughing. Sanji and Usopp just watched with blank expressions, used to their antics, while Vivi and Igarum continued to wonder what the hell was going on. Princess? Sanji asked. He turned to the only female that Luffy could be talking about and observed her carefully. Then he shrugged. I wouldn't mind bowing down to you, he said casually. 
Would someone please explain what on earth is going on? Igera masked in frustration, his head in his hands. Sure. One second, Luffy said. He turned in a random direction and shouted. Nami. You can come out now. The orange-haired woman appeared out of the shadows of a nearby building, an extremely annoyed look on her face. I finish looting their treasure, and I come to see you two destroying the town? What the hell do you think you're doing? She asked. Igarum looked at the bag slung over her shoulder, and his head sagged. It was the treasure they looted from the previous group of pirates that had passed through. So, she'd seen right through them as well? Were they that pathetic? Hey, Nami, guess what? We're escorting Princess Vivi of the Alabasta Kingdom to her home country so she can prevent a civil war and overthrow the leader of an underground criminal organization. Vivi's eyes widened with each word. Not just the swordsman, but him too? Why did they know so much? Nami stared at Luffy. Why? She asked bluntly. Luffy shrugged. I'm a little curious myself, Luffy, was it? Why are you so willing to help us? Vivi asked. Because we know about the situation in Alabasta and what Burrow Quirks is doing there. If we don't get you there, hundreds of thousands of people will die over a misunderstanding. We want to prevent that. Vivi just stared at him for a second, and Zoro stared right back. It wasn't a lie. They did want to prevent it. But it was mostly for Vivi's sake. He couldn't exactly tell her that, though. Are you really pirates? She finally asked. Luffy smiled. The best you'll ever find, he said confidently. Some crews came close in Luffy's mind. The Whitebeard Pirates, the Red Hair Pirates, the Heart Pirates, etc. But the Straw Hats were obviously the best. Vivi was still confused but nodded slowly. If you're willing to take me, I would highly appreciate an escort to Alabasta. Just be aware that Burrow Quirks will be sending officer agents after me the whole way through. She said. They won't be a problem, Zoro said nonchalantly. Nami asked again why they were doing this, and Luffy told Vivi to explain the full situation in her kingdom as well as the structure of Baroque works. After hearing the story, Nami sighed and relented, knowing Luffy had made up his mind anyway. So, who is this Mr. Zero really, then? She finally asked. Vivi started sweating and insisted that she couldn't say, lest they be targeted even after they dropped her off. It's Crocodile of the Seven Warlords, Luffy said. Vivi's jaw dropped, Igarum collapsed onto the ground, Nami punched Luffy over the head and started shaking him by his cola. Relentlessly, Usopp shrieked in fear, Sanji blinked, and Zoro laughed. Well, now that that's out of the way, let's get going. Suddenly they heard the sound of scribbling, and looked over to find the unlucky sitting across from them. Vivienne. Igarum paled at the sight. They showed them five neatly drawn pictures, one of each of the straw hats, and then started to fly off, but they suddenly fell out of the air and onto TH. Ground unconscious. Zoro turned to Luffy with a raised eyebrow. Luffy shrugged. They look tasty. Alright, what's with the otter and the vulture? Nami asked. The unluckies report directly to Mr. Zero, Vivi said with a shudder. If they had gotten away, you would have been targeted immediately. We would have been in horrible danger. I fear we still are, Vivi, Igarum stated. Without a report from the Mr. Five pair, Mr. Zero is likely to send either the Mr. Three or Mr. Four pair next. Vivi's eyes widened at that. Then what should we do? Igarum suggested a plan in which he acted as a decoy and Vivi boarded the straw hat ship. Luffy and Zoro reluctantly agreed, knowing what would happen. They were pretty sure the man wouldn't be killed, but decided to keep a close watch on his aura anyway. As well as any potential killing intent in the vicinity. When Igarum's ship departed, they braced themselves for what was about to happen. They still couldn't sense any intent to kill, so they kept silent. When the large explosion engulfed his ship and covered the waters in flames, Luffy and Zoro dragged everyone onto the Going Merry. 
Vivi had a tormented expression on her face, and Zoro reassured he. Don't worry. He's not dead, he told her. Vivi's eyes widened. How do you? We can tell, Zoro interrupted. We'll talk later. For now, we need to go. Wait, I can't leave without Karyu. She remembered as Zoro climbed onto the ship. Would Karyu happen to be a giant duck? He asked. This surprised Vivi, and she climbed onto the ship to see Karyu already there. Alright, if that's everything, let's go, Nami said, worry evident in her voice. As the ship sailed away from the island, Nami breathed a sigh of relief. Alright, it looks like where? In the clear, she said. Good thing, too. Burrow Quirks would have been here soon, a voice said. Yeah, good thing we escaped, Nami answered. Watch out for the shallow water so you don't damage the hull, the voice suggested. Right, you can count on me, Nami said confidently. After a few seconds, she turned nervously to Luffy. Um dot was that you? Luffy shook his head and pointed over his shoulder with his thumb. All eyes turned around to see an unidentified woman sitting peacefully on the railing. Half of the ships. Occupants immediately panicked. This is a nice ship, the intruder said with a serene smile. Luffy turned to her. Glad you like it. Vivi ignored the informality and shouted. Why are you here? Miss All Sunday. The intruder continued smiling, resting her face in the palm of her hand. Hello. Miss Wednesday, the woman greeted, completely ignoring her question. I ran into Mr. Eight not too long ago, she said, as if she was commenting on the weather. Vivi quickly became enraged. You dot what did you do to him? She screamed. Suddenly, she felt a hand on her shoulder, and turned to face Luffy. It's okay. He's still alive, he said in a reassuring tone. Vivi wanted to believe him along with the swordsman. But how could they be so sure? Miss All Sunday was wondering the same thing, but the smile never slipped from her face. Who is she? Nami finally asked, which pair does she belong to? She's part of the Mr. Zero pair, Crocodile's partner, Vivi whispered. Nami looked extremely worried now, and Usopp was visibly cowering, though to his credit, he did have one Han. On his slingshot, Sanji was busy admiring her beauty, and Luffy and Zoro were suppressing their familiar pangs of guilt in their stomachs. They should have gotten used to this by now, but their survivor's guilt seemed to affect them separately for each individual comrade they had failed to save. She's the one I trailed to find out Mr. Zero's identity, Vivi continued. Correction, the woman said. I'm the one who let you trail me. I knew, Vivi whispered. And you're the one who revealed us to Mr. Zero, aren't you? Her voice rose. What are your intentions exactly? Who knows? But you were so serious about it. I just had to let you follow me. Still, a princess infiltrates an underground criminal organization in a desperate attempt to save H. Dying country. It all seems a bit much, don't you think? She said in a straight tone of voice. Stop mocking me. Vivi screamed. Nami and Usopp drew their weapons, getting ready for a conflict, before a sudden blast of Conqueror's hockey defused the situation. The two stiffened and looked at their captain. Questioningly. Enough, Luffy said. The command, for it could be mistaken for nothing else, was obeyed. Miss All Sunday was looking down at Luffy curiously as a bead of sweat slid down her cheek. Despite this, she kept smiling. Luffy looked her dead in the eye. You're on the losing side of this game, Robin. The woman's composure instantly slipped away along with her smile, and her eyes widened slightly. There was a moment of silence before she regained her bearings and spoke. So, you know my identity. You've piqued my curiosity, Monkey D. Luffy. Well, you look just like the wanted poster, he replied. Miss All Sunday smiled again but Luffy could sense her discomfort. I see, is all she said. It wasn't a lie. She did look strikingly similar to her 80 year old self. It would seem you might have earned your reputation, Straw Hat Luffy. However, you won't make it to Alabasta, 
she said after a while. Even if we do nothing, your next destination is little garden. She didn't offer an eternal pose this time. Zoro suspected the much of the amusement she found in this had just died. As she jumped off the ship and onto a rather large turtle, she turned towards them one last time. Good luck, I suppose, she said before leaving. To Little Garden, then, Zoro said when she was gone. The crew went about their business, and not for the first time, Vivi wondered what kind of pirates she had involved hers with. All right, everyone, it's time to continue our hockey training. Luffy announced. The statement was quickly met by two groans from Nami and Usopp and a curious look from Vivi. Luffy quickly explained the concept of hockey to Vivi, telling her that their crew was training in it and that she was welcome to join. Vivi politely declined, saying that she'd just watch for now. So, for the next hour, she watched them undergo their strange training regimens wondering how this would help them unlock such a fantastical ability. Some of their methods seemed slightly dot-degrading. Moreover, Vivi wondered why Luffy and Zoro weren't taking part. When she voiced this inquiry, Luffy stated that they already knew how the basics and only had to work on their mastery. Whatever that meant. Vivi was impressed, though. They kept this up for a few hours, only taking short breaks, before Luffy called them off and said they should prepare for lunch. Can't strain on any. Empty stomach, he said jovially as Nami and Usopp slumped to the floor and Sanji made his way to the kitchen. Vivi looked at Nami and Usopp in wonder. She hesitated, and then spoke up. If you two don't mind me asking, why do you train so hard? Who do you plan on fighting? They looked surprised by the question, but nonetheless thoughtful. Nami was tempted to say something like, I'd like to know myself, and Usopp wanted to respond, this is nothing for the great Captain Usopp, but they both held their tongues and gave the question the consideration that it deserved. Finally, Nami answered. It's not that we plan on fighting anyone in particular. It's just that I, she said slowly. She frowned trying to figure out what it was that she wanted to say. Usopp finished for. Sir. I think it's because Luffy always goes out of his way to protect us, and I just want to be able to return the favor. The great Captain Usopp can't just sit on the sidelines forever. You know? Nami nodded in agreement despite the great Captain Usopp part. I know I'm not a monster like some other members of our crew, she said, but that doesn't mean I can't make a difference. Since he offered us training on a silver platter, I thought, why not? She paused. It doesn't seem like I'm making much progress, though, she said gloomily. Vivi was a bit impressed by their answers. She herself was a pacifist, and didn't believe fighting could solve problems, which made the infiltration of Burrow Quirks especially difficult for her. But hearing their words, she couldn't help but think back to what her mentor and friend had once told her. It's not about fighting, it's about protecting. Perhaps there was more depth to these pirates' strength than she had originally thought? Perhaps they didn't gain strength for the sake of fighting, but for the sake of protecting. If so, that was an important distinction in her mind. She was honestly starting to take a liking to them. Oh, by the way, Nami, Usopp started excitedly. I've been doing some experiments with a lot of potential for application in combat. In addition to my new and improved exploding star, I came up with a pretty good idea for a weapon. It's a bit unconventional, but that just makes it even better. I could use some suggestions for it, and I think you could probably help. What do you say? Nami looked surprised, but nodded. Sure, I'll take a look after lunch. I just wish I could come up with something similar in case this hockey business doesn't work out. She had a sad look on her face. Ha! Huh. Don't count us out just yet, Nami. If my theories pan out, I've got just the thing for you, he said. Soon enough we'll be monsters in our own right. Usopp crossed his arms and closed his eyes, nodding as he envisioned it. This caused Nami to cheer up a bit. Lunch is served, ladies. Sanji called from above deck. Right this way, 
if you will. Vivi quickly found out that lunch with the straw hats was either eaten quickly or not eaten at all. Luffy's arms blurred out of sight as he stole food from everyone's plates. Indiscriminately. Sanji was having limited success in stopping him, and Nami and Usopp were having none whatsoever. Vivi could see the borderline hazardous rage building up. Nami. Only Zoro seemed to be indifferent. But then again, he was the only one defending his food successfully. For the most part, finally Sanji shouted, "Damn it, Luffy! If you can't keep to your own food, you don't get a single bite of the main course." He asserted. Luffy looked as if he'd just been issued a death sentence, and his jaw dropped as he started sweating profusely. He pulled his arm, which was dangerously close to Sanji's plate, back to his side. He started pouting and turned his head away. Sanji's a jerk, he mumbled to no one in particular. When the main course arrived, they were finally able to dig in without worrying about their food disappearing before their eyes. Vivi took a bite and smiled. It's delicious. She said gleefully. Thank you ma'am. Sanji said with enthusiasm. Sanji's cooking is unrivaled. Luffy shouted. He can prepare anything. Even a weird otter and creepy vulture. Vivi froze. Otter and vulture? She asked reluctantly. Ah, that's what the main course is. It's a healthy blend of otter and vulture meat. Apparently, Luffy got them from Whiskey Peak. It was pretty easy to prepare, even if the me itself is an unconventional consumption, Sanji said. Vivi felt a bit dizzy as she stared down at the plate in front of her. She was eating dot the unluckies. That felt dot strange, to say. The least. Sanji grew concerned. Is something wrong? He asked worriedly. Vivi shook her head frantically. She brought herself out of her stupor and continued eating, not really caring that much all of a sudden. It really was delicious. Sanji just shrugged. And sat down with everybody. After lunch. Nami informed everyone that they should be arriving at Little Garden soon before disappearing below deck with Usopp. Luffy and Zer said they were going to train a little. For the next half hour, Vivi was lost in thought, worrying about the state of her country. She didn't know how much the situation had changed since she last checked with Igarum. She wondered where he was right now. Was he on his way to Alabasta as well? Nami and Usopp came back up again, and she suddenly realized how long she'd been spacing out. That's amazing, Usopp. Your theories are pretty sound, she heard Nami say. Do you really think you can make something like that? Of course, Usopp said confidently. I once built a great cannon that could destroy islands with a single blast. This is nothing in comparison. Nami ignored Usopp's habitual lion in favor of thinking about the potential that the weapon he was working on could have. Hey, look, Sanji said, looking out over the sea. What? Did you spot the island? Nami asked. Nope. Just a dolphin, Sanji replied. They all looked in the direction he was pointing. Oh, oh, wow, that's so cool. Luffy said. It's huge. Nami looked at him in confusion. Huge. As the creature drew closer, she soon realized what he was talking about. Just a dolphin. Sanji repeated as the marine mammal that was five times bigger than the going Mary flipped over their ship. It disappeared into the water and soon resurfaced, swimming right towards them. It looked like it was about to ram the ship, but Luffy held his hand out at it and it slowed down, coming to a slow cruise next to them. Good boy. Luffy said, to the exasperation of the others and the sheer amazement of Vivi. How did you do that, Luffy-san? Why did it listen to you? Luffy grinned. It probably knows that I'm gonna be the Pirate King and decided not to take any chances, he said jokingly. Vivi was surprised at that announcement. Pirate King? Are you after One Piece Luffy-san? Sure am, he said proudly. Just watch. I'll be the first to get to Raffle. He trailed off as a nod, wistful expression made his way onto his face. It seemed out of place on him. Vivi was about to ask what was wrong when Zoro spoke up. 
Hey, we've reached the island, he said. Everyone looked over the water to their destination. So, that's the second island of the Grand Line, Nami said. To be honest, I'm a little worried about what Miss All Sunday said, Vivi said. I wonder if there are monsters here, Usopp said fearfully. If there are, bring them back to the ship, Sanji suggested. We're low on food since we didn't get to stock up at the last town. As the ship cruised through a small canal leading into the uninhabited island, an eerie feeling overcame Nami. This place looks like some sort of tropical jungle, she pointed to. Why is it called Little Garden? She took a look around, unable to quite shake the feeling that something was strange about the place. She suddenly heard a loud animal call. And turned her head upwards to see a gigantic reptilian bird bearing down on them. Usopp shrieked, and Nami tensed up as it swooped down in her direction. Mutton shoot. Sanji's kick sent it shooting through the air until it collided with a tree in the forest. The tree collapsed on top of it. Shitty bird, Sanji mumbled. After that th. Heard a loud roar, and turned to see a tiger bigger than a mammoth making its way towards the canal. Sanji got ready for combat again, but as the tiger came closer, it collapsed. Onto the ground bleeding. What's with this place? Usopp asked. What could take down a tiger that big? Probably something bigger, Luffy commented. Right, Usopp said. I think I've just come down with I can't get on this island itis. We should probably stay here until the log pose sets, Nami decided. Luffy completely ignored her. Sanji. Prepare our pirate lunch boxes. I can just smell the scent of adventure, he said with a grin. Nami rounded on him. Didn't you hear me just now, idiot? We don't know what's out there. She protested. We also don't know how long it will take for the log to set, Luffy replied. It could be a while. We might as well make use of our time. Hey, would you mind if I came with you? Vivi asked. Sure. Luffy said as he accepted two small boxes of food from Sanji. You too, Vivi. Nami said helplessly as she sulked. I really need to unwind and get my mind off of things, she said. Come on, Karyu, let's go. Karyu looked at her like she just told him to jump into a pit of fire before obliging. Before leaving, Luffy seemed to hesitate about something. He turned to the crew. By the way, the conditions in this jungle seem really intense. Make sure to take precaution. Against the elements. Nami's jaw hung loosely. Was Luffy telling them to be cautious? That was dot extremely out of character. As the three set out, Sanji called after Luffy. Protect Vivi-chan, Luffy. And bring back some good game if you can. Luffy called out a quick confirmation and they left. I think I'll go do some hunting too, Zoro said as he jumped off the ship and over the water. He paused, and then turned back to Sanji. Why don't you go scout for potential? Enemies? He asked. Since that Robin woman knew where we were going, it's possible that they've already sent assassins here. I'll keep a lookout as well. Sanji nodded at the idea, and then jumped off the ship himself before walking out in a different direction. And dot we're alone, Nami stated sardonically. Usopp looked equally disturbed. And I can't shake this unsettling feeling, she added. Usopp looked at her questioningly. Little. Garden. I swear I've heard that name before, but I can't quite place it. Hey, Vivi, check this out. Vivi strolled over and looked closely at the object in his hand. It's an octopus shell. He said. This is an ammonite, Vivi said in wonder. Right. Octopus shell, Luffy replied. Luffy Sam, where did you find this? She asked curiously. The stream here is full of them. But how could that be? These are supposed to be extinct. It's probably a prehistoric island, Luffy suggested. Vivi considered that for a moment. It seemed pretty far-fetched, to be honest. What makes you say that? She asked. Well, there's a dinosaur over there, he said trivially as he pointed. Vivi's eyes widened as she turned towards what he was pointing at. Towering above the trees, about 20 meters away from them dot was a brontosaurus. 
How the hell did I miss? That? Nami could honestly say that she hadn't been as terrified as she was right now in over 8 years. She looked up at her looming death with tears in her eyes. Usopp wasn't faring much better. What's wrong, little humans? Didn't you hear me? I asked if you had any sake, the giant boomed. Why yes. Nami choked out. Yes, we do. A large grin spread across the giant's face, which only served to multiply their terror. Oh ah ooh ooh. So you have some. That's great. He said as he leaned down to meet them at eye level, oblivious to their fear. Suddenly, he shouted at the top of his lungs, Gwai! Literally scaring the color out of their faces. The giant turned around to see a very bold T-Rex biting his ass. With one swing of his axe, he decapitated it. A dam suddenly broke. And Nami and Usopp cried out in fear for their lives. The giant, unbeknownst to them, mistook their shouts for battle cries, and proudly let loose one of his own as he raised his axe. I am Elbaf's strongest warrior, the great Broji. He declared. He then looked down at Nami and Usopp, who were lying on their backs on the deck of the Going Merry. I have some good meat now. How's about I treat you to a meal, little humans? It's not often I have guests. But the two didn't respond, and Broji looked on in confusion. Although he didn't stop grinning. Luffy jumped up and down in mid-air using Jeppo as he waved his hands in front of the dinosaur's face. Hey, hey dinosaur. Over here. He shouted. Vivi watched in a mix between fascination and shock in the face of what was currently happening. How can he fly, first of all? The dinosaur stared Luffy an apathetic glance. Before continuing to munch on leaves, ignoring him. Luffy pouted before landing on its head and started jumping up and down to get its attention. This seemed to annoy the dinosaur, which attempted to swallow him. Vivi was frightened for a split second before Luffy's legs pushed against the air again, and he flew out of the dinosaur's range before landing back on its head. The dinosaur evidently had a short attention span, because it went back to eating leaves. Hey, little human. A booming voice called out. Vivi turned toward it and stilled in fear. She understood then why this place was called Little Garden. To the being before them. Would be just that. A giant? But why? What was he doing way out here? Up until now, Vivi was even sure if they truly existed. Luffy turned towards the new arrival from the top of the dinosaur's head. Hey, how's it going? He asked casually. The giant laughed a hearty laugh before answering. Going well, going well. Can't complain, he said jovially. I was hunting for some food, and that dinosaur you're standing on looks really tasty. Were you gonna eat that? Luffy jumped off the dinosaur's head and landed next to Vivi, who was wondering what kind of situation they were in right now, and motioned for the giant to continue. The giant promptly decapitated the brontosaurus before catching its head in his hand. I am Elbaf's strongest warrior. The great Dory. The giant shouted before turning to Luffy and Vivi. Hey, little humans, why don't you come over to my place? I have some good food and drink. Before Vivi could think of a way to politely decline, Luffy shouted up at him. Sure. Sounds great. The giant let out another hearty laugh before leading the way. Broji who had assumed that Nami and Usopp were just worn out from their journey and carried them back to his home, looked down at the still terrified duo with a smile. The meat is cooked. Dig in. He said as he dropped a colossal hunk of meat down next to them. That's okay. We're not hungry, Nami said carefully. It was a complete lie, but Nami and Usopp were currently entertaining thoughts of folklore in which giants fattened up there prey before eating them. Ah, uh, are you sure? Broji asked, a smile still etched across his face. Dinosaur meat is really good. The two nodded weakly to convey that they were sure, and the giant shrugged before lifting up the giant hunk of meat and binding into it. Um, Broji-san? Can I ask you something? Broji looked over and nodded for her to continue. How long does the log post take to set on this island? 
One year, the giant said with a straight face. This caused Nami and Usopp to fall off the log they were sitting on. Make yourselves at home. Broji said as he laughed. Luffy dug into the giant piece of meat that was currently his seat as well as his meal. Vivi wondered how he could eat so much. He had already consumed what had to be at least. His own body weight, and he didn't even look full. This is pretty good, giant guy. Luffy called out. Dory laughed in appreciation. Well, your pirate lunchbox was really good too, even if it was a bit small. You know it was. My chef Sanji made that. I'd kick your ass if you said it tasted bad, Luffy said. Kick my ass you say? The giant asked in an amused tone. For a second Vivi froze in apprehension, but Dory just continued laughing. You're a funny little human. I like. You. They're getting along so well, Vivi thought in exasperation as Karyu fidgeted uncomfortably. Um, Dory-san? Vivi asked nervously. If you don't mind me asking, what are you doing alone on an uninhabited island? Good question. Dory boomed. The truth is, I'm not alone. A friend of mine is also staying here. We come from the giant's village of the Grand Line known as Elboth. But our village has a certain law. If two warriors have a quarrel and can't come to an agreement, then we must settle our disputes in a righteous battle. This island has served as our battleground since our disagreement, and the one who is in the right shall triumph. Dory tilted his head back and laughed. But it's been 100 years. We just can't seem to set our duel. 100 years? You've been fighting for that long? Vivi asked in astonishment. It shouldn't come as a surprise. We giants have triple the lifespan of you humans, Dory said. But that's not the point. Why would you want to continue fighting after this long? Is there any reason to keep trying to kill each other? Well we don't necessarily have to kill each other, he corrected. But that will most likely be the case when one of us wins. Suddenly, there was a loud explosion, and th. All turned to see that the volcano in the middle of the island had erupted. Oops, that's the signal, Dory said. Looks like it's time. But what was the quarrel in the first place? And how could you possibly hate each other so much that you'd continue this for? Vivi didn't finish as Luffy held his hand out for her to stop. It's not about that. It never was, he stated. That's correct, Dory confirmed as he charged toward the arriving Broji. The reason for our duel. Birds flocked out of the vicinity as the two giants clashed, axe and sword. Respect of shield. We forgot ages ago. Luffy stared at them with an unreadable expression as they fought it out, talking and reminiscing all the while. Don't you long to return to our home of Elboth, Dory? I know I do, Broji said in a nostalgic tone. That's exactly why I'll beat you. Today, victory is mine. Dory shouted with conviction. Dream on, my friend. Elboth has chosen me as the victor. Broji shouted back. If you're lucky, you'll survive your loss and we can both go back home. They both let out loud. Laughs and continued in a flurry of strikes, dodges, and blocks. On one occasion Broji managed to land a hit on Dory's head, but Dory adjusted his head so that his helmet would take the blow. On the other side of the forest, Usopp watched in awe. Come on, Usopp. This is our chance to escape. Nami shouted. But Usopp just continued staring up at the two giants as they parried each other. I'm not leaving, he said quietly. Nami looked at him like his nose had just doubled in length. Can't you see? Usopp asked. This is a true battle of pride between two warriors. Nami hummed. Well, I'm not really interested in that, so I'll be seeing you. This is it. This is what I meant when I said brave warrior of the sea, Usopp said to nobody in particular. I want to be just like them. Nami looked at him with a worried expression before huffing and walking back over to sit on the log. So, you want to be a giant? She asked rhetorically. Were you even listening? Usopp raged. 
They both looked back as the two giants disarmed each other simultaneously before resorting to ramming each other with their shield. 73,466 duels, Broji commented. 73,466 draws, Dory added. They both collapsed to the ground, panting heavily for a while. Eventually, they both started laughing. Hey, Dory. I got some sake from our guests. Broji shouted with enthusiasm. Excellent. I haven't had any in so long. Pour me some, yeah? Unbeknownst to the two giants, four humans had recently arrived on the island, completely undetected. Or so those humans thought. Luffy frowned in agitation as Vivi asked Dory if it really took the log pose a year to set. The memory in the back of his mind was struggling to break through the surface of his subconscious, but not quite managing. It was starting to give him a headache. For the past hour he had felt the four hostelores making their way around the island, and he h. patiently been waiting for them to make a move so he could kick their asses and be done with it, but now his patience was wearing thin. They hadn't gone anywhere near his crewmates, or even Dory or Broji for that matter, and that had led him to the task of trying to remember what their game had been last time. This was no easy feat for Luffy. For the most part. He only remembered things that had made a lasting impact the first time around, and the specifications of Mr. Three's plans did not fall into that category. The fact that it had been over two years ago didn't exactly help. All he knew for sure was that Three had sabotaged his crewmates in the jungle and waited for Dory and Broji's fight to end before making his move. And yet, he couldn't shake Th. Nagging feeling in the back of his mind. He knew there had been some prelude to all that, but he just couldn't place it. By the way, little humans, Dory's voice rouse, snapping Luffy out of his thoughts, am I right to assume that Broji's guests are your crewmates? Luffy scanned the island one more time and came to the same conclusion. Nami and Usopp were still with Broji, and the Burrow Quirks agents were still in some isolated part of the jungle. Yeah, Luffy confirmed. A long-nosed dude and an orange-haired girl right? That's Usopp and Nami. Ah, I see. Dory said gleefully. Then I suppose I should thank you for the sake they gave me. As Dory raised a barrel high into the air and started to crack it open, Luffy's eyes widened. Memories flooding his brain now that the dam holding them back had been shattered. Don't drink that, Dory. He shouted quite suddenly. Dory looked at him in confusion and Luffy sighed, cursing his lack of attention to details. He hadn't given their movements. A second thought. He should have realized that their auras were coming from the direction of his own ship at one point. How could he have missed that? It was probably because. He had been focused on making sure they didn't get too close to any of the other auras on the island. Maybe he should have just followed them out and kicked their asses from the start, but he had been chatting happily with Dory the entire time. Dory, can I see that barrel for a minute? I have a bad feeling, he said. Dory obliged, setting the open barrel of sake down next to him. Luffy carried it several meters away. From that as they watched in confusion, wondering what he was doing. He then set it down, walked back to them, turned around, and spat across that distance into the barrel. The effect was instantaneous. The liquid exploded on contact with his saliva, blowing the barrel apart and shocking all wildlife in the area. Birds flocked out of the trees as Vivi and Dory's expressions turned shocked. What is the meaning of this? Dory shouted. Luffy turned back to him. The drink was rigged. We're not alone on this island, he said. Vivi's eyes narrowed. Is it them? She asked. Luffy nodded. Who are them? Dory asked, now ashamed at having briefly suspected their guests of the treacherous act. He turned to Luffy. You can use the power of observation? Luffy nodded. Can you sense them too? He asked. It's not our specialty, the giant admitted. They're a criminal organization after our heads, Vivi explained. I'm sorry, but it seems we may have gotten you involved. No, don't worry about it, Dory said, waving his hand dismissively. 
Then he paused. Actually, that may not be the case. You see, 100 years ago, Broji and I both had bounty of 100 million belly on our heads. I'm not sure if those are still active, but that could explain why they aimed for me first. Still, it doesn't make much sense. An explosion like TH wouldn't be enough to take me down. Suddenly, his eyes widened. Wait. Is Broji? No, Luffy interjected. They won't make a move yet. I'm guessing that their plan was to let Broji take you down during your next duel and then capture you both, he said. Gritting his teeth as he said it. You mean they were trying to interfere with our sacred duel? Dory shouted in outrage as he rose to his feet. I'll kill them. Wait, Luffy said, raising his hand to halt Dory. This is our problem. They followed us here, so it's our responsibility to deal with them. He grinned at Dory. We'll take it up oh. Ourselves to defend the integrity of your duel. Suddenly, they heard the familiar sound of a volcanic eruption. Besides, it sounds like you have somewhere to be, he said. Dory grinned in appreciation. I'll leave it to you then, my friend. Now if you'll excuse me, I must uphold my honor for the 73,467th time. I'm feeling good about this one. He roared, before trudging off through the jungle to meet Broji again. Stay here, Vivi, Luffy said. Vivi looked like she wanted to protest, but complied. Luffy shot off towards the direction of the four enemy auras. It wasn't long before he came to secluded region of the jungle and found a small building that seemed to be made out of three's wax. He landed on the ground, walked up to the building, and knocked on the door. Three. He shouted. Come out of there. I'm here to kick your ass. He waited patiently for a response, but to his annoyance, the four presences didn't even move. A tick developed over his eye and he shouted again. Stop ignoring me, you assholes. I know you're in there. It was then that he heard faint whispering coming from inside the makeshift hideout. He was about to simply destroy the building when he sensed a presence running to the do. Accompanied by a spike of killing intent. He jumped back to avoid the explosion that blew the door off its wax hinges. About time, Luffy said, dusting off his pants. What am I? A frickin' door-to-door -door salesman? I find your humor to be dry and tasteless came a quiet voice from inside. Slowly, three more people walked out of the door to accompany Mr. Five, who was now standing outside. The door with an angry scowl on his face. Mr. Three looked at Luffy and continued. I'm not sure how you found this place, but you're a fool to have come here alone. Whatever, Luffy scoffed. Just answer the door faster next time. I don't have all day. Mr. Three frowned. I'm afraid there will not be a next time. You are correct. You don't have all day. In fact, you don't even have five minutes. Your life was forfeit from the second. You knocked on our door so nonchalantly. Luffy was having trouble keeping his half-lidded eyes open. They started to drift closed and his head started to sag before he heard another voice shout at him. Hey! Are you paying attention, you straw hat bastard? Miss Valentine yelled. Luffy's eyes snapped open and he looked around frantically, trying to discern where he was. He looked back at the four slowly. Oh, it's just you guys, he said. Mr. Three was starting to get annoyed. It appears you're an even bigger idiot than the reports indicated, he said. It's not my fault, Luffy whined. Your voice is so monotone that it was putting me to sleep. Do you even need that wax stuff? You could win just about any fight by talking. Mr. Three struggled to keep his composure as Miss Golden Week broke out into a fit of giggles. He reined in his anger and exhaled. Monkey D. Luffy, bounty of 45 million belly, he began. Did you know that some people weigh a pirate's worth by their bounty? He asked in distaste. Pirates and even bounty hunters cower away from those with high bounties, interpreting them as an indication of the threat they pose. He looked Luffy dead in the eye. I call them all fools. Only a true idiot draws attention to himself and wreaks havoc for the sake of fame. 
A true criminal works from the shadows, achieving his goals discreetly and efficiently. A bounty means nothing. Only the end result matters. He smirked. Take the two us for example. My bounty is 24 million, and is far exceeded by yours. And yet, I've already won this fight, he said smugly. Luffy looked at him with a deadpan expression. If you think you're actually going to beat me by talking, I didn't mean you could really win that way, just so you know. That's not what I meant, you dumbass. Mr. Three shrieked in a high-pitched voice before regaining his composure. You see, you've already fallen into our trap while listening to M. Monotone voice. You might want to check your feet, straw hat, he said with a knowing smirk. Luffy looked down and saw a circle painted on the ground at his feet. Confused, he looked back up to see the short girl who he assumed was Three's partner holding up a paintbrush. He stared in apathy. Not quite getting it. Colors trap, inactivity white, she said emotionlessly. I thought that white was best for inactivity. I mean, I could say inactivity blank, but that does not roll off the tongue quite as well. Mr. Five and Miss Valentine were both grinning widely now at the thought of revenge. Luffy still didn't have a clue what was going on. You painted a circle on the ground. What's tea? Big deal? He asked. Miss Valentine burst out in laughter. You'll soon find out, she said with a wide smile. Mr. Five started walking over to him. I owe you big time for what happened in Whiskey Peak, he said with a scowl. Now, why don't you just stand there like a good idiot while I vent my frustration, he said. Luffy frowned. Why the hell would I do that? Miss Valentine watched in anticipation as Mr. Five strode over to Luffy with his explosive fist raised high. And got sent flying through a tree by Luffy's punch. The Burrow Quirks agent's jaws all dropped at the sight. They looked from Luffy, to Mr. Five's unconscious form, and back to Luffy. No, seriously, Luffy began. Why would I just stand here and do nothing? If you're trying to use reverse psychology or whatever, you should have said something like there's an way you can stand there and take our attacks without dying. He rubbed his chin in thought. I may have actually taken that challenge, come to think of it. The agents continued to stare at him, dumbfounded. Miss Golden Week's colors trap had failed. How? Why? Luffy just shrugged. Now then dot shall we? Before anyone could react, Luffy outstretched fist collided with Mr. Three's face, and he was sent crashing through the wax hideout, unconscious. Miss Valentine finally reacted to the threat. Son of a bitch. She reduced her mass to one kilogram and leapt at Luffy, her lightness increasing her speed. While in midair she changed her mass to 10,000 kilograms. 10,000 kilogram lunge. Luffy casually grabbed her wrist, spinning on his heels and bringing her in a circle despite her weight. He launched her at Mr. Five's unconscious body, which exploded on contact with the heavy projectile that was his partner in crime. The tree he was laying next to caught fire as the explosion went off, taking out Miss Valentine as well. Luffy looked back at Miss Golden Week as she started quietly and discreetly walking away. Where are you going, exactly? He asked. She slowly looked back at him sweat pouring down her face lucky for you i don't like hitting kids luffy said nonchalantly suddenly she fell to the ground unconscious and foaming at the mouth his task accomplished luffy shot off in the direction of vivi's aura he sensed that she had met up with nami and usopp during dorian broji's fight when he arrived the two were still locked in a stalemate neither giving the other an advantage Nami and Usopp saw his approach and looked at him nervously. Luffy, Nami started. Vivi told us the situation. Did you? Yeah, I took care of it, Luffy said with a grin. Oh, too bad, Usopp said as his legs shook. The great captain Usopp was looking forward to some action. He lied. They all heard a loud crash and turned around to see Dory and Broji lying on the ground in exhaustion. 73,467 draws, they said in unison as they panted heavily. 
Luffy walked up to them. Good fight, you two, he said happily. Yes, it was. Dory shouted. Thank you, my friend. You have defended our honor just as you promised you would. Defended our honor? Broji asked in confusion. How was it threatened? I didn't want to tell you until after the fight, Dory admitted. Some humans on the island tried to sabotage our duel. He spat out the words distastefully. Broji looked outraged, but Luffy assured him that he thoroughly kicked their asses and he calmed down. You're all an interesting batch of humans, Broji commented. Very well. You have my thanks. Sanji walked through the jungle in the direction of the numerous explosions he had heard earlier. So far, his mission to stake out any enemies had gone smoothly. Meaning he hadn't found any. But then he had heard the sounds of a struggle, and he couldn't exactly ignore that, now, could he? He eventually came to a clearing with a small, white building in the middle. What immediately drew his attention were the four unconscious people on the ground. What the hell happened here? He asked himself as he strolled through. He looked at two of them carefully before coming to the conclusion that they were the Burrow Quirks agents that had attacked them at Whiskey Peak. So, then, the other two were most likely part of the organization as well. He blew out a puff of smoke, wondering who knocked them all out. Who am I kidding, he said aloud. It was either Luffy or Zoro. He decided to do some investigating and walked into the white building, noting that the door had been blown down. He took a look around and suddenly heard the sound of a transponder snail. He looked towards it as it rang and shrugged. Might as well. He picked up the receiver and spoke. Hello, you've reached the shitty restaurant, he said. Nonchalantly. What would you like to order? Stop shitting around, Mr. Three, an emotionless voice said. I've called to confirm the status of your mission. Mission? Sanji said. Who is this? It's me, you dumbass. Mr. Zero. Who else has this number? Sanji was a little surprised at his information. Mr. Zero was the head of Burrow Quirks from what he'd been told. That meant that this was Crocodile, the royal warlord on the other line. Interesting. What's with the silence? Crocodile asked. I asked you a question. It's been a while since I sent you your orders. Have you done away with Princess Vivi and her escorts or not? And have you confirmed that they were the Straw Hat Pirates? Oh, yeah, them, Sanji said casually. Yeah, it was the Straw Hats. But they're all dead as can be. Mission accomplished. I see. Good work, Crocodile said. Due to the disappearance of the unluckies, I've been forced to send a billion ship to your location. They'll arrive soon with an eternal pose. Alabista. It's time to carry out our most crucial operation. From now on, all communication will be by letter. I can't risk the Marines intercepting our calls from here on out. See. You when you arrive. He hung up. Sanji walked out of the house with a smirk. Yep, mission accomplished. Back at the going Mary, the Giants and the rest of the Straw Hats were throwing a party. Zoro had returned dragging ludicrous amounts of dinosaur meat behind him, and the giants had taken to preparing it. After checking all the sake for more bombs, they had let loose. Hey, where's Sanji-kun, by the way? Nami asked as she took a sip of her drink. Oh, he went to stake out the jungle for enemies. He'll probably run into those agents that Luffy took down at some point, Zoro said. Actually, he already did. Luffy corrected. And he's coming back right now. Usopp looked at him in envy. Man, that hockey stuff sure is useful. I can't wait until I actually make some progress on that. It was then that Sanji came shuffling through some tree branches and made his way into the clearing. Oh, so you guys are back huh? He asked. He spotted the giants and stared at them for a while. That's new, he muttered. They both grinned widely at him. So, you're the other missing warrior. Welcome to the party, Broji said. Nice to meet you, little human, Dory said with a wave. No, no, please.
pleasure's all mine, Sanji replied casually. He turned back to the crew. So, are we ready to leave? It looks like we've got enough supplies to last a while. Oh, my god, that's right. Vivi said in dismay. The log. It takes a year to set. How are going to get off this island? Sanji hummed thoughtfully. I think I may have a solution. They looked at him in confusion and he explained that he had stumbled upon the enemy's base of operations, taken. Call from the leader of the criminal organization that was out to kill them, impersonated his subordinate, and tricked him into thinking they were all dead. He blew out a puff of smoke. He said he's sending a ship here with an eternal pose to Alabasta, Sanji said. Most of the crew stared at him in wonder. Luffy was laughing his ass off. So, basically, we wait for that ship to arrive, kick their asses, and take the eternal pose, Zoro concluded. I guess all in all mission went well? He asked with a smirk. You could say that, Sanji replied. Thank you so much. I was so worried. Sanji-san, I could hug you. Vivi shouted with glee. Please feel free, Sanji said. Vivi's arms wrapped around Sanji's neck, and his eyes seemed to turn into hearts for a moment before reverting back to their neutral state when she detached. Oh, oh, Sanji. Wait until you see all the meat Zoro caught. Luffy said, his mouth watering. You're gonna have your hands full. Sanji took note of the pile of prehistoric animals and whistled. That is impressive. We should have a hunting contest sometime. Zoro blinked at this comment for some reason. And the giant's heads both perked up. Hunting contest? It was while they were waiting for the enemy ship to arrive that Luffy caught sight of something extremely troubling. On the back of Vivi's neck was a large, purple bite mark. She was itching at it in irritation every once in a while. Luffy suddenly felt very nervous. It might not even be the same bug. It could just be a mosquito or something. But what? It's not? What if he had inadvertently caused Vivi to be bitten simply by coming back to the past and changing things? He tried to calm himself down. Vivi? He asked. She? Turned to him. What's that mark on your neck? Oh, that? She asked. I must have been bitten by some bug. It's been bothering me a little. Zoro walked up and looked at it before exchanging a nervous glance with Luffy. Vivi, he began, you know this is a prehistoric island right? We have no idea what kinds of bug thrive in these conditions. That might not be an ordinary bite. You should probably have someone look at it. Nami narrowed her eyes at the words. The logic made sense even if she hadn't thought of it herself. It just seemed not so unlike Luffy and Zoro to be this cautious. What had them? So worried? Well, I guess I can get it checked out when we get to Alabasta, Vivi said. Luffy and Zoro knew that it probably wouldn't be that simple, but they let it drop for now. What could they say? Luffy, for his part, felt sick. He knew he couldn't have really prevented this. What was he supposed to do? Hover over everyone in the crew and make sure no bugs bit them? There were some things he couldn't control. Still, he felt guilty about what was most likely coming now. Soon, the Billions ship arrived at Little Garden, only to be met by the Straw Hat Pirates and two giants. Realizing they'd been had, they attempted to make a call on the transponder snail, but everyone on the ship spontaneously fell unconscious. The ship was then looted for all it was worth, and the straw hats were able to secure a week's worth of rations, much to the pleasure of Luffy and Sanji, 200,000 belly, much to the pleasure of Nami, and finally an eternal pose to Alabasta, much to the pleasure of everyone. Before they set sail, Dory and Broji told them to sail straight ahead no matter what happened, and that they'd defend their flag just as their honor was defended. Luffy nod and told Nami not to change their course no matter what happened. They ended up getting swallowed by a giant goldfish, only to be set free by Dorian Broji's flying slashes. Finally, the going Mary set sail for Alabasta as the blue ogre Dorian red ogre Broji reminisced about memories long forgotten. Cashew. One of the fifty skillful grade swords, 
Tashigai said to nobody in particular as she stared at the blade in her hand in admiration. To think she'd come across a sword this rare so early in the Grand Line. Not only that, but she liberated the blade from evil's grasp. For a moment, she was in a state of reverie. She felt like she could get lost in the temper for hours. Nothing could ruin this wonderful moment. Tashigai. Stop going into ecstasy over your spoils of war and get your ass over here, you sword freak. Why yes, Captain Smoker. Tashigai stumbled as she ran out the door towards the deck, but quickly caught herself, only to stumble again going down the stairs. She finally regained her balance and faced the marine captain. Play it back again, Smoker said to the marine next to him. Listen carefully, Tashigai. The marine pressed the button on the black transponder snail meant for intercepting calls. And it buzzed to life. Mr. Zero. Dot sent you your orders. Dot Princess Vivi. Dot Straw Hat Pirates? A voice said. Then what sounded like a different voice mixed and said, Yeah. Dot straw Hats. Dot mission accomplished. The conversation was choppy with long pauses in between, and it was clear that some parts of it were missing. So, then, this is our first lead on the Straw Hat Pirates, Tashigai said seriously. Yeah, Smoker confirmed. The source was too far away for us to intercept it clearly, but we can still make out a few key words from this call. Mr. Zero, Orders, Princess Vivi, Straw. Hat Pirates. Could Mr. Zero have anything to do with the Mr. Eleven we've apprehended? Tashigai asked. Good point. If those numbers are code names, we could be dealing with some criminal organization, Smoker speculated. Mr. Eleven's head perked up at this. Mr. Zero? Are you really resorting to guesswork? I have no idea who that is. Just because our names are similar doesn't mean we have some connection, he said. Then how do you explain this litter we found in your pocket from a Mr. Zero with orders written on it? Smoker asked emotionlessly. The man's eyes widened. But I could have sworn I burned that letter. Hey, hey actually, about that letter. What letter? Smoker asked. There was no letter in your pocket. Mr. Eleven was reduced to tears. Shit. Interesting, Smoker thought idly. Princess Vivi is the heir to the Alabastian throne, but that country is in midst of a civil war. He blew out a long puff of smoke. Let's just see WH. The desert island has in store for us. Usopp continued to stare out at the sea, still deep in thought. I wonder if I can really be like them someday. Hey, Usopp. What are you thinking about? Is the sea that interesting? Luffy joked. Usopp spun around and pointed at him. No, I will be. He shouted, as if Luffy had been the one to express doubt on his behalf. One day I'll visit Helboff, the village of warriors. And prove myself. Count on it. He crossed his arms and closed his eyes, envisioning it. Luffy hummed thoughtfully. Sounds good to me, he said. Meanwhile, Vivi and Nami were discussing how much longer it would take to get to Alabasta. Nami noted that Vivi seemed to be a bit worn out. I guess that's just what happens when you go adventuring with Luffy, she thought with a mental sigh. Nami-san, Vivi-chan. I made some snacks for the journey ahead. Sanji said as he came down the stairs onto the deck, holding out a plate. He heard a sharp intake of breath, and slowly turned his head to see Luffy practically drooling over the plate. Your share is in the kitchen, he said in an annoyed tone. Luffy jumped from the deck up to the kitchen door with Usopp scrambling closely after them. The only one not out said, was Zoro, who was trying to get back into shape by lifting weights. Luffy had taken to doing that a lot as well, annoyed by the limits of his weaker body, but he didn't really have the attention span to train in such a dull way like Zoro did. He preferred sparring over everything else, really. The two had been doing a lot of that recently. Luffy walked back out with a plate of food, and something worrisome caught his attention. Vivi was sweating and leaning against the mast of the going Mary as if she was having trouble standing. 
Nami was shooting her troubled glances every few seconds, as if to make sure she wasn't about to collapse. Luffy jumped down and landed next to her. Are you alright, Vivi? She looked up at him and gave him a small smile. I'm okay, Luffy-san. I guess I'm just a little tired after all that. Luffy walked closer to her and brought a hand up to her head. Her forehead was hot enough for him to feel the pee before he even touched her. You're burning up, he said quietly. I'm fine, she insisted. It's probably just the effects of climate change. It'll wear off soon. Luffy knew that this was by no means true, and was about to argue when Vivi came. Loose from the mass that had been supporting her and walked away. Or at least she tried to. After a single step, she faltered, and would have fallen onto the deck if Luffy hadn't caught her. This quickly drew everyone's attention. Vivi Chan. Sanji yelled in worry, setting down the plates in his hand and rushing over. Luffy helped her into a sitting position, but she now looked like she was fighting just to stay awake. Her breathing was heavy and labored, and her eyes half-lidded. Nami looked slightly panicked now. Sanji, help me get her to the bedroom, Luffy said. The chef quickly complied, and they carried her carefully, making no fast or sudden movements, as if moving her too quickly would make her condition worse. For all Luffy knew, it could. He sighed. He'd been pretty sure that this was coming, and he'd essentially been waiting for it, not knowing what else to do. He couldn't change their course to Drum Kingdom ahead of time. They'd gotten the eternal pose to that country from Wapal last time. He could only hope that he hadn't changed things too much and that they'd run into them again. If not, he would personally coat Vivi in a hockey shield and fly her there himself at speeds that would put Eve the thousand sunny to shame. Once they got Vivi into a bed, Luffy walked out of the room and called Zoro down. Sanji was looking at Vivi with a grim expression, and once Zoro came in and saw her, his face matched the chef's. He shared a quick glance with Luffy, who simply nodded. She has a high fever, Nami began. If left alone, I think it could possibly become life-threatening. She said this objectively, but her voice quivered at the end of that statement. Dying of illness at sea is a common occurrence, especially in Grand Line conditions. We're going to need to find her a doctor. She paused. We're still a week from Malabista, she said quietly. If she goes untreated until then. She trailed off, a pained expression on her face. She remembered the newspaper that she'd hidden from Vivi. It was either Vivi's life or her wish to save her country. They would have to risk one. If they risked the latter, Vivi might not forgive her. But if they risked the former, she might not forgive herself. She started trembling before she felt a hand on her shoulder. She turned to see Luffy looking at her with a determined expression. His gaze spoke of an end. Resolve. Don't worry, Nami, he said. We'll save Vivi, then we'll stop the war. One thing at a time. But the log pose. Nami protested. We can't just abandon the course when all we have is one eternal pose and she won't make it to Alabista at this rate. Her voice sound. Desperate. Then I'll fly her to the nearest island. Whatever it takes, Luffy said firmly. As if his attitude was contagious, the looks on Sanji and Usopp's faces slowly became less uncertain. And more decisive. They would not let Vivi die out here before she even got to her country. And no, Vivi suddenly spoke up. All eyes turned to her in shock as she slowly and shakily pushed herself into a sitting position. Nami wondered how she could possibly have the energy to sit up with a temperature of 40 degrees C. Celsius. Continue our course, she said with difficulty. We see can't afford any DD tours. Nami, Usopp, and Sanji looked at her like she was insane. Luffy looked at her with an unreadable expression. Finally, he spoke. I'm not going to have a dead comrade on my conscience, Vivi, he said, making sure to phrase it as if it would be more of a detriment to himself if Vivi died. It left a bad taste. His mouth, but he knew how Vivi's mind worked. She was more considerate of others she was of herself. 
His words caused her to flinch, but she continued on. Please, Luffy Sam, she said between pants. I know this is your ship. And it's not my decision, but God, please. Luffy was silent for a few seconds. Then he walked up to her and gently helped her to lie down again before answering. Your greatest desire is to save your country. I know that, he said. As captain of this ship, it's my job to protect not only its occupants, but their dreams and ambitions as well. He looked her in the eye. So, I'll do anything to save your country, he said. Nami, you sop. And Sanji looked at him with wide eyes, wanting nothing more than to protest the decision he had seemingly just made. But before they could, he spoke again. And if that means saving your life first, I'll do just that without a second thought. There's no way. We can save your country without you Vivi. You know that as well as I do. We're just pirates. Right now, my highest priorities are saving both your life and your dream, and dry. Now, that means we need to find a new course. If you want to save your country, then you better make damn well sure you survive. Vivi's eyes widened as she remembered. I gar am telling her the exact same thing. Nami and Usopp both sighed in relief, and Sanji gained a newfound respect for his captain at that moment. Luffy got up from his chair and walked out of the room, and Zoro spoke up for the first time. I guess that's that then, he said. Usopp, Sanji, stay here with Vivi. Nami, come. Out so we can discuss with Luffy what we need to do now. They all nodded wordlessly and did as instructed. As soon as Nami stepped out of the room, though, she froze. This. Feeling. It's not a normal storm. Could it be? Luffy, we have an emergency. She shouted. We need to unfurl the sails and catch the wind from the port side. Luffy turned to her and nodded. He and Zoro both altered their course slightly to account for Nami's instructions. About a minute later, they were rewarded with the knowledge that their ship wouldn't sink at the hands of the massive cyclone that manifested in the area that they had previously been sailing into. For the next day, the Straw Hats delved back into their hockey training to take their minds off things, not knowing what else to do. They each took turns tending to Vivi while Zoro stayed on the lookout for signs of an island, or of a certain Damas King's ship for that matter. It was after about 21 hours that he spotted a familiar sight. Hey, there's an enemy ship ahead. He shouted down to Luffy, Nami, and Usopp. Usopp ran over to the rail and looked out over the sea. What are you talking about, Zoro? There's no enemy ship. Just a guy standing on the water. Zoro raised an eyebrow at him. A guy dot standing on dot the water. You sopa repeated. Attempting to rationalize it. Standing on water? Nami asked. Is that even possible? Luffy hummed and thought. Maybe in a parallel universe where ninjas blow up mountains with giant compressed balls of ninja energy, he said. The screw stared at him quizzically. Where did that come from? You sopa asked. Luffy shrugged not really knowing himself. Their ship finally came to a stop in front of the strange man who was still standing on top of the water as if it was a completely natural thing to do. Nami and Usopp stared at him with deadpan expressions. Quite cold today, isn't it? The man commented. Usopp perked up as if he had just noticed. Yeah, it is pretty cold today, he said matter-of-factly. I know, right? The man said. The two continued staring at each other while the others watched silently. Finally, Usopp spoke. So, how are you standing on the... He was interrupted by the sound of water being displaced and their ship being pushed back by the waves as a huge submarine emerged from the water. The submarine quickly converted to a regular ship when the roof freeled itself in. Suddenly the door to the going Mary swung open and Sanji dashed out. What are you guys doing? All this swaying. Going to. He paused, taking a look around. He slowly lit a cigarette and took a drag before letting out a puff of smoke. So, he said. What's happening? We're being ambushed, Luffy stated matter-of-factly. Yeah, I figured. 
Sanji said as several men aimed rifles at his face. That makes five people. Is this crew really that small? A fat man wearing white hippo fur said. Well, not that it matters. I'd like to ask you all a question. What is it? We're in a hurry, Luffy said. The man hummed. We're on our way to Drum Kingdom, he said as he chewed on a large piece of meat. But I guess we can take the time to loot your ship. Give us all your treasures, he commanded. No, Luffy said with a blank expression. Insolent commoner. One of the intruding men shouted as he addressed Luffy. You dare disobey the orders of King Wapal? Know your place, trash. Luffy turned to him with a glare, and the man froze in fear as his flesh chilled and his blood froze. He took a step back and fell backwards onto the deck, dropping his rifle. You can go jump into the sea now, Luffy said, in a simple tone that somehow conveyed that it wasn't really a suggestion. The man scrambled to his feet in terror and let Ove. The railing of the going merry before a loud splash was heard. Luffy turned back to Wapal, who was staring after the man in annoyance. What the hell is wrong with that idiot? He asked. Well, whatever. He started to open his mouth. Luffy, whose observation hockey alerted him to the fact that Wapal was about to eat part of their ship, promptly sent the man flying off of it with a kick. His men all stared in shock for a while before one of his officers spoke up. This is bad. His Majesty is an anchor. We have to go get him. They all prepared to leave in panic, but Luffy spotted something of interest and stopped them. Hey, you! He shouted to a man who he assumed was their navigator. Is that an eternal pose? The man turned to him in fear and stuttered out an answer. Why yeah, it is. He said. Is it pointing to that Drum Kingdom place? Luffy asked. The man confirmed his theory once again. Cool, Luffy said. Hand it over. The man looked shocked. Why the hell would I do that? He shouted. The answer Luffy provided him with was quite painful, and as Luffy looked over the eternal pose labeled. Drum in interest, Wapal's officer, the one who had been standing on the water, shouted after him. You bastard. We need that to get back to our home country. Give it back before we take it by force. Luffy turned back to him. No, I'm actually going to keep this. You should probably go get that hippo dude by the way. He'll drown soon. The officer looked at him in outrage, knowing he was right, Bifo. Shouting for Wapal's men to take them in the direction that their king had flown. As the ship pulled away, he shouted one more time over his shoulder. You better remember this. Don't you dare forget our faces. We'll have our revenge one day. The other officer shouted. I don't think I could remember them even if I wanted to, Luffy thought sardonically. With their course now set out for them thanks to the eternal pose Luffy had acquired, the Straw Hats finally had an idea where they were going. They started following the need. And after a couple hours it started snowing consistently. Nami theorized this meant that they were approaching an island, remembering a conversation she'd had with Vivi about the individual climates of islands in the Grand Line. After another hour, Sanji spotted land. A winter island from the looks of it. When they got close to the island and got ready to dock, Luffy sensed hostile auras surrounding them and frowned, remembering what happened last time. Zoro suggested that. They send a couple people to look for the doctor while the rest wait. They would only travel slower in a large group. Luffy and Sanji both volunteered to go. Only Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji noticed the crowd accumulating on the cliffs surrounding them. Hey, we've got a welcoming party, Sanji said in a neutral tone that somehow didn't fail to convey his sarcasm. Stop right there, pirates. They all turned to the authoritative voice. Turn around at once and leave this island, the man said. Your entrance will not be permitted. What? Nami asked in shock. You won't even let us dock? Please, we're looking for a doctor. One of our crewmates is dying. Her voice seemed to falter at the end of that sentence. The man's eyes seemed to widen slightly at this as if it was something he hadn't been expecting, 
but the surrounding crowd just started shouting at them, rifles raise. Your lies won't fool us, scum. We're not letting any damn pirates wreak havoc in our country. Raise anchor and leave, or we'll make you. Sanji grimaced. Well, that was a bad first impression, he commented. None of your smart ass remarks. One man shouted, firing once at Sanji's feet. Sanji barely avoided getting shot in the leg due to the guy's impulsive actions, and he immediately turned to glare towards the villager. So, you want to play big shot, tough guy? Sanji muttered darkly. The man gulped but reloaded in response to Sanji's challenge, and Sanji took a step forward, but was held back by Nami and Usopp. Another gunshot went off. It was would have hit Nami in the back had it not rebounded off of Luffy's open palm. The villager seemed undeterred due to the fact that he hadn't successfully hit anyone yet, and continued firing. But the bullets were all either deflected or straight out blocked by Luffy's hand. The man ran out of whatever limited ammo he had, and gulped again. Some of the other villagers got ready to support him, and from the upper deck of the going Mary, Zoro unsheathed his swerve. Slightly. Luffy gave the villager his own glare. I think that's enough, he whispered. This time the man's reaction was much more profound. He dropped his empty rifle and stumbled ba onto the snow, sweating despite the extreme cold. All of the other villagers had similar reactions, taking multiple steps back and some even dropping their weapons. Only Dalto seemed unaffected, but even he was taken aback by the fact that the determined villagers were somehow being threatened into submission. He looked the pirate captain dead in the eye, and the man stared back, unflinching. For a long while they locked gazes, until the captain did something unexpected. He lowered himself onto his hands and knees and bowed his head to the ground. Please, he said loudly. We can't leave. If we do, our crewmate will die. Please help us. The villagers seemed shocked that the man who had them all shamefully cowering just seconds ago was now bowing his head and begging for their assistance. It especially struck Dalton. And he relented first. We'll lead you into the village, he said. Follow me. At those words, the crowd started dispersing. Luffy rose to his feet and Zoro sheathed what was visible of his sword. Sanji, get Vivi, he ordered. Sanji hastily did just that, realizing the tension had subsided, and when he returned with the sick princess, they all followed behind Dalton. Let me warn you beforehand, Dalton said. There is only one doctor in this country. Most of the straw hats were shocked at this information. How could an entire country be home to only one doctor? Dalton stopped and turned back to them. And they call her a witch, he added, huh? A temperature of 42 degrees? Dalton whispered in disbelief. How can that be? We'd like to know ourselves, Nami answered despondently. It's been steadily rising ever since we realized she had a fever. Dalton stared down at the girl in awe. The fact the she was still alive was almost miraculous. What kind of life force did she possess? It doesn't matter if she's a witch, Luffy said firmly. As long as she can cure her, it'll be enough. Sanji nodded in agreement. Dalton pointed out the window to the direction of several tall, white mountains. Those mountains are called the Drum Rockies. You might see a large castle at the peak of the one in the middle. That castle is currently vacant of a king. Dr. Kira lives in the castle. She's the lone doctor in this country, whom its citizens call a witch. Luffy nodded in acceptance. He really didn't care if she was crazy. That witch doctor was able to cure Nami last time. She knew her stuff, and the same could be said for Chop. Sanji seemed to accept this easily enough as well and spoke up, then let's call her. If we wait much longer. He trailed off. I wish I could, Dalton said regretfully. But we have no way to contact her. Sanji's eyes widened, and he quickly explained. She essentially treats people according to whim. She comes down from the drum Rockies whenever she feels like it, treating the sick and taking whatever she wants from their homes as payment. 
according to eyewitnesses. She flies down from the drum Rockies on a sleigh pulled by an unidentified creature. Usopp was conspicuously freaking out over this new information. Nami looked disbelieving and even Sanji was having trouble taking it in. I guess we're going up that mountain, then, Luffy said as if it was that simple. Dalton stared at him apprehensively, but nodded. How can there only be one doctor in this entire country? Nami asked doubtfully. Dalton hesitated, then started explaining how the country's previous king had nearly brought to ruin. The Straw Hats were shocked at the mention of the word Wapal, remembering the man that had recently attacked their ship. After Dalton went on to explain how Wapo had purged the country of its doctors and essentially monopolized the treatment of the sick, Nami informed him that they had run into Wapal at sea shortly before arriving here. Dalton looked distressed after hearing this, saying that the country could very well fall to ruin if he returned now. But why is the former king of the country out on the sea pretending to be a pirate? Usopp asked. Dalton's teeth clenched. Because he abandoned his country, he responded. He went on to explain the situation that the country was in and how it all started. He explained that without warning, the entire country had been ravaged by pirates. At mention of the name Blackbeard, Luffy's demeanor changed drastically. His fists clenched and his entire body started trembling. With what could only be rage. Nami and Sanji both noticed. Nami absently snuck a glance at Zoro, whose eyes were narrowed. That just about confirmed her suspicions. They knew the pirate in question. But how did they meet them? Could they have originated from East Blue as well? Luffy and Zoro had known each other for two and a half years before the formation of the crew. Could they have had a run-in with them during that time? She debated whether to ask, but Zoro spoke up before she could. If this country was invaded by the Blackbeard pirates, then there's not much that could have been done, he said. Dalton turns to him questioning. Unless the world government decided to commit an unreasonably large force for relief, there's really no way you could have fought back, Zoro continued. As crazy as it sounds, a small group like that can take down nations. Dalton studied Zoro closely, taking his words into careful consideration. You sound as though you speak from experience, he said finally. Zoro just shrugged. You guys are lucky our captain reacts relatively well to hostility, he said. Luffy shot him a look that clearly said that wasn't necessary, and Zoro shrugged. Again. I dot C, Dalton said slowly. He turned back to the drum Rockies, deciding to change the subject. If you're serious about going up there, I suggest you climb up from the other side. This side of the mountain is inhabited by large, carnivorous rabbits called lepids, he said. Don't worry about it, Luffy said as Nami and Usopp carefully covered Vivi in a blanket and tied her to Luffy's back. I won't be climbing. Dalton blinked at this and wondered what he meant by that, while Sanji sighed. I want to go with you, he said. But with the way you travel, I'll just slow you down. He looked at Luffy determinedly. So, take care of Vivi-chan, Luffy. Luffy nodded firmly. And then turned to Zoro. One more thing, Zoro. Zoro looked at him, but Luffy was silent. After a few seconds, Zoro raised his eyebrows. Luffy just grinned at him. Eventually Zoro sighed and shrugged. The rest watched this display in a mixture of confusion and annoyance. Nami knew they were communicating something. She just didn't know what it was, or why they didn't want everyone else to know. The rest of them didn't really know what to make of the exchange. Nami signed in exasperation. Luffy gave Zoro a thumbs up before he jumped high into the air. Dalton wondered for a split second what he was doing before he took another jump in midair. Dalton's eyes widened. He can fly? Is that a devil fruit? Dalton asked. To be honest, I don't know how he does it, Usopp said. But Luffy defies logic a lot. You learn not to question it. They watched as Luffy shot off into the air, going deliberately. Slow so as to not put too much pressure on Vivi, and eventually left their sight. Soon afterwards, 
a villager came and informed Dalton that Dr. Kira had been spotted in the neighboring village of Coco Weed. It took a few seconds for the rest of the straw hats to process this information. Oh, fucking hell. It was about 10 minutes later that Luffy reached the top of the Drum Rockies. Slightly winded, he took several seconds to catch his breath. Damn, I really am out of shape, he said matter-of-factly as he walked towards the castle. He slipped through the open door, careful not to bump into it as he caught sight of the bird's nest on top of it. Taking a loop around, he absorbed the familiar sight. A small smile came to his face as memories of chasing a xenophobic, talking, transforming reindeer around the halls of the castle flick here. Through his mind, he smirked deviously. With a little of his observation hockey, Chopper wouldn't stand a chance this time. It wasn't even fair, really. He trudged up the stairs through the indoor snow and called out once he got to the top. Hello. He waited a full five seconds for a response before wondering what the hell he was doing, and reaching out for any auras in the castle. He frowned. There was no one here. That didn't make sense. As he widened his search to the full range of the mountain he was on, he began to get nervous. Time was ticking away as Vivi's condition worsened and here he was standing in an empty castle in the middle of nowhere. Mountain. He could get back easily enough, but if Chopper and his mentor were out right now, his greatest chance of finding them was waiting right here for them to come back. He would inevitably get restless, and watching Vivi suffering as he waited here doing nothing would be torture, but it was the best course of action right now. With a resigned sigh, he started to look for the nearest patient room. He quickly found a room with several beds and untied Vivi from his back, laying her down on one hang in. There, Vivi. We'll get you treated in no time. Vivi's breathing seemed to have become even more labored since he last checked. He took a deep breath and forced himself to tack. A seat. That didn't last long, though, and he ended up pacing around the room after about 10 seconds. Hurry, Chopper. Dalt inside. This was just bad luck. They had missed Dr. Kira by a few minutes. She would be on her way back to the castle by now. What do we do now? Nami asked. Should we just hope that Luffy is able to meet up with her? That's about all we can do, Nami-san, Sanji said worriedly. I don't doubt that Luffy will make it to the top, but I wonder if he'll actually stay there once he realizes that the place is empty. It would be bad if he came back down and wasted that much more time. He frowned. To top it off. The only ones of us who can somehow guess what that guy is. Thinking half the time decided to go for a swim in the sub-zero seawater. About that, Usopp said. Is he really going to be okay? Sub-zero water is just as hazardous as it sounds, if not more. He'll be fine, Sanji said dismissively. It's Vivi-chan I'm worried about. Just then, a distressed civilian burst through the door to the bar they were in. Dalton San. The man shouted in panic, we have a disaster in our hands. What is it? Dalton asked. Is Kira bankrupting the populace again? Wapal has returned. At those words, Dalton's face went pale before his eyes hardened with resolve. He stormed past the civilian and out the door as Nami and Usopp watched. In apprehension. And now he's gone, too, Sanji said smacking his forehead in annoyance. As Dalton ran, his face gradually elongated, his hands and feet morphed into hooves, and fur grew from every inch of his body. Soon he had taken the complete form of a bison, charging through the snow with the swiftness and grace that only his years of experience in doing so could yield. Today, we end this, Wapal. As Kura and Chopper walked back towards the castle, Chopper frowns. Kuro kept walking before noticing he wasn't following, and turned back to him. What is it, Chopper? I smell someone inside the castle, he said with trepidation. Kuro's eyes narrowed. Is it? It's not Wapal, Chopper said with certainty, guessing her question. There are two people. I've never smelled either of them before. Well, let's go see who they are, shall we? 
Chopper hesitated for a second before nodding. They made their way through the door, Chopper tilting his head up to make sure the birds were okay, and went up the stairs. From there, Chopper led them to the nearest patient rest area, and let Kira lead the way from there, nervously walking into the room. After her, the intruder looked like he had been expecting them, and a mix of happiness and relief spread across his face at the sight of them. Hi, there, he said. Chopper didn't respond, and Kira, who otherwise would have reacted to his presence with hostility, took one look at the presence on the nearest bed and calmed down. It's okay, Chopper. It seems he's brought a patient. The man nodded. I'm Luffy. This is my crewmate. She's extremely sick. Could you take a look at her? There was a hint of well-hidden worry in his voice. That is my job, Kira commented idly as she looked over Vivi with a trained eye. After a few seconds and a touch to Vivi's forehead she frowned. Her symptoms are unusual, she began. I've never seen a patient with an illness like this before, but I have an idea of what's afflicting her nonetheless, she said. Luffy's eyes widened slightly. She already had a potential diagnosis? He'd known this woman was good after the first time around. Despite her quirks. But he hadn't known she was that good. The only other one he could think of that could do something like that was. Well, Chopper from the future. Law came close, but he was more of a surgeon than anything. So, can you treat her? Luffy asked. I believe so, Kira concluded. I just need to check through some notes to make sure my diagnosis is correct first. Come, Chopper. As Chopper followed her out, he glanced over his shoulder one last time at Luffy. Luffy grinned and waved, and Chopper hurriedly kept walking. Wapal panicked, kicking and screaming as he clutched the wound across his midsection. Damn you, Dalton. What the hell do you think you're doing, raising your weapon again? Your king? You are not longer this country's king, Wapal, just as I am no longer its officer. We must leave the past behind us. Dalton yelled with conviction. This land has no need for relics of the Dark Age. Wapal's soldiers took a chance and started shooting at Dalton, only for the bison man to leap, vault, and spin over their fire in a surprising display of speed. They were cut down in seconds. What kind of arrogant nonsense are you spouting? Wapal asked scathingly, ignoring the defeat of his lower ranked men. His confidence seemed to have been restored now the Chess and Kuro Marimo were standing off against Dalton. As the 20 MDs patched up his injury, the pain made way for outrage at his once loyal subject. Who do you think you talking to, fool? This is my kingdom you are living in. No. Dalton said as he raised his weapon once again. You have no place here. A kingdom that would abandon its people to their fates is better off destroyed. And who is going to destroy it, Dalton? Kuro Marimo asked in an annoyed, smug tone. The three of us once acted as the kingdom's three heads. You should know very well. That you cannot beat both of us. And besides, Chess said as he pulled out three arrows. We know your weakness all too well. Your compassion will be the death of you. Dalton broke into a sweat as he followed the aim of the arrows back towards the civilians who had rallied themselves to aid Dalton in the battle that he should, by all rights, be fighting alone. Without a moment's hesitation, he flung himself in the path of the arrows that he knew full well were meant for him even if aimed at the kingdom's people. The civilians watched in horror. As blood stained Dalton's coat around the arrows embedded in his dorso and he fell to his knees, reverting back from his hybrid form. You're a fool, Dalton, Wapal stated. You were once my greatest officer, and look what kind of death you've chosen. It's truly a waste, he said as Chess readied two more. Arrows aimed at his vitals. The civilians ran to stop him, but weren't nearly fast enough. Oh, well? Wapal said dismissively as Chess let the arrows fly. Dalton's execution was interrupted by a sudden whirlwind of ice and snow that seemingly came out of nowhere. The arrows disappeared into the small blizzard, and two metallic 
clinks signifying the meeting of metal against metal could be heard over the spin of the snow, which forced Chess to shield his eyes. Just as quickly as it came into existence, it died down, and a lone man stood in front of Dalton with a single sword raised. Phew, just in time, the green-haired man said with a grin. I almost got lost during my endurance training. Lucky I locked on to some auras. You can easily claim that it's due to character development from the future, but I still feel I should point it out, Zoro would never admit that he got lost, would he? You. You're one of those pieces of trash we met on our way here. Wapal screamed in fury. That's my line, Zoro said casually. Aiming for those who can't fight to get a hit in on someone you can't beat? Pathetic. Wapal ground his teeth in anger. Chess. Kuro Marimo, he seethed. I want to see this commoner dead at my feet. As the civilians got over their shock at seeing a pirate defend their country and started to haul Dalton's unconscious form away, the two officers wordlessly got ready for a fight, and Zoro smirked. I guess we can't all get what we want. Vivi slowly opened her eyes and blinked as they watered under the glare of the light. She felt God surprisingly well. She slowly sat up, noting that it was far easier than the last Tim. She attempted it, and took a look around. She spotted a small, strange creature that looked like an odd mix between a deer and a raccoon dot 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 except it was bipedal. And it was. Sorting books on a shelf. Sorting books? Could this thing be? Deciding to forego all attempts to classify the creature, she quietly addressed it. Um, excuse me? At the sound of her voice, the creature quickly spun around and jumped backwards into the bookshelf, knocking everything over. Vivi winced as it came crashing to the floor. The creature the shot for the doorway, but instead of leaving, it hid behind it. Well, sort of. I think you are doing it wrong. You're supposed to face the other way, she said politely. Not that I'm an expert on the subject, she added mentally. The creature quickly correct itself, hiding its body behind the door with its head sticking out in a mix between fear and curiosity. I can still see you, I'm afraid, she said in slight amusement. In fact, I saw you from the beginning. Shut up. The creature yelled suddenly. I don't take advice from humans. He paused. By the way, how's your fever? Much better, thank you, Vivi replied suppressing her initial reaction. This confirmed her suspicions from before. If it, or rather, he, she assumed, could sort books on a shelf. Then he had a degree of intelligent thought similar to that of a human. But if he could talk as well, then that meant that despite his appearance and his evident scorn for them, was a little human himself. If you don't mind me asking, Vivi began slowly. What kind of animal are you? His eyes widened and he broke into a sweat at hearing that. Evidently deciding he would have no more of this, he called out. Doctrine. Keep it down in there, Chopper. A low feminine voice called out. A woman of gray hair and old age walked into the room, and the creature made a break for it. The woman. Snickered. Looks like your fever has gone down quite a bit, girl. How are you feeling? Better than I have in days. Vivi replied. Are you the one who treated me? The woman poked her in the forehead rather than responding. 38 degrees, not bad, she muttered before taking a swig of the sake bottle in her hand. Vivi was impressed that she could discern her exact temperature with a touch. And no, the woman continued. Chopper is the one who nursed you back to health. Chopper? Vivi asked in confusion. Is he? He's that little reindeer you startled, the woman confirmed. I'm Dr. Kira, his mentor. You can call me Doctorine. Doctorine, would you mind telling me? What? You want to know the secret of my eternal youth? She asked with a grin. Um, maybe later, Vivi said. Where am I exactly? Drum Kingdom, Kira replied. More specifically, the castle atop the Drum Rockies. Drum Kingdom. Vivi repeated. She knew of the country, but not much about it. Was she here alone? Where was the rest of the crew? 
If you're wondering about the one who brought you here, I had him relocated to another room. Kuro supplied. And dot who was that exactly? Vivi asked sheepishly. Kuro grinned in amusement. A young man named Luffy. Wears a straw hat. He was quite the character. He ascended the mountain like it was no big deal. When I asked him how he did it, he replied that he flew. I was skeptical, but how else could he get up here without a scratch? Vivi's eyes widened. So, Luffy had brought her here. That meant the crew had found a new route and Luffy had brought her to a doctor personally. My, you must have really been out of it, Kuro said. But I guess that's to be expected. You were bitten by Keschia, after all. Keschia. Vivi repeated. It's an extinct species of tick that carries a lethal strain of bacteria. If one is bitten by it, symptoms of the infection include a fever of 40 degrees or above, intense pain throughout the entire body, and death after five days. You were on your third day it seems. Vivi gulped as she rubbed the spot on her neck that she had once dismissed as a simple mosquito bite. Honestly, you're lucky I kept the antibiotic to that strain of bacteria. It's been extinct for over 100 years. I'd love to know how you spent your week. Kuro continued. Were you running around on a prehistoric island or something? Vivi gave her a small, sheepish smile. I'm afraid so, she admitted. Kuro threw back her head and laughed. Is that so? Well, hopefully you at least cover it up. That can help sometimes, though I guess it didn't quite do much for you in this case since you were bitten on the neck. I see, Vivi said. Then, if the illness has been treated, I suppose I can get discharged soon? She inquired, thinking about how long it would take to get to Alabas to now. Depends what you mean by soon. Even if the bacteria has been killed and the fever has gone down, your body is still in a delicate condition and the infection still needs to be monitored. With most cases of Keschia treatment a patient would have to take 10 days to heal even if they survived. Vivi's eyes widened in horror upon hearing this. But don't worry, that 100 year old medicine pales in comparison to my modern day treatment. You'll be fine to leave after 3 days at most. 3 days. I can't wait that long, Vivi said. I don't mean to be ungrateful. But seeing as we're in a rush, I'll take my chances. She attempted to get up from the bed as she said this, but Dr. Kuro stopped her, swiftly grabbing a scalpel and pushing her back down onto the bed, holding the blade against her neck and shocking her out of her wits. There are only two circumstances under which I discharge my patients, she said with a low voice. When they're healed, or when they're dead. She smirked. So, pick one. Vivi's gaze hardened. I don't care if you threaten me, she growled. My country is awaiting my return. I can't afford to stay here for three days. Well I'm sure there's a story behind that, Kuro said. Not that it interests me, but will you be any use to your country if you're dead? She asked as the blade of the scalpel gleamed in the light. Vivi gritted her teeth, knowing the logic was sound. But this was pretty difficult to accept considering how irrational Doctorine was being about her. Discharge. She was about to speak when a voice made itself known in the doorway. You're not really going to kill her after she just got better, are you? They both turned to the doorway, in Vivi's case, as much as she could without getting her throat cut, to say. A familiar presence. Luffy-san. Vivi exclaimed. Kuro scoffed. Well. That depends on her, she said in a bored tone before getting up and tossing the scalpel back onto the table. Vivi sat up, wondering how she could get out of this mess when Luffy spoke up again. Actually, it depends on me, Luffy said with a smirk. I won't let you kill her that easily you know. Oh? Kuro said, smirking back at him. Quite the confident brat, aren't you? Luffy shrugged. If I thought you were really going to do it, you'd know why by now, he said simply. Kuro scoffed again. Whatever, brat. Like I said, she leaves when she's fully healed or not at all. And I'll be taking all the money on your ship as payment for my services, unless you can somehow 
change my mind in the next three days. I'll get right on that, Luffy said. By the way, we're going to have company soon. Kira raised an eyebrow. What do you mean company? Feels kind of like a hippo riding another hippo, Luffy said cryptically. Kira's eyes narrowed at the description. Just then, Chopper burst through the door, looking panicked. Hey, what's up, Chopper? Luffy said jovially. The human reindeer hybrid ignored him and addressed Kira. Doctrine. Wapal's coming up the mountain. I can smell him. Kira stared at Luffy in suspicion. He had caught on to Wapal's approach around the same time as Chopper. Possibly even before. Either that or he'd already known he was. Coming. She didn't really want to think too much about the latter option right now. In the outskirts of Bighorn, Zoro looked down at the bloody, beaten forms of Chess and Kiro Marimo in annoyance. It's like just anyone thinks they can fight me these days, H. Said to no one in particular. At least in the New World people generally had a feel for someone else's strength. I can't believe I had to fight these idiots to get the message. Across to that dumbass king. He grunted in annoyance. And to top it off I let him get away. Zoro sighed, thinking back on Luffy's unspoken orders. Don't take out the hippo. Guy he says. Leave him to Chopper he says. What is that idiot thinking? Well, he didn't feel like trying to puzzle out Luffy's whims right now, so he started walking back to Bighorn to check on the other straw hats. Wapal's face was a mix of terror and furry as he faced the three commoners who refused to let him pass. He still hadn't gotten past his fear at seeing his best soldiers brutally beaten barehanded as if they were nothing. After seeing that he had made a break for the Drum Rockies, intent on reaching the safety of his castle, if Chess and Kuro Marimo had to be sacrifices to ensure his well-being, then so be it. But upon ascending the mountain, he had found his passage to his own castle blocked by the sole surviving Doctor of Drum Kingdom, the Yeti that had tried to attack him six ye ago before being stopped by Dalton and that infuriating pirate who had had the audacity to kick him into the sea and steal his eternal pose. In short, he was surrounded by treason. He gritted his teeth in frustration. He now had no choice but to take his country back himself. His subordinates may have been thrashed, but he was the king. He couldn't be beaten by commoners. He had the divine right to rule by blood. Get out of my way! Wapal commanded. What right do you have to so casually take residence in the king's castle, you wish? King's castle? Kuro repeated with an innocent expression. You must be mistaken. When I found this castle it was completely empty. It was clearly abandoned. So I took it. Well I'm claiming it back. Wapal screamed in outrage. So unless you want to be executed, leave my home. Letting us off so easily? Kuro said with a smirk. That seems unlike you. I'd go as far as to say you're out of your comfort zone without those two brats following you around. And fighting your battles for you. Where are those idiots anyway? So it looks like you really intend to defy me, Wapal said quietly. It doesn't matter if Chess and Kuromarimo have been defeated. I'll take back my kingdom on my own. He seemed irrational at this point. Kuro frowned. Defeated? Those two? Wapal's two head officers were sole reason why the populace had been helpless against Wapal's tyranny. Dalton could stand up to them, but even he couldn't take them both at once. The only one in all of Drum Kingdom that could achieve such a feat dot 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 was her own medical apprentice. Kira's eyes idly wandered over to the kid with the straw hat that was standing next to them, seemingly without a care in the world. Something clicked in her brain. He had called her current patient as crewmate. That meant he wasn't alone. She was broken out of her thoughts as Wapal finally made his move. He charged forward, most likely intent on swallowing them whole. He was intercepted by Chopper who met his charge in his reindeer form before shifting into his full zone form as he tackled Wapal. The king fell back with Chopper hovering over him. His fist was reared back, ready to strike, but he didn't. He hesitated, then spoke. 
Doctor was convinced that even you were worth saving, he said quietly before raising his voice. If you leave now, I won't hurt. You. Luffy pouted. That wouldn't end well. He wanted to see that punch happen. Shiro called out to him, calling him a fool, and Wapal, though confused, took the opportunity to extend his jaw and attempt to bite Chopper. He bit into thin air though, and looked up to see the reindeer being yanked back by an outstretched arm. You. So you've eaten a devil fruit as well? Wapal shouted. Chopper looked at Luffy in uncertainty. Um dot 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 thank you, he said. Luffy grinned and flashed him a thumbs up before speaking. I can tell you want to beat this guy, but you're hesitating, he said. Chopper's head perked up at this, and Kuro watched intently. You want to save this country right? Luffy. Asked. Chopper nodded eagerly. This was the country the doctor had been so intent on saving. Even if it had caused him to suffer, he would carry on that last wish of his. The. You can't do that, Luffy continued. You can't hesitate. I know you think that everybody has the potential to bring good to the world, but if you want to make a difference, you. Have to be firm in your resolve. Chopper pondered this statement as he thought back to the conversation he had had with this human earlier that day. Wait up, reindeer. Luffy shouted as he chased Chopper down the hall. The human reindeer kept running, crying hysterically in reaction to being chased by a human. Leave me alone, you damn human. He yelled in fear. No way. You're not getting away. Luffy yelled jovially. Finally Chopper turned around changed into his zone form. I said, get lost, jerk. He shouted, ramming Luffy's head with both fists. Luffy's head rocked back and his neck seemed to stretch before Chopper's eyes. He looked on in shock. He hadn't hit him that hard. His rising guilt at seemingly having just broken someone's neck was replaced by fear again when the man's head snapped back into place and he looked back at Chopper, grinning. Won't work. He yelled. Chopper fell back. What kind of human are you? He asked. Luffy responded quickly to the routine question. I'm a rubber man, he said simply. Chopper suddenly understood. He had eaten a devil fruit. Did that make this guy a monster, like him? What do you want from me? He asked indignantly now that he'd finally been caught. I already told you. Join my pirate crew. We need a doctor, Luffy said. Chopper found the offer to join a pirate crew very interesting but suppressed his interest. Just because H. was a pirate, that didn't change anything. I won't. He said. I know what you humans think of me. You all think I'm a monster. He shouted. Luffy just kept smiling at him. Yay, you're a monster, he confirmed without hesitation. Chopper gritted his teeth. He had come to expect this reaction, but that didn't make it much easier to hear. But who cares? So am I, Luffy continued. Chopper looked at him in slight curiosity. What kind of idiot calls himself a monster? He asked. Well, I can't really deny it at this point, Luffy said in an amused tone. Even my crew says it to my face. The casual way that he admitted something like that confused. Chopper who blinked in surprise. He couldn't imagine Doctor or Doctorine ever calling him a monster. They were the only ones who had ever accepted him. Your own crew? And you're okay with that? He asked, his usual shyness overridden by his confusion. Of course. Luffy said with conviction. Being a monster just means that I can protect them better. If I had to choose between being a monster who could protect what was, precious to me and a normal human who couldn't be relied on, I'd choose monster without a second thought. That's why I strive to become stronger. Chopper froze at these words. He had never thought of it that way. He had things he wanted to protect as well. Was that what he had to choose between? Being accepted and being able to protect WH. Was precious? If so, he couldn't really fault this guy's logic. He would choose to be a monster as well. Every time. Chopper brought his gaze back to Wapal and his eyes became focused. There's so much I have to learn if I want to protect them, he thought. I didn't know there would be this. 
much to it. He slowly pulled a small yellow ball out of his pocket and stared at it. Being a monster just means I can protect them better. I'd choose monster without a second. Thought. The words echoed in his mind and his eyes hardened. He tossed the pill into his mouth and chewed. Rumble. Kuro watched in fascination as Chopper's entire demeanor changed. When had he become so determined? It was as if his troubles had disappeared. She snuck another glance. At Luffy. Why did you come out here, kid? Just to give pep talks? She asked. Luffy turned to her and grinned. Oh, I'm just here to watch the show, he said as Chopper charged forward in walk point. Wapal was taken aback by his sudden increase in speed but was ready this time. It won't work. You forget that one of my officers used to be a zone as well. I already know how your power works. He knew the reindeer was going to change to his zone form. To throw another punch, and got ready to swallow him whole. He was quite surprised when instead he changed into a new form, one with huge horns. His eyes widened before. His mouth got caught on the large antlers and Chopper continued, undeterred. Wapal began sliding through the snow until Chopper finally bucked, sending him sailing through the air. He landed and continued sliding, coming to a stop just short of the cliff, before getting up again. So then that's your hybrid form. Well, now I've seen them all, he said as he wiped the blood off his chin. Luffy smiled wryly his expression a mix of I know something you don't. No and you're about to get fucked? This did not escape Kuro's notice. Behold. The true power of the Baku Baku no Mi. Wapal yelled, as he transformed into what appeared to be a house with cannons for arms. This surprised Chopper, but he pressed on. He couldn't afford to waste precious rumble time. As Wapal aimed both cannons at him, he quickly switched to guard point. The small cannons hit him dead on, on the to have no effect. He switched to jump point and leapt right at Wapal, who was stunned at having seen five different forms now, before switching to arm point after the jump. Kakutai, Rosa. Chopper's hooves embedded themselves into Wapal's stomach, leaving the visible imprint. Wapal coughed up blood and stumbled back, but regained his balance. He glared at Chopper in outrage and aimed his cannons at him again. This time Chopper dodged the aim using jump point, soaring high above Wapal's head. Wapal looked up in surprise as he increased his weight using heavy point and fell upon him like a boulder. Wapal raised his cannons too late and Chopper landed another hit. Kakutai, Diamond. Wapal grit his teeth as he was plunged deep into the snow. Six forms now? When would it end? He didn't have time to think about it though, as Chopper was preparing for another attack. As he charged, Wapal raised his cannons and shot from his awkward position. Chopper switched once again to guard point and winced at the impact, knowing he couldn't take too many hits like that. He landed and finally switched to brain point, which only seemed to infuriate Wapal more as he pulled himself out of th. Snow. Seven forms. Scope, Chopper whispered as he scanned for Wapal's weak point. He soon found it and chastised himself for not realizing it sooner. It's over, he said confidently. You won't get up after this next attack. Keep dreaming reindeer, Wapal growled. Your pathetic attacks won't bring me down. Chopper wasted no more time. He had 30 seconds left. He switched back and forth between walk point and jump point as he dodged the aim of the cannon fire. Finally he jumped right into Wapal's face and switched to arm point one last time. Wapal grinned. Fool. Going for my face is suicide. He opened his mouth wide and attempted to crush Chopper between his jaws, but Chopper was undeterred, having expected it. Before he could chomp down, Chopper sank his hooves into the back of Wapal's throat. Kakutai, cross. Wapal choked upon impact, and his eyes rolled back into his head before he fell. Backwards onto the snow, unmoving. Chopper sighed. Three minutes, he thought with satisfaction as he changed back to his hybrid form, panting lightly. Nice one, Chopper. Luffy called out. 
Chopper looked at him in surprise, before a sheepish, happy expression came onto his face. Shut up. Complimenting me won't make me happy, you bastard. He said in a very happy tone. As he swayed back and forth comically, Kira contemplated what had just happened. This man was most likely the cause of Chopper's sudden boost of confidence. That was the only explanation. Not only that, but he seemed to have a large amount of confidence in the reindeer, as if he knew he'd win. Where had that come from? She had overheard one of his attempts to recruit Chopper into his crew of pirates. She idly wondered if he'd be successful. The wound in Chopper's heart couldn't be easily healed, but considering the progress he already seemed to be making, it didn't seem so far-fetched. Chopper seemed dot 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 more comfortable in his own skin. Dalton San, that's what all. Kuro turned to the voice and saw Dalton and a group of villagers arriving at the top of the mountain in the cable lift. Most of them were staring at Wapal's unconscious form in shock. Zoro, Nami, Usopp, and Sanji, who had also arrived, were all coming to similar conclusions, except for Zoro who had a contemplative look oh. His face as he noted the hoof imprints on Wapal's torso. Dr. Kira. Dalton called, turning to the amused woman. What happened here? Who subdued Wapal? That would be my apprentice, Kira said, pointing to the human reindeer who was currently hiding behind a tree with his entire body exposed. The straw ads were a bit confused, having assumed it was Luffy. Dalton's eyes widened as he recognized Chopper. He's the one who tried to attack Wapal after the death of Dr. Hilyuk. Is he really the one who defeated him? When the realization hit him, he fell to both knees. Chess and Kuro Marimo had been defeated as well. This meant that finally, their country could be reborn. He bowed his head to the ground and faced Chopper. You have my thanks. Now. We can start anew. The reindeer looked startled and unsure of what to do in the face of his gratitude dot 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 until the villagers started freaking out over the sight of him. Once the word monster was let loose despite Dalton's discouragement, Chopper stepped out with a pained but resolved look on his face. So what if I'm a monster? He shouted. Even if I am, if I can protect everybody, I'm satisfied. Even if I can't be with everyone or make friends, if I can keep Dr. Hilyukyx dream alive, I have no regrets. The villagers were stunned at this, not only at the fact that the alleged monster was talking to them, but also at what it was conveying. Dalton wore a pained expression at the thought of Hilyukyx death. The man had given his life to keep hope alive in Drum Kingdom, but here was his successor right in front of them. Having vanquished the tyrant that threatened the man's dream, claiming that he would gladly live the life that had been forced on him if it meant protecting those that had force it on him. The people who claimed that Dalton was this country's savior knew so little. What are you talking about, idiot? A voice came, breaking him out of his thoughts. Of course you can make friends. Take a good look, he said as he walked up and stood beside his crewmates. We're your friends from now on, and there's one more of us too, so get used to it. Now get over here and join our crew already. The straw adds all perk. Up and took a good look at Chopper. So that little guy is joining our crew? Nami asked. Is he a doctor? We really need one. Bit of an oddity isn't he? Sanji commented. Well, not that I care. What's with the weird nose? Usopp asked hypocritically. Zoro stayed silent, simply taking a long look at Chopper as the reindeer stared at Luffy in shock before finally shaking his head stubbornly. I can't. Chopper yelled back. I want to, but it's impossible. I'm not like you. Regret filled his voice as the words left his mouth. Who cares? Luffy shouted back with stubbornness in equal measure. You think any of us are normal? We're all a sailing circus. Before anyone could attempt to refute this statement, Luffy pointed at Zoro. I mean look at this guy. My first mate drinks all night, sleeps all day, and then claims he doesn't get hangovers. Zoro let this comment slide. As he continued to observe Chopper, 
Luffy pointed to Nami next. You ever heard the phrase put your money where your mouth is? Well our navigator puts her money where he. Eyes are. I have no idea how she does it to this day. Nami had half a mind to interrupt his rant with a solid punch, but sighed, knowing full well that he was right. Luffy moved. On to Usopp. Our sniper could lie a thousand times during a lie detector test, and if his lies weren't so ridiculous, you'd never even know he was lying. Usopp swelled with Prid. And stood straighter, taking this as a compliment. Luffy then pointed at Sanji. And our chef will kick you through a wall for chewing with your mouth open while simultaneously flirting with the first woman he lays eyes on. Sanji shrugged indifferently, not bothering to deny it. Luffy pointed to himself. And me, I'm the most monstrous guy you'll ever meet in your life, so don't act like that doesn't make you a contender. Finally, Luffy pointed at Chopper. So give me one good reason why you shouldn't join our crew and come on adventures with us. Chopper's eyes had been filling with tears throughout this speech as his shell of stubbornness started to crack. But I'm a reindeer. I have hooves and antlers. And a blue nose. Don't you care? He asked doubtfully. Reindeers are cool, your hooves and antlers have proven useful, and your blue nose is funny. Luffy said with a straight face. Chopper's jaw dropped as his remaining reasons for not joining were shot down one by one. So no, I don't care, Luffy concluded. Now shut up and let's go. A dam seemed to break at these words, and Chopper was reduced to a fit of hysterical crying. The villagers and Dalton, who had stayed silent throughout the confrontation, looked on in wonder. From behind the castle wall, Vivi smiled faintly, having heard the entire thing. Will you stop your infernal crying and make up your mind? Kuro said with a scoff. Are you going or not? Chopper attempted to compose himself and turned to her. I'm sorry Doctrine. I dot 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 I want to go with them, he said as he sniffed. I appreciate everything you've done for me over the years, and I'll never forget it, but... He trailed off a... Eh? The goodbye became too much for him. Kuro waved her hand. Fine. Good riddance then, she said nonchalantly. Inwardly, her heart clenched as she turned away from him and walked back to the castle. On the wa, she crossed paths with Vivi, who was trying to cover up her attempts to sneak away. They locked eyes and Kira looked at her with a blank expression as Vivi started to swear. The straw ads heard a crash coming from the castle accompanied by what sounded like Vivi screaming frantically. Luffy let out a loud laugh as Nami, Usopp, and Sanji stiffened. In worry. Oh yay, there's still that. Be right back. He walked toward the castle. Get everyone onto the ship while I get extract Vivi, he said. The straw ats looked hesitant, but completely. And headed down the mountain via the cable lift. Luffy headed into the castle to find Vivi struggling to escape the grasp of Kira, who had her pinned to the floor. As much as I'd like to see how this plays out, we really need to get going soon, he informed the doctor. Kuro turned to him in annoyance. Going? Don't be ridiculous. I meant it when I said that my patients don't leave until they're healthy or dead. And don't forget about my payment either. Once she's completely cured, I'll expect full compensation, Kuro said. About that, Luffy began. This next move would make him feel really guilty, and he wouldn't pull it if he didn't know that they had to get to Alabas to fast. Since it was actually Chopper who treated her, and he's our crewmate now, doesn't that mean we should just discuss the matter of the fee with him? Kira's eyes narrowed, as she had an idea where this was going. And since she's technically his patient and not yours, that means she can leave as long as Chopper monitors her condition on the ship, doesn't it? Kira gritted her teeth, but got off of Vivi. I guess I can't argue with logic, now can I? She said before scoffing. Luffy tossed her a small metallic object, which she caught on reflex. This is the key to the armory, Luffy confirmed. I got a fof of Wapal's unconscious body. Figured you might want it. Well, isn't that great? You take my assistant and smart talk your way out of payment, 
but at least I've got this, right? Her voice was dripping with sarcasm. Get out of here. Kid, she said as she turned around. Never come back if you know what's good for you. As she walked away, Luffy called after her, his voice serious now. Thank you for everything, he said sincerely. I promise I'll do what's best for him and help him fulfill his dream. Kira froze in place, and Luffy noticed that she had started. Tremble. Suddenly she spun around. I told you to get the hell out of here, you fucking brat. Now leave before I change my mind. She shouted with bloodshot eyes. Luffy signaled to Vivi and the two quickly made their way out of the castle. When they got to the edge of the mountain, the lift was already gone. Luffy hoisted Vivi onto his back, and Vivi paled as she realized how they were going to get down. She resisted the urge to scream as Luffy took them across the mountainside and down to ground level using Jeppu. When they finally got back to the going Mary, she was panting furiously. As they made their way onto the ship, Luffy noticed Chopper's troubled expression. He didn't know WH. The reindeer was thinking about, but he had a hunch that whatever loose ends he was dealing with would be tied up soon. I'd keep an eye on that mountain if I were you, Chopper, he said with a grin. Chopper looked up at him curiously, and then turned back to the drum Rockies. It wasn't long. Before the all of the snow in a large circular vicinity of the center mountain turned pink from whatever chemical was adhering to it. From this distance, the entire mountain bore striking resemblance to a massive sakura tree in full bloom. Damn, you sop whistled. Wow, Vivi breathed in awe. It's amazing, Nami said. You said it, Sanji said as he looked up at the sight. Chopper, unable to contain himself, burst out crying again, and continued to do so even as their ship pulled away from Drum Island. Chopper watched in fascination as the rest of the Straw Hats went through their usual antics. Luffy was yelling at Sanji for food, Zoro was encouraging Chopper to drink with him. Nami was yelling at Zoro to stop being a bad influence on the impressionable reindeer. Usopp was offering a toast to their new crewmate while simultaneously telling him a story about the 50-meter-tall abominable snowman he had fought and drum. Sanji was yelling at Luffy to stop yelling at him for food and to just wait five damn minutes for it to cook, and Vivi was sitting next to Chopper, watching them all with an amused smile. They're pretty lively, huh? She asked Chopper. Chopper nodded his agreement. He had never seen people with so much energy before. It was really like watching a circus. Not that he'd ever seen one, but he'd heard about them. What's the big deal Nami? If you're old enough to be a straw hat, you're old enough to drink, Zoro said sagely. Even if that were true, he's too cute to be drinking with you idiots. She said firmly as she pointed at Zoro. So I guess that doesn't apply to you then? Zoro said with a smirk. He was promptly knocked to the deck head first by Nami's fist. He got up and laughed, ignoring the throb in his skull. You're just proving me right you know. Nami looked annoyed enough to continue doing just that, until Chopper walked up and grabbed a sake bottle. I want to try it, he said, smiling widely. Zoro grinned at victory as Nami looked at Chopper skeptically. Have you ever actually had alcohol before? She asked. Nope, Chopper admitted. But alcohol is okay in moderation. As long as you don't have too much, the body can cleanse it from the bloodstream without any long-term effects, H. Said, remembering what he'd read over the years. Right, Nami said with a smirk. Alright, go on then. She motioned for him to drink with her hand. Chopper brought the sake bottle to his lips with both hands and started. Chugging. After about a second, his face turned blue, and he dropped the bottle, gagging and coughing. His tongue hung from his mouth and he had a traumatized look on his face. Luffy and Zoro started laughing out loud and even Nami giggled. So, how was the first drink? Nami asked tauntingly. Chopper, not one to note sarcasm, responded as if it was an actual question. It was nasty. He shouted. It's even worse than my rumble balls. You guys drink that stuff for fun? Not me, Nami replied. 
I usually just drink when it turns me money. What would you do for money? Zoro asked as his laughter died down. Refrain from punching you? Nami suggested. Zoro blinked in recognition. Oh, that is something he was interrupted as he was once again sent plummeting to the deck head first. Damn which, Zoro said aloud from a seated position as Nami walked. A way to check the course. The Straw Hats continued partying well into the night before they finally went to sleep. Luffy looked out over the horizon with lifeless eyes as the island finally came into view. Zoro, he whispered. The swordsman awoke from his trance and looked as well. As the island drew closer, he snuck a glance at Luffy. He wasn't surprised by what he saw, but... That didn't make it easier. There was no joy. There was no evidence of the achievement in Luffy's eyes. There was only the same dead look that he had been adorning since the incident. He couldn't really... Blame his captain for that, but if this couldn't evoke any response from him, then what could? Luffy had been looking forward to this moment for most of his life, but as he took his first step onto the island he knew could only be raffle, he felt no sense of accomplishment. Only shame, Pirate King in one piece meant next to nothing now. Everything that it symbolized to him had been broken. There was no freedom to be found anymore. Because. They would never obtain that freedom. Nami would never draw a world map. Usopp would never meet his father and stand with him on equal footing as a brave warrior of the sea. Sanji would never find all blue. Chopper would never prove to the world that there was no incurable disease. Robin would never find the Rio Poneglyph. Frankie would never witness the Thousand Sunny take them all around the world. Brooke would never return to Reverse Mountain to meet Laboon. And Jinbi, who had met his end before he could even join, would never see fishmen and humans stand side by side in the sun. It was too much to bear. He had failed them all. And yet he kept trudging forward to fulfill his now empty dream, simply because Sanji's last words would never stop repeating themselves in his head. Zoro hopped off the sunny and started walking after Luffy. He knew what his captain was feeling. He just didn't seem to have the same drive to pursue the title of worlds greatest anymore. But if he stopped now dot 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 shit, how could he stop now? How could he shame them all like that? They both took a long look at the full breadth of the island. Most of it was jungle, and in the center was a cone-shaped mountain that seemed to tower as high as the red line. The top was obscured by the clouds. As they could think of only one place to get started, they quickly made their way through the jungle and over to the mountain. The jungle was strange, they noticed. There didn't seem to be animal life anywhere. In fact, the entire island was completely silent. When they began to ascend the mountain, a peculiar calm seemed to wash over them both. Once they finally reached the top, they felt serene, as if all of their troubles could simply vanish. They knew this was not the case, but somehow they couldn't escape the feeling that everything would work out in the end. It felt dot 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 strange, to say the least. Walking across the summit, they spotted a gigantic cave off in the distance. They were ready to go check what was inside when Luffy froze mid-step. Zoro looked at him in confusion. His eyes were wide as he stared ahead of them. Zoro traced the path of his eyesight but saw nothing other than the cave. Luffy was seeing something different. However, he continued to stare in awe at the grinning face of the Eternal Pirate King, Gile D. Roger. You did well to get here, kid. It seems as though you are indeed the one I was waiting for. No one else would be able to perceive my incorporeal form. As the legendary man spoke, his mouth did not move, and the smile continued to decorate his features as the words reached his successor. Luffy, who had said nothing up to this point finally responded. You're alive? He asked in wonder. Although he heard his own voice, his lips did not move either. Roger's grin widened and the sound of a rich laughter protruded from his being. Not exactly, he confessed. What you're perceiving is simply the voice of my spirit that lingers. Here. Having the ability to hear the voice of all things, you are a unique case. How weird is it? 
In a sense you're seeing a ghost you know. Luffy didn't respond, and Roger. Continued. Like I said, you did well to get here. And yet, I sense that your will has been compromised. That's quite a shame. One with an ambition as great as yours must have. Been through quite a lot to lose their drive. What kind of regrets are haunting you? Luffy looked down at the ground. I lost my comrades on the way here, he said numbly. I see, Roger said gravely. That's very unfortunate. When I met my end, my comrades were still alive and well, so I'm not sure what comfort I can bring. He paused. Tell me. Do you still desire my wealth and treasures? Does your heart still yearn for one piece? Luffy looked into his eyes and shook his head. This was not how it was supposed to go. He couldn't honestly say yes to that question. The only reason I'm here right now is so that I don't waste the sacrifices of those who died for me. I don't want their deaths to be in vain, he said. Roger stared long and hard and Luffy, as if assessing him, before the smile slowly crept its way back onto his face. Kid, I'm going to give you two options. Option 1, you walk into the cave behind me and inherit wealth, fame, and power beyond your wildest dreams. He paused for a few seconds, and then continued. Option 2, you turn away from your dream for now, and I give you a chance to do it all again. As he finished, Luffy stared at him blankly, not comprehending option 2 at all. Roger raised an eyebrow at him. What, too vague? I'm offering to send you back in time so you can do right by your comrades, he said. Luffy stilled, his mouth agape, and his eyes wider than they had ever been before. Can you do that? He asked quietly. Roger nodded. You'd be surprised at what I can do. I've long since transcended the laws of the living. The payoff of course, is that I'm dead. He threw back and head and laughed. So, what? Do you think? Option 1 or option 2? Luffy didn't hesitate. Option 2. He said numbly, still in shock that this was happening. He wasn't one to not believe in something just because it defied common sense, not all. Oh. But this seemed far too good to be true. He dot 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 he could save them? All right then, Roger said. He was grinning, as if satisfied with Luffy's decision. You might want to explain what's going on to your friend first. He's been calling your name for the past two minutes. Probably thinks you're batshit insane by now. Luffy awoke from his trance and his head spun towards Zoro. The swordsman stared at him in a mix between annoyance and concern. What the hell's with you? He asked. You. Were completely out of it there. Luffy immediately launched into an explanation of what had just happened, what he had just learned, and what they could to now. Zoro stayed silent, taking it all in. He was. Clearly skeptical. Well. Assuming this can be done, I'm all for it, he said, scoffing. But that's a pretty big assumption. Despite his pessimism, Luffy could clearly see the fire that had manifest. In Zoro's eyes, Luffy smiled for the first time in what felt like ages. Alright, let's do it. He shouted. Zoro scoffed again and threw his hands in the air, smiling despite himself. Alright, let's see what you can do, Pirate King. Right after he said this, his body immediately dissipated into nothingness. Luffy stared in shock at where his first mate had previously been standing. What the hell happened? Oh, that's right, Roger said. The body can't handle the mind being forcefully stripped away from it and transferred like that, so it vanishes in the process. Don't worry though. You'll both awaken in your old bodies. Did I forget to mention that? I guess I forgot to mention that. Luffy was too thrilled to be annoyed right now, so he let it go as Roger grinned sheepishly. I've chosen a moment that was significant to you to transfer your consciousness back to. It's easier that way, Roger stated. He paused. The third one will be difficult, but I think I can manage, he added ambiguously. Have fun. Before Luffy could question what he meant by that, his body dissolved, and he knew no more. Luffy opened his eyes and sat up in his bed. He sighed and got up, 
walking out the door onto the going Mary's deck. Another night without sleep. Oh well. He looked up at the stars and smiled. So far so good, Roger. All right straw ats, gather around. Luffy yelled as his crewmates yawned and made their way out onto the deck. Nami tells me we're a few hours away from Malavista, Luffy. Began. So I'd like to know how all of you are progressing. The hockey training is going about as well as I hoped, what with having a new learner and all. Chopper had readily begun the hockey training when he was told of it, all too eager to join the rest of the crew in their endeavors, however unconventional they were. But none of you have had any real breakthroughs yet, and you won't be able to rely on that in the upcoming fight. Luckily we accounted for this ahead of time and we've been playing to each of your strength as well. He turned to Nami. How's the weapon that you and Usopp were working on coming? He asked. It's done, she answered. We finished it last night. Usopp nodded in confirmation. All right, good. Make sure you learn how to use it though. You don't want any surprises if you end up fighting someone who's a threat. Nami seemed to consider this for a moment before nodding. Luffy turned to Usopp next. And how's the expansion going? He asked the sniper. Usopp grinned widely. Oh it's going. He said proudly. I've once again increased the intensity and area of effect of my explosive star. I also consulted Chopper, and he gave me variety of poisons that I've worked into my arsenal. They won't see it coming. Chopper had been reluctant to use his medical knowledge for something like that, but had agreed. When he was told it was to help save Vivi's country, on the condition that Usopp keep a variety of antidotes as well. Luffy seemed satisfied with his answer and addressed Sanji. And Chopper next. And how's your training coming along? He asked the chef. Sanji shrugged. About as well as it can be, he said. Luffy knew Sanji hadn't trained much during the previous timeline, with the exception of the two years that they had been apart. He had. Always seemed to keep up anyway though, despite being more laid back about it. This time, Luffy wanted to see how strong the chef could get if he devoted more time to. Increasing his strength, so he had instructed him to start joining Zoro in his individual training on top of the hockey exercises. Zoro reported that his kicks were starting to gain more power and that he was definitely getting faster. This had been good news to Luffy, but he'd been especially proud when Chopper had noticed them both during their training sessions and eagerly asked if he could join, even disregarding Luffy and Zoro's strength, which, with the exception of Zoro's duel with Mihawk, hadn't been pushed to the limit since they had arrived in the past, the crew was starting to become significantly stronger than it had been at this time in Luffy's previous life. Luffy and Zoro had discussed it and agreed that they would have to keep it up. They would be ready for anything when the waves got rough. Even Vivi had been working on refining the skills she'd been forced to acquire while infiltrating Baroque works. Once Chopper had confirmed that she was fully recovered, Nami had guiltily shown her the newspaper that she had been hiding. Upon reading that thousands of Royal Army soldiers had joined the efforts of the Rebel Army, she had been distraught. She was increasingly nervous on the route to Alabasta, and the Straw Ats could do little to comfort her other than come up with a plan. Alright, then we should talk about what we're going to do when we reach Alabasta, Zoro said. Luffy and I have talked about it with Vivi and we all agreed on the course of action. Our first priority is to get in contact with the rebel army. Vivi knows their leader, and she'll be able to convince him not to engage in the civil war once he learns who is really behind it all. Still, we don't want to put all our hopes into the plan. Crocodile currently has Alabasta in a vice grip, and there's a good chance that he'd find a way to start the war regardless. If that happens, we move on to Plan B. Plan B? Nami questioned. You guys are actually coming up with multiple plans, as if one wasn't enough of a miracle? That's right which? We need to be prepared. We're going up against a warlord who has a lot of influence in Alabasta. Plan B is simple. Take down Baroque works and subdue 
crocodile so that we can stop the war without any of their meddling. Nami, Usopp, and Chopper looked a little nervous about Plan B, but simply nodded. Zoro sighed. Truth be told, if he and Luffy had their way, that would have been Plan A but Vivi had insisted that they refrain from doing something that reckless until she was able to get in contact with Kaza. She was still pretty naive in that regard, but the real problem was that she didn't want their lives to be at risk fighting Baroque works. But she had at least acknowledged that Crocodile most likely wouldn't stand by and watch them stop the war, so she had agreed to the backup plan. It was another three hours before the straw at caught their first sign of Alabasta... in the form of a fleet of Baroque works billion ships. This will be tough, Vivi said, as a bead of sweat rolled down her face. These guys are different than the hired bounty hunters. With that many ships, if they notice us, they won't be a problem, Zoro said. Vivi looked at him worriedly. Are you sure? This isn't like what happened in Whiskey Peak. We're at sea, and they have us surrounded. Vivi Chan's right, Sanji said. I have no doubt we can beat them all eventually. But we'll just waste time and draw attention to ourselves. For now we should just ignore them. And get to the island. We only need to engage if they notice us. No, like Zoro said, they won't be a problem, Luffy spoke up. I just put them all into comas. They'll be out for a week. The straw at's reactions to this statement varied. Nam. And Vivi looked disbelieving. Usopp and Chopper looked odd, and even Sanji looked shocked, although he kept a moderately neutral expression. Zoro just smirked at their reactions. Chopper was the first to speak. You can do that Luffy? He shouted. Was it with that hockey stuff you told me about? Luffy had already explained what Conqueror's hockey was to Chopper while going over the basics of hockey again before he joined the training. Yep, that's it. Luffy responded. So cool. Usopp and Chopper shouted simultaneously, only to be yelled at by Nami. Don't believe him so easily. How could he just knock out all those people from all the way over here? How long will you continue to underestimate our captain? He can do a lot more than this, Zoro commented. That was only about 200 people, Luffy stated. Even if they were spread out, that's not enough to push me to my limits. Usopp was deeply impressed. How many people can you knock out then? He gasped. Luffy thought for a moment. It depends. If they were all that weak. I guess about 150,000. Usopp's eyes bugged out of their sockets, Chopper looked at him starry-eyed, Nami was clearly still disbelieving, and Sanji looked a bit disturbed. 150,000. If that's really true, he could defeat the Alabastian royal army single-handedly if given enough time, Vivi thought. Could such a power really exist? And without the aid of any devil fruit? That's ridiculous. Nami said. You could take down armies without lifting a finger if that was true. Why do you think they call it Conqueror's Hockey? Zoro asked lazily. Disregarding the world government and its affiliations, you'll find that the most influential people in this world usually possess the king's will. That's not to say that it's an accurate measure of one's strength, but no one can deny that the ability is what its name implies, a manifestation of one's will to conquer. I can only think of a few exceptions... One of them being this guy, he said as he pointed at Luffy. Really? Usopp asked. But doesn't he want to conquer the Grand Line? I don't really want to conquer anything, Luffy admitted. I don't mind making a name for myself, but in the end that's not really my goal. I just think that the person with the most freedom in this world is the Pirate King. I plan on obtaining that freedom... and sharing it with anyone who calls themselves my comrade. Nami couldn't help but smile. She always wondered what Pirate King meant to Luffy. There were two things she could say for sure that she knew the value of, freedom and money. The world map that she would one day draw wasn't just a means to both, but she'd be lying if she said that the vastness of the open sea wasn't extremely alluring to he. She had to admit, if she was told to choose between fame, power, 
and freedom, she would always choose the last option. Now if one of the choices was wealth on the other hand, Usopp was actually tearing up. In a way, that was what being a brave warrior of the sea was all about. It had never been the promise of wealth, fame, or power that had attracted him to this life. Before he knew that his father was on a Yonko's crew, and even now, it was always the promise of freedom that lured him out to the sea. There was a reason why before he became a true pirate, he could spend hours just staring out at the infinite waters. Sanji was thinking about All Blue. Yes, it was a chef's paradise, but now he realized that it was more than that. Deep down, every human being craved freedom. It was a basic human instinct. There was a reason that he never felt completely satisfied on the Barity, and it was the same reason he had stayed there. Although his guilt regarding Zeph was slowly releasing its grip on him, Sanji would never truly forget what he had taken from the old man. But that was also the reason he had left. If Zeph's search for freedom could even be partially fulfilled through him, Sanji would make damn well sure that he lived free as can be. Chopper continued to stare at Luffy in wonder. He thought back to his days with Hilyuk and what the Sakura tree really meant to him. He had long since learned that it would take much more to fulfill his dream to prove there was a cure to every disease, but there was a reason that the Sakura in full bloom was so appealing. He had grown up in a land of eternal snow. As a reindeer, he was satisfied with that, but as a reindeer, human hybrid, there was always a part of him that looked out towards the sea in curiosity and wondered what else the world had to offer. Hilyuk's Sakura was the first taste of the vastness of the world, and it would always hold a place within his heart, even if it couldn't literally cure diseases. Now, full speed ahead. Luffy shouted, breaking them all out of their thoughts. To eat at the nearest restaurant. I mean, to save Alabista. In the center of Nanohana, there was a crowd gathering around a local restaurant. It's getting pretty noisy over there, a white-haired man said as he smoked two cigars. Yes, there seems to be quite the commotion, the blue-haired woman next to him replied. Apparently a customer spontaneously died while eating. Captain Smoker. A marine yelled as he ran towards the marine captain. You're not going to believe who we found. The Straw Ads had docked and were now debating what their first move should be. Zoro suggested that they search the town for any intel on the whereabouts of the rebel army. Vivi stated that there was no need, since she knew their base was a noob, but Zoro insisted that they should try to gather information anyway, seeing as she hadn't been back home in a while. This led to Vivi acknowledging that her information could possibly be out of date, and she agreed. Nami's eyes narrowed. She once again found herself in a position where she couldn't fault his logic, but she still couldn't shake her unfounded suspicions. Zoro usually thought things through, but at best he was a big picture guy, not a detailed planner. Every now and then though, he showed a surprising degree of attention to detail that even she herself couldn't match. It was almost as if he knew what to look out for. Was she imagining things? She turned to the rest of the crew. None of them seemed to pay it any mind, except for Sanji, who was staring at Zoro curiously. Meanwhile, Luffy had been staring off into the distance, towards the center of town, with an unreadable expression. Zoro broke him out of his trance. You should go. We'll search for the rebel army and you can meet up with us later, he said. The rest of the crew looked back and forth between Zoro and Luffy in confusion. Luf rubbed his head sheepishly. Yay, sorry. I'll be right back, he said. Where are you going? Usopp asked. Don't tell me you're just going to the nearest restaurant to stuff your face. Believe me, this isn't just any restaurant. Luffy said enthusiastically, causing the entire crew minus Zoro and Sanji to face fault. Zoro tossed a wave over his shoulder as Luffy took off in a high-speed sprint toward the center of town. Sanji stared after him. When Luffy arrived at the restaurant in question, he slowed his pace to a walk. He was close enough now that he could hear the familiar voices inside. What should I do? One voice said. 
You could just sit there and let me arrest you, the second voice suggested. Rejected, the first one replied. Luffy paused in front of the door and took a deep breath, mentally bracing himself for the coming reunion. To be honest, I'm not really interested in you. I'm looking for a different pirate, the second voice stated. You could just let me go, the first suggested. I can't do that. So long as I'm a marine, and you're a pirate. What a stupid reason. Chill out man. Luffy walked in. The sound of the door opening instantly gathered the attention of both men and their observers. The two men, who had been seconds away from a confrontatio, now stared at the newcomer with wide eyes as he casually walked towards the counter and sat down on nearest stool. Hey old man, can I get a couple rounds over here? He asked the bartender. He then pointed to the dumbfounded man in the seat next to him. This guy's drink is on me, he said. The bartender looked back and forth between the narcolytic and the newcomer before nodding frantically and pouring two cups of sake. Luffy turned to his brother in all but blood and grinned. So, how've you been, Ace? He asked. The whitebeard pirate was now staring at him with a deadpan expression. You always knew how to make an entrance Luffy, but that was another thing entirely, he said as he rubbed his temples. Well, what can I say? I live to surprise you. Luffy replied. The bartender set two cups in front of them, and the two of them exchanged cups as their observers watched, before proceeding to chug their drinks. Brings back memories, doesn't it? Ace asked, reminiscing. Yay, but it just doesn't feel right until I snatch your food, Luffy said with a smirk. Ace's eyes widened as he looked down at his plate, which was now empty. He sighed in. Annoyance. As fast as always I see, he grumbled. He was about to say something else, but they were interrupted by a familiar voice. Stop ignoring me you dipshits. Smoker shouted in frustration. Ace and Luffy turned to him in acknowledgement. Oh yeah. Forgot about him, Ace thought. Gee Smokey. If you really want a drink I'll buy you one too. Relax, Luffy said. I've been waiting for this, Straw Hat. The marine captain said, completely ignoring him. Ever since Logetown, smoke started to emanate from his body as he pulled the jut off of his back. Ace looked back and forth between the two in amusement. You really want to do this? It'll end the same way it did in Logetown, Luffy said. Calm down Smokey. Live life a little. Have some food and chill out. Luffy got his answer in the form of a pillar of smoke rushing towards him. He and Ace both jumped out of the way, but soon found the entire building filling up with smoke. Maybe we should take this outside Luffy, Ace suggested. Good idea. Gamu Gamu no, Pistol. Smoker crossed his arms in front of him and blocked the incoming blow, but it still pushed him back out of the restaurant. Luffy quickly caught up to him with a quick soru while Ace walked calmly behind them. A crowd was quickly gathering around them along with a squad of marine soldiers. Smoker San. Tashiga yelled as she made her way to the crowd. Her eyes widened when she caught sight of Luffy. Straw Hat? Smoker got his jut ready again while Ace walked up next to Luffy. I'm surprised. You can already use hockey, he commented. I was expecting to have to step in, but I guess. You've got this. Yay, just sit back and relax Ace. I'll show you something interesting, Luffy replied. Well that's no fun. I was looking forward to fighting this guy, but it looks like he's after you, which means I'm stuck with the cannon father, Ace said, as he took note of the many marine soldiers loading their weapons and taking aim at them. Suddenly the two found themselves being riddled by bullets. Only this didn't achieve the desired effect. The bullets passed harmlessly through Ace's flame body and the marines ended up shooting each other. The bullets that hit Luffy ricocheted off of him and also impacted with the unfortunate soldiers. Now the only marines left standing were Smoker and Tashi Guy. Smoker looked like he'd had just about enough. White Blow. Luffy sidestepped Smoker's lunge and grabbed him. Halting his momentum, he aimed a punch at the smoke man's torso only for a hole to open up in the spot. 
where his fist occupied. The smoke quickly closed around his arm, trapping him, and Luffy's senses reminded him to be wary of a certain sea stone jut. He used a sword to jump back and broke free of the smoke right before said jut crashed down into the pavement where he'd been standing. Smoker lunged at him again, making multiple thrusts with the jut, which were all dodged. Tashigai tried to aid Smoker, but found her path being obstructed by Ace. Sorry, I kind of want to see how this plays out, the flame man told her. Would you mind not interfering? You've gotten faster Smokey. And you've learned from our last encounter, Luffy said. It was true. Smoker wasn't increasing the volume of his body this time, choosing to rely. The speed provided by his devil fruit to trap him. But dot 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 it's still not enough. Luffy ducked under the next thrust of the jut and kicked Smoker in the face from below, sending him high into the air. Smoker righted himself and hovered in the air using his Logia form as he turned back to his opponent. Only Luffy wasn't on the ground anymore. There wa. No warning as Luffy's leg impacted with his head from behind and he was sent careening back towards the ground, making a small crater in the pavement. He tried to shake off the cobwebs, realizing he probably had a concussion, but before he could attempt to get up, Luffy's arm shot down like a rocket and embedded itself in his gut. Smoker coughed. Up a clump of blood and blacked out. Smoker sand. Tashigai shouted as she tried to get past Ace again. Ace was quick to intercept her at every turn though, and in desperation, she swung her sword at his neck. Ace did nothing to defend himself, and her sword decapitated him, causing her eyes to widen. She quickly realized that she had bigger things to worry about than her morals at the moment though, and rushed over to where Smoker lay unconscious. He had a concussion and a few broken ribs. She thought back to when she had found him like this in Logetown. His injuries had been more serious then, but to be honest, this situation was much worse. Their entire squad was injured, and there was no way she could get them all out of here, let alone cover their retreat. Tashigai stiffened and turned around to see Luffy standing behind her. She readied her sword again, her mind racing. She knew she couldn't beat Strawhand. Captain Smoker was far stronger than her, and even he had lost. She couldn't call for backup either. He'd just take the chance to end the fight. The sound of a raging fire drew her attention to the man she had just unwilling killed, only to find him still standing. Her eyes widened in horror as flames converged around his neck and his head reformed. He was a Logia user. Nice technique, Ace commented lazily. But without hockey it's useless. And even then dot 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 you froze up when you killed me. Have you ever taken a life before? Tashigai gritted her teeth as she realized the situation she was in. Her hands started to tremble from how tightly she was grasping her sword. Luffy took note of this and raised a eyebrow. What, you two? He said. You and Smokey both need to lighten up. I'm not going to kill you even if you hold some stupid grudge against me. He turned and walked away. Leaving Tashigai dumbfounded. Hey Ace. Let me introduce you to my crew. You're gonna love them. Ace's head perked up as he smiled widely. Now that sounds like a plan. They must be some fascinating folks if they decided to follow you, he said. Sure are. They're really interesting to say the least. We even have a talking transforming reindeer, Luffy said. The two brothers continued to chat amiably as they walked down the street, leaving an extremely confused Tashigai, an unconscious smoker, and a squad of injured marine soldiers in their wake. Would you care to repeat that? Nami asked with lidded eyes. The straw hat crew's faces currently conveyed a myriad of various expressions which included confusion, shock, annoyance, skepticism, excitement, awe, and just about any other emotion that you would expect to see on their faces after their captain just said this is my brother, Portgas D. Ace, who you probably know as Firefist, second commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, Luffy repeated for the second time. Silence. For a long moment, unyielding silence. Then. Stop doing that, you sop said, 
causing Luffy to quirk an eyebrow. Doing what? Stop. Doing. That. Nami repeated, putting emphasis on each word. A confused Luffy opened his mouth as if to respond, then paused in thought for a moment. Okay. I'll just stop doing that then, he said, as if that would be the end of the discussion. Nami would have none of it. And what are you going to stop doing? She asked, with the tone a mother might use to lecture a child, as Ace looked back and forth between the two, wishing he had a snack. For the show. How the hell should I know? Luffy mumbled indignantly. Why don't you tell me? What do I have to stop doing? You have to stop delivering shocking news as if you are predicting the weather. Nami shouted in annoyance. Half an hour ago you told us you could knock out hundreds of people with a single thought, and now you casually mention that you have a brother, and that he just happens to be Firefist Ace, a crewmate of the most powerful pirate in the world. Of all the ridiculous things to behold, Usopp's lies are second only to your truths, and he makes a spectacle of them. It's like you have no sense of subtlety whatsoever. Nami started taking deep breaths, her rant finished. Midway through, Ace had shot Luffy a questioning look, most likely in regards to the knockout hundreds of people with a single thought part, but Luffy had just given him a look that said later. Ace had just shrugged but a ghost of a proud smile could still be seen tugging at his lips. Oh come on Nami, name one other time I dot 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 actually, on second thought, name five other times I've done this, Luffy said. You're just proving her point you know, Zoro commented, causing Nami to turn in his direction and point an accusing finger at him. And I'll bet you knew about this, didn't you? She asked. So what if I did? He asked lazily. You gonna charge me interest on my debt of things I'm not obligated to tell you? Nami was about to respond, but was interrupted by Ace. Oh. So you did tell at least one of your crewmates about me, he said jovially. And here I thought you'd be an inconsiderate little prick and not even mention me once. Well. Once is better than nonce I guess. Oh come on Ace, that's not fair, Luffy whined. I mean. Does Whitebeard know about me? Ace rolled his eyes. Luffy, our entire crew knows about you. Said crew has over a hundred times more people than yours, not including our allies, and even the new guys learn. About you within a few days of joining. Whitebeard himself was in bed with a hangover the morning after your bounty made the papers, congratulations by the way, in fact, th. Only member of our crew who wasn't bedridden that morning was our first division commander, and he has regenerative powers. Luffy by now was rubbing the back of his head guiltily. Ah, sorry Ace. I guess I'd just like to say the news for the occasion. You have to admit, it's pretty entertaining blowing. Their minds like that, he said as he motioned toward his attentive crew. I knew it. Usopp said enthusiastically. He does do it on purpose. I'd tell you to pay up Nami, but I know better than to take any money from you, and I have no doubts that it would come back to bite my ass if I did. You're right. You'd end up paying me back ten times over, maybe more depending on my mood, Nami remarked absent-mindedly. So anyway, where are the others? Ace asked curiously. Didn't you say there were seven of you? There are. A few of us, Vivi, Sanji and Chopper, are out searching for Alabasta's rebel army, Luffy replied. Ace blinked. I'd ask why one of your crewmates has the same name as this country's missing princess, but I assume it has something to do with why you're searching for the rebel army to begin with. Luffy nodded. We're here to stop a civil war. Ace stared at him curiously. It's not really like you to get caught up in things like that. What brought this on? He asked. Vivi's our comrade, Luffy responded, without missing a beat. If she wants to save her country, we're with her all the way. Ace grinned and nodded in understanding. Well, that sounds like it could be difficult. The rebel army is pretty determined from what I hear. I'm not sure Vivi can persuade them, even if she still has a good standing in. Alabasta, Ace said. Vivi knows someone on the inside, Zoro replied. But that's not the real problem. 
We'll have to take down one of the seven warlords if we really want to end the war. Ace frowned. You mean Crocodile? What's he have to do with this? He's the one instigating the civil war from the shadows, Zoro said, causing comprehension to dawn on Ace's face. That explains quite a bit actually. Well then, he said, turning to Luffy. How are you planning to beat Crocodile? Do you think you can take him in a straight fight? You saw Pand. Nami looked at Luffy, silently asking the same question. Of course I can, Luffy said, before pausing. I'll most likely be fighting him in the desert though, so I'll have to be careful. You know about his power then, Ace said, with a hint of surprise in his voice. You're more prepared than I thought you'd be. You've changed quite a bit since I last saw you. Luffy smiled morbidly. You have no idea, he muttered, causing Ace to frown slightly. As quick as it came, Luffy's gloomy mood disappeared, leaving Ace to wonder if it had be. There to begin with. Luffy? Gloomy? Was he imagining things? I've changed in more ways than one Ace, Luffy said in a slightly smug tone. It wouldn't be so one-sided this time if we sparred. Ace smirked at the unspoken challenge. Oh really? Just because your first bounty is higher than mine was, you think you can give me a run for my money now? I think I can do a lot more than just that, Luffy replied evenly, although the nonchalance in his tone didn't match the enthusiasm on his face. Zoro couldn't help but mirror the grins as he watched the two brothers stare each other down. Well then, Ace began, the confident smile never leaving his face. I'll just have to put that on a list of things we need to talk about later, along with how you awakened Doll. Three forms of hockey so early, and why both you and him, he said, motioning to Zoro, are both suppressing your auras. He paused. And we might as well throw in sense. When does Luffy think I'm an idiot while we're at it? Luffy, for his part, was suddenly taking great interest in the clouds overhead, while Usopp stared in confusion and Nami in growing suspicion. Suddenly, Zoro scoffed. Believe me, that's going to be an interesting discussion. Very interesting, Luffy added, still staring at the sky. Chopper, are you sure about that? Vivi asked in a hushed tone as they made their way through the crowded streets of Nanohana. I am, Chopper replied. It's hard to tell because of all the perfume around, but I can still make out the scent of gunpowder. It's really strong. I'm not sure what that could be other than the rebel army, Sanji commented. Anyway, we're lucky. We came across a lead pretty fast. Lead the way, Chopper. Chopper nodded, and he took off through an alleyway in Walk Point, Sanji and Vivi trailing behind him. It started to dawn on Vivi what this could mean. If it really was the rebel army, then they were just a hair's breadth away from preventing the war. The relatively uneventful trip back to the ship consisted of Ace dispatching of a group of overly ambitious bounty hunters, and beyond that, awkward silence. While Luffy, Zoro, and Ace were content to put off the annoying conversation they all knew was coming until they got back to the ship, and Usopp accepted the state of confusion he was in, Nami was inclined to send frequent, conspicuous glares in the direction of Luffy and Zoro making it quite clear that she was not a fan of being left out of the loop. Nami was a suspicious person by nature. She was never given the choice to be anything else. But even though her philosophy was to have a healthy skepticism for, well, everything, she also knew when to have faith in something for what it was. But for better or for worse, having faith in people wasn't something she had made a habit of until Ju. Recently, she had faith in facts. She had faith in her experiences. She had faith that there was a very limited number of things she could put her faith in. Her crew is one of them. But to what extent did she trust them? It was a question she hadn't really thought about. Did she trust them to the extent that she trusted North to always be North, South to always be South, to and two to always make four? There were some things in life that were constant and eternal. Was Luffy one of them? Was Zoro? Could humans really be s consistent and solid in their ways that you could have complete faith in them to never betray you? 
the more she thought back on their journey so far, from that small detour to Shellstown all the way to Alabasta, the more she wanted to say yes. But her mind kept coming back to one inescapable fact that continued to draw ever closer to her line of sight, Luffy and Zoro were hiding something. It begged the question, what didn't they want the rest of the crew to know, and why? Whatever it was, it seemed they were willing to tell Ace. Whatever conversation they were going to have when they arrived at the ship, she and Usopp were apparently not going to be a part of it, which annoyed her to no end. Was he simply on a need-to-know basis? Whereas the rest of them weren't? Or did Luffy not trust them as much as he trusted his brother? Nami's eyebrows furrowed. No, that wasn't right. Luffy's trust in her had never wavered even when her loyalty was questionable at best. If anything, he was too trusting. Did she even have a right to question him for not telling her some things? Nami sighed. She was being a hypocrite, no doubt about it. When they got back to the going merry, Zoro led Ace to the training room where they could speak in private. Luffy turned to Nami and Usopp and rubbed his head rather guiltily. I'm sorry about this guys, he began. It's just, there are some things. He trailed off, not really knowing how to put it. Surprisingly, Usopp flashed a smile and gave him a thumbs up. No worries Luffy. If this is something between you and your brother, the great Captain Usopp will respect your privacy. Along with the rest of the crew, he nudged their navigator. Right, Nami? Nami crossed her arms and pouted for a split second before nodding, which caused Luffy to smile gratefully. Luffy. It's fine if you're not ready to tell us everything. I know I'm not really one to talk in that regard, she said. But just dot 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 never feel like you can't tell us something because of how we'll react, okay? Whether because Luffy was surprised at her sudden change in demeanor, or because she was spot on, her words seemed to strike a nerve in her captain, whose eyes widened. Suddenly before he averted his gaze. I apostrophe ll dot 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 keep that in mind, he said, before jumping up to the higher floor of the ship and following his brother and first mate inside. He found Ace waiting patiently, twirling one of Zoro's weights in his hand. So where should we start? Zoro asked in a serious tone. Well, you can stop trying to hide your strength for starters, Ace suggested. I already have an idea of how strong you are anyway. He ended up eating his words when Luffy and Zoro both stopped suppressing their auras, causing his eyes to widen, and almost causing him to drop the weight in his hand. Luckily, he caught it. What? How? Why? I have so many questions. Well, start with whichever one you want Ace, Luffy said in an amused tone. What the hell is going on? Well that's comprehensive, Zoro said with a snort, causing Ace to glare at him. This makes no sense, Ace said, rubbing his temples. You two just arrived in paradise and you both feel stronger than most New World pirate captains. Where did you even leave? To use hockey? There's next to no one in East Blue who can use it, and no pirate in the first half who can use it as well you've shown. Where we learned is kind of a long story, Luffy said. But let's just say we both had very good teachers. As to why we're so good at it dot 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 it's because we've been to the new world. Ace looked up at Luffy in surprise. What? Even if you had miraculously survived a trip like that, there's no way you could have made it without anyone noticing. Especially. Gramps. When could you have? It was over two years from now, Luffy said, answering his question before he could finish. Ace stared at Luffy for a full ten seconds, as if trying to figure out if he was being played. Then. Oh hell no, he said finally speaking up. You did not just talk about a future event like it already happened. Luffy, I know you. You suck at lying. You have no talent for it. You can hide the truth, you can refuse to talk, hell, you can even keep quiet as a determined psychopath punches you in the face with spiked gauntlets, but you can't lie. Still, if you're serious about what you're implying dot 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 that you're we're from the future. Luffy confirmed, cutting off his rant. 
Ace groaned and threw his hands up in the air in exasperation. Oh sure, you're from the future. Yay, and I'm a park ranger. He sighed and relented. How did you do it? And why? He asked finally. Zoro was the one who answered. As to how, let's just say we made it to Rathlin and leave it at that. Ace gave that some thought before shrugging and nodding, and Zoro continued. As to why dot 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 there are some things that we want to prevent from happening. So in other words, you're playing God, Ace clarified. Call it what you want, Zoro replied. We don't really care about the ethics of it. Ace turned to Luffy and raised an eyebrow, but his brother just shrugged in agreement. All right Luffy, I get that we're not saints, but you're meddling with time here. Are you? Sure you know what you're doing? Ace asked. At the time, I wasn't really sure at all to be honest, Luffy admitted. I just knew that I had nothing left to lose. That comment made Ace wince. It wasn't something he wanted to hear. Was it that bad? He asked. Zoro nodded gravely. What dot 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 happened? Neither of them answered. As he looked back and forth between the two, he took note of their behavior. They both had their fists clenched and were looking down at the floor. In dot 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 guilt. As he tried to wrap his mind around that, he noticed something that shocked him. Luffy was trembling. A sudden realization hit Ace. There's a reason why you're telling me all this. The second he said that, Luffy looked back up at him. Only Ace was no longer looking at Luffy. He was looking at a ghost, one whose expression rightfully haunted the flame man to his very core. This couldn't be Luffy. He was too old, too scarred. The happy-go-lucky 14-year-old that Ace had left behind. At Dawn Island dot 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 this wasn't him. And yet, in a way that Ace couldn't explain or describe, it was. Ace dot 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 it's been so long. He said quietly. Ace took a few seconds to gather his thoughts before responding. I died. It wasn't a question, but Zoro nodded anyway. And you flipped the world onto a different axis just to save me? He asked with narrowed eyes. This elicited a dry chuck. From Luffy. No Ace. That was just the beginning. It all started with your duel with Blackbeard, Zoro stated. Ace stilled. So I got done in by teach? He asked. Zoro thought he detected a hint of annoyance in his voice. No, worse. He handed you over to the world government, Luffy replied, causing Ace's eyes to widen in recognition. If he did that. Zoro completed the thought for him. Whitebeard wouldn't let them execute you without a fight, but the world government was determined to do it, even if it meant. Ace covered his face with his hand. War. Luffy and Zoro gave him a minute to collect his thoughts. He finally spoke again. So where do we go from here? That's the part you're not going to like, Luffy said. Whatever you do, you can't confront Blackbeard. Not yet. In our timeline he became a huge problem, but if we can prevent the war of the best, he'll lose his chance to gain the power he's looking for. You should know that he already got the Yami Yami no Mi from Thatch, and he's already someone to be careful of. Yeah I'll bet, Ace scoffed. If he took me down, he's a force to be reckoned with. He thought for a moment, then sighed. You're right Luffy, I don't like it. The old man warned. Me not to go after the bastard, but I was determined. I still I am. But if going after him is going to bring my own crew to ruin, then I'll hold off on it dot 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 for now. At least until I'm sure I can beat him. Luffy's shoulders slumped in relief. The first big step had been taken to shaping a better future. The Whitebeard War had changed a lot, and not for the better. He would still have to pay close attention to make sure it didn't happen though. He couldn't account for all the factors after all. Is there anything else you think I should know? Ace asked. Well yeah actually, Luffy replied. Sabo is alive. Ace didn't think he could ever sympathize with Nami more than he did at that moment. Guys, what the hell are we doing here? I can't believe we're here right now. He's going to kill us. We're so dead. 
What? I don't wanna die. Shut up you idiots. The two complaining voices were silenced by the third, but their defeated expressions conveyed what they thought of the current situation perfectly fine. Mr. Three, a fourth voice spoke up, they have a point. What makes you think the boss will spare us? Shouldn't we get far away from here? You're talking a lot more now that our lives are on the line aren't you, Miss Golden Week? And I already told you, it doesn't matter where we go. He'll find us. Our only choice is to ask for a second opportunity to get rid of the straw ads. Hey, isn't that jumping the gun a bit? Asked Mr. Five. Even assuming that he'd give us a second chance, he hasn't contacted us since he gave you those orders. That means he probably thinks you're dead. We could escape right now and he'd never know we survived. No, he'd find out, Mr. Three said somberly. Don't underestimate the boss' ability to gather information. Especially when he has Miss All Sunday working for him. He won't leave in. Loose ends. This is crazy, Miss Valentine said. You're just going to walk up to him and say sorry I failed the mission, let me try again. This is Mr. Zero we're talking about. I didn't ask for your opinion. Mr. Three hissed. If you want to run, go ahead. I never asked you to come with me anyway. Miss Valentine gulped. She knew he had a point, but she also knew their chances of evasion, and by extension survival, were quite a bit higher with Mr. Three with them. That's what I thought. Now let's get going. The more time we spend here, the more time we give the straw ads to arrive in Alabasta. If they interfere with Mr. Zero's plans, we'll never escape his wrath. On cue, the four undercover agents scurried down an alley towards the center of Nanohana. Are we getting close, Chopper? Vivi asked in mid-run. Yes, the human reindeer confirmed. The scent of gunpowder is getting stronger. I'm certain there's a high concentration of it up ahead. Vivi nodded as she panted heavily. They had completely left Nanohana and were now in the neighboring oasis town of Katria, to the east. Vivi was surprised Chopper's nose had picked up whatever scent they were following. Hey Vivi Chan, the rebel army would be trying to stay hidden right? Sanji asked. Yes, that's right. So they'll probably have guards on the lookout won't they? Yes. Why do you ask? Because I just found some of that gunpowder. You too. Stay right where you are. A voice spoke up from above them. Vivi and Chopper looked up to find a man on a nearby rooftop aiming a rifle at them. Sanji was not so coincidentally standing in between the man and Vivi, whose eyes widened in recognition. Kebby? She practically shouted. This caused the man to temporarily lose his rigid demeanor, but he quickly composed himself. How do you know me? Identify yourself. Vivi removed the white hood from her head, and this time the man's eyes widened. He immediately lowered his weapon. Vivi. Vivi was smiling in relief. She never thought she'd run into another member of the Sunasuna clan. Well, other than Kaza. This made things much easier. Vivi, what in the world is going on? You've been missing for over two years and now I find you sneaking around in an alleyway? What happened? There's a reason I've been missing. I've been acquiring information, and it's crucial that I give it to Kaza. He is here isn't he? Could you please take me to him? Kebi considered this for a moment. Vivi was the daughter of the man they were most likely going to war with soon. But she was also one of them. They had long since thought. Her dead, but if she was alive, then he was sure they could trust her. She had nothing to do with the origins of the civil war to begin with. Come with me, he said, before quick jumping off the roof and leading them through the streets. They finally came to a rundown building in a less crowded district of Katria. Kebi knocked six times on the door, and they were let in. Kaza-san, you're not going to believe who I stumbled across. Who is it? Came a voice beyond the wall, one that instantly caused Vivi to inhale sharply. She decided to forgo all formalities and ran into the room where the voice had originated from. Kaza sat up in the bed in shock, his eyes glued to the new arrival. 
Vivi dot 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 how? Kaza, I know this is sudden after all this time, but you have to put an end to this civil war. You're being manipulated. My father wasn't the one behind the Alabasta's ruin. Whoa, Vivi, slow down alright? Just start by telling me where you've been all this time. Vivi took a deep breath. I've been in hiding so that I could find out who was really responsible for the current state of affairs in this country. The one behind this civil war, the one who really stole the rain. He's the leader of a criminal organization that's been working in Alabasta from the shadows. Two years ago, I infiltrated the organization to gather information and find out who the leader was. You what? Kaza asked in shock. I went undercover as a member of Borough Quirks so that I could find out what their motive was from the inside, Vivi said impatiently, wanting to get to the point. Vivi, how could you do something that reckless? You could have been killed. Vivi was taken aback by the audacity of his question. She gritted her teeth and you're any better? Here you are, about to lead our country into a civil war, tear it to ruins, and play right into his hands, and you have the gall to tell me I was being reckless? Kaza was pale. What do you mean I'm playing into his hands? His goal is to seize the Alabastian throne. That's why he framed my father and planted the dance powder in his palace. His organization has been behind everything so far, and the war will give him the perfect opportunity to take control of the country during the chaos. Kaza was silent for a moment. Who is he? The leader? He finally asked. Vivi sighed in relief. Now they were getting somewhere. Crocodile of the Seven Warlords, she replied. Kaza's eyes widened. This country's hero is the one leading it to ruin? He's no hero, Vivi spat. He just knows how to keep up a good public image. He knows that not even my father will suspect him if he pretends to have Alabasta's interests at heart. This is a lot to take in, Vivi, Kaza said, rubbing a hand over tired eyes. I know, but you have to believe me. If you don't call off the rebel army. I believe you, he said quickly. It's just that I can't tell them what you've just told me and expect them to believe me. But we haven't made a move yet, so there's still time. Does your father know about this? No, but I can send a message to him, Vivi replied. Good. Tell him everything you just told me. I'll send a request to the Royal Army to meet with King Cobra for negotiations. We'll make an announcement to the public that we're signing a treaty. That should throw a wrench in Crocodile's plans. Until then, he turned to Kebby. Nothing leaves this room. Kebby nodded. Vivi let out a breath she didn't know she was holding. Thank you, she whispered. Kaza was silent again before speaking. I'm sorry, Vivi. For everything. Vivi leaned forward and hugged him. It doesn't matter, she said. All that matters is that we can fix this and prevent the bloodshed. What will you be doing in the meantime? Kaza asked. I'll be keeping an eye on Baroque works. Actually, I was brought here by the Straw Hat Pirates. Without them, I wouldn't have even made it this far. But with their help, I have faith that we can put an end to Crocodile's plans. Kaza raised an eyebrow. I'll take your word for it. But be careful, Vivi. Vivi smiled. I will. She exited the room to meet Sanji and Chopper, and Kaza followed after them. During the entire encounter, no one looked towards a certain dark corner of the dimly lit room. If they had, they would have noticed a lone crystal blue eye on the wall, watching them from the shadows before it blinked out of existence. When Vivi, Sanji, and Chopper arrived back at the ship, they were greeted by the sight of Ace, who was introduced to them by Luffy. While Sanji and Vivi were shocked to find out that his brother was a commander of the Whitebeard Pirates, Chopper just stared at him in curiosity. Is Luffy's brother really famous? He asked Sanji. The chef blew out some smoke. Yay, you could say that, he responded. He's a living legend among pirates, a menace among marines, and an insurmountable goal to bounty. Hunters. He has a bounty of 550 million. Chopper's eyes widened. 
But that's over 10 times Luffy's. Is he that much stronger? Sanji shrugged. Beats me. They're both monsters. All it means is that Ace is more of a threat according to the world government. While he was vaguely aware of the attention he was getting, Ace was still preoccupied by the revelation that his long-lost brother was alive. As Sanji disappeared into the kitchen, Ace contemplated the many questions that had suddenly arisen. Luffy had told him that Sabo was with the Revolutionary Army. How had he ended up there? Well, Ace was sure. One thing. The object of his search has just changed. Hey, Luffy. The rubberman looked up from the food he was eating. Yay? What's up Ace? I was going to ask you to join the Whitebeard Pirates, but I'm guessing that would be pointless. You guessed right, Luffy said, grinning. Well then, I have another proposition for you. How would you and your crew like to form an alliance with us? Several of the Straw Hats collectively gasped, and Luffy himself was intrigued by the suggestion. Will old man Whitebeard be okay with that? He asked. I'm sure he will, Ace said, not really stressing over it. But will you be? I know you're aiming to be Pirate King. It would be a bit of a strange agreement, but considering the circumstances, I think it could be a good idea. I agree, Luffy said. And I'm not really worried about our goals clashing. If Whitebeard wanted to be Pirate King, he'd most likely have found One Piece by now. Same with Shanks. Ace's brow furrowed. He'd never thought of it that way, but now that Luffy mentioned it so matter-of-factly, that made a lot of sense. Dot, 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 did Puffs even want to be king? Questions. For later. Well, in that case, take this, Ace said, handing Luffy a small sheet of paper, which he took. It's my Viver card. If you ever need to find me, just follow it. Luffy noticed that there was also something written on it. A number. This is? The number to Pops Transponder Snail. I'm going to call him later and explain that I'm going to be looking for Sabo instead of Teach from here on. I'll also get his approval for the Alliance, and fill him in on dot 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 recent information. Luffy nodded. They had agreed that Ace would tell Whitebeard about his situation, but no one else. They could only imagine the headache it would cause if word reached the wrong people, so for now, it was on a need-to-know basis. Well then dot 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 until we meet again, Luffy, Ace said as he hopped off the ship and into his devil fruit operated boat. See you at the top. As Ace sped off, Nami's mind finally caught up with her. We're allies dot 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 with the Whitebeard pirates. She mumbled. Guess so, said Zoro with a smirk. That's insane. Exclaimed Usopp. We must be the only allies they have in this part of the Grand Line. Are we, like? Really important now? You're the crew of the future pirate King Usopp, Luffy said confidently. We're already important. He turned to Vivi. So did you guys find any leads on the rebel army? Vivi gasped. After the excitement with Luffy's brother, she almost forgot to tell them about what happened. As she explained that she had met up with Kaza and that he would be conducting negotiations with her father. Luffy and Zoro listened impassively. When she finished, Luffy just nodded. Sounds like it went smoothly then, Zoro said. I guess our next stop is Alubarna. We can supervise everything from there. Vivi nodded eagerly. She could hardly believe it. They had come so far, and finally, they were making progress. She quickly tied a note for her father to Karu and instructed him to deliver it to him. As Karu made his way across. The desert, Sanji's voice came from inside the kitchen. Lunch is ready. As the straw ads filed into the ship, Luffy and Zoro stayed outside. Luffy spoke up. It won't be this easy, will it? He asked. Zoro grunted. No, it won't. Especially not while Robin's working with Crocodile. Luffy pouted. We should have just recruited her back in Sake Summit. Whiskey Peak. And I don't think that would have worked too well, Zoro said, causing Luffy to pout more. I know. But it's really weird to have her as an enemy. Not to mention annoying. He thought for a moment. What do you think Croc's next move will be? 
I'm not sure. But I wouldn't put anything past him. Luffy's thought process was suddenly interrupted by the growl of his stomach, and the two went inside to eat with the rest of the crew. After lunch, the straw had set sail to the north up the Sandora River. Their plan was to drop anchor closer to Alubarna, as Vivi had suggested, before they crossed the desert on foot. In an underwater structure located in the center of Rain Base, Sir Crocodile of the Seven Royal Warlords sat in a comfortable looking chair. You wouldn't be able to tell, however. From the infuriated scowl on his face as he stared at the transponder snail across from him. You're sure about this? He asked in a deceptively calm voice. Of course. I had a hunch to begin with, but I've just confirmed it for myself, said a melodic voice on the other end of the line. Crocodile was silent for a moment. Very well, he finally said. I suppose I'll excuse your absence from the meeting if you don't make it in time, seeing as it would have been a minor setback had I not gotten this information. You're ever so kind, Mr. Zero, the voice said. Crocodile grunted. So then what are you planning to do about this? That's for me to know, he said in annoyance. But of course. I suppose it wouldn't be my place to know if it happened to have something to do with a certain cross-dresser. Goodbye, Miss All Sunday, Crocodile said before hanging up. He looked at the clock. 3 p.m. The number agents would be meeting at Spider Cafe in a couple hours. Minus M. 3 of course, that coward was no doubt on the other side of the Grand Line by now. It suddenly made sense why he hadn't been in contact since his report. The report had been false. To think he would fail his mission, give a false report, and then run with his tail between his legs. Crocodile hadn't thought highly of him to begin with, but he definitely hadn't expected this. No matter. He'd find him once Operation Utopia was over. 5 p.m., coast across from Alubarna. What is this thing? A turtle? Or a seal? Usopp asked as he stared down at what appeared to a seal in a turtle shell. Vivi's eyes widened. That's a Kung Fu Dugong! She exclaimed. A Kung Fu Du what now? Usopp asked as he got into what he presumed to be a Kung Fu stance. No wait! It'll take that as a Vivi flinched as the Dugong beat the crap out of Usopp in three seconds flat. Challenge! She finished. As it stood with its arms raised over its head in a universal sign of victory, Vivi closed her eyes and sighed, completely missing what happened next. Looks like we've got a winner over here, Nami commented as Luffy stood over the creature, posing in a manner that was very much similar to what the small sea mammal ha previously been doing. No, that's even worse. Vivi objected. The Kung Fu Dugong suddenly got up and bowed to Luffy. It's their custom to become the victor's disciple. Quite abruptly, the shore became filled with a swarm of Kung Fu Dugongs who were all seemingly intrigued by one of their own losing a fight. One briefly communicated with the original Dugong before they all looked up at Luffy with stars in their eyes. Luffy raised both eyebrows. I think I can only take one disciple right now. Sorry. Who says you're taking any to begin with? Nami raged. The Kung Fu Dugongs evidently took his words as a challenge however, and all charged at him. In seconds, they were all defeated and bowing to Luffy respectfully. Did this happen last time? Zoro wondered. Seems familiar. See? That's why I said I can only take one, Luffy told them. We can't bring all of you along. The Dugongs sulked as Nami, Vivi, Usopp, and Chopper listened in shock. He's actually going to bring one along? After a quick group lesson that Luffy was persuaded into, as well as a tearful goodbye, the straw had set out across the desert on foot dot 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 along with their new companion. So, you got a name? Luffy asked as he walked alongside the dugong that he had beaten first. He shook his head in a surprising display of comprehension. Okay then dot 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 I guess I call you dot 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 seal. What kind of name is that? Nami mumbled. Seal on the other hand, nodded enthusiastically, indicating that he was content with the name. 
not to trample on your random and spontaneous decision making Luffy, Zoro began, but can this thing even cross the desert? Good question, Luffy said, before turning to Seal. Can you? Seal nodding enthusiastically again, making punching motions with his arms that seemed to say I'm tougher than you think. Kung Fu Dugongs are sea mammals, but they're also fit to survive in desert climates due to their surroundings environment, Vivi said. He'll need to go back to the sea. Eventually, but he'll be fine for now. Luffy, satisfied with the knowledge, proceeded to drill Seal on various punches and blocks, as well as when to use them, as they continued their journey to Alubarna. Stoop joking around. Mr. Two yelled as he stood up in annoyance. How long are they gonna make us wait? They could at least give us some food in the meantime. I need. Hordervs. Hordervs. Mr. Two, could you please sit down and wait quietly? Miss Doublefinger asked in a tone of false politeness. No way. I'm gonna spin until they get here. Quit your yap and two. You're making my hips ache. Miss Merry Christmas snapped. Mr. Four started to say something as well, but it was slow to the point of being incoherent, so no, oh. Paid him any mind. Mr. One simply at the corner of the table, ignoring them all. But as Mr. Two kept spinning, he grew increasingly annoyed. You'd best sit down before I disembowel will you, he said quietly. Mr. Two turned toward him. This guy again. Was that a threat? Didn't it sound like one? I thought I was pretty clear, Mr. One said in a bored tone. I think it's pretty clear that Mr. Zero will disembowel you both if he catches you screwing around in here, Miss Doublefinger commented. Surprisingly, this pacified both of them. And Mr. Two sat down with a pout. About ten seconds passed before. Stoop joking around. Where are they? Mr. One was thinking about a more painful way to kill someone than disembowelment when his partner in crime spoke up again. You know, he has a point, she said. I wouldn't know what to expect from Mr. Zero, but Miss All Sunday is usually pretty punctual. On top of that, the Mr. Three and Mr. Five pair never showed up either. I can't help but feel that we're out of the loop. I'm afraid none of them will be able to make it said a deep voice from the end of the table. They all turned to the chair where the voice originated from in shock, none of them having noticed his arrival. Mr. One's eyes narrowed. When did he? A situation arose, and Miss All Sunday went to take care of it, the voice said. Unfortunately, she won't make it back in time for the meeting. As for the other four dot 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 I'd advise. You not to mention their names again. But no matter dot the time is near. He turned around in his chair, revealing his face. For your final mission, Operation Utopia. The officer agent stared in shock. Mr. Two's jaw dropped. Cro crocodile? Oh good, so you know me, the man said smugly. Of course we know you, you're one of the seven warlords. Miss Double a Finger exclaimed. But why would you be? You're our boss. Mr. One said, more in surprise than disappointment. So we were following the orders of a government-sanctioned pirate all along? Mr. Two exclaimed. Any objections? Crocodile asked menacingly, immediately silencing them all. None here, Miss Doublefinger stated, sweating a bit. I'm just confused as to why a royal warlord would go out of his way to form a criminal organization. What I desire isn't wealth or fame. Crocodile replied. It's power. The officer agents listened intently. Seeing that he had their attention, Crocodile smirked. Allow me to explain dot 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 the real reason behind the formation of Baroque works. My true objective. A few minutes later, after they all read over their mission orders, Mr. Two's brow furrowed. So I have a separate mission, huh? That's correct, Crocodile confirmed. Miss All Sunday was acting as a spy and was able to uncover that Princess Vivi and the Straw Ads have met with the leader of the Rebellion. As aggravating as it is, he now knows of our plan, which complicates matters. That's where you come in, Mr. Two. The number agents, who were all high up enough to 
know about Mr. Two's ability, all widened their eyes in comprehension. The rest of you, Crocodile continued, are to come with me to Alu Barna during the start of the operation, T. Deal with any pestilence. Until then, Mr. Two, your role is key. Alrighted. You can count on me boss. Very well then. You are to leave Mr. Two was already rushing out the back door, doing spins the whole way. Immediately, Crocodile finished, sweat dropping. It's about time, Miss Doublefinger muttered. Mr. One grunted in agreement. How unexpected. I never imagined that you of all people would be Mr. Zero. The number agents, Crocodile included, all turned to the source of the voice. While most of them were surprised to see Mr. Three, seeing as he hadn't shown up at Spider's Cafe. Crocodile's eyes just narrowed in anger. Mr. Three. You have some nerve showing your face here. Mr. Three said nothing under the heat of his glare as he continued walking forward. Thinking about the events that had led him to come here alone. 5 p.m. Spider's Cafe. There it is. The rendezvous point, Mr. Three said quietly as he observed who he assumed to be Mr. One calmly walked towards Spider's Cafe from a distance. He was concealed under a wax dome that was painted to be the color of a rock by Miss Golden Week. Mr. Two and the Mr. Four pair had already arrived, so the only one missing was strangely Miss Double Off Finger. Two should have arrived with Mr. One. Not that it mattered. Okay, the plan is simple. Once they begin their journey to meet Mr. Zero, we follow behind them discreetly. With any luck, they'll lead us right to the boss. This plan is doomed to fail. Miss Valentine hissed from behind him. The woman was in obvious distress along with Mr. Five. She's right. Her partner agent agreed. There's no way we can be that stealthy as a group of four, and even if we somehow make it to the meeting place, the chances of Mr. Zero for giving us are slim to none. At worst, we get killed by the Mr. One Bear. At best, we get killed by the boss. Mr. Five paused to let that information sink in. Mr. Three said nothing, so he continued. Listen, it isn't too late to turn back now. Even if he sends Mr. One to track us down, our chances of survival will still be much higher than if we walk into his base of operations and offer ourselves to him on a silver platter. Miss Golden Week was silent as she listened to the exchange. To be honest, she agreed with Mr. Five's logic. Mr. Three was being unreasonable. Irrational, almost. He was always the best at calculating their chances for success on a mission. Out of all of them, he should have been the one to come to that conclusion first. That could only mean one thing. Survival isn't your only goal here, is it? She suddenly asked, breaking the silence. Mr. Five and Miss Valentine looked at her in confusion. What are you? Mr. Five started to ask, before his eyes widened under his sunglasses and he turned back to Mr. Three. Are you serious? He asked numbly. His superior didn't even acknowledge the question, or turn to face him for that matter. You want to finish the mission? Miss Valentine whispered in horror. So what if I do? Mr. Three finally answered in an annoyed tone. You've got to be shitting me. Mr. Five almost shouted. He was having trouble keeping his voice under control now. We all saw how strong Straw Hat was. He wiped the floor with us all. Even if by some miracle you got your mission clearance, there's no way you can kill that guy. You'd risk all of us dying for the sake of your pride? Why would you risk your life for the damn mission? It's the only thing I would risk my life for. Mr. Three snapped, effectively shutting him up. He turned around and matched Mr. Five's glare. I already told you guys that you don't have to come. You just followed me of your own accord. If all you're going to do is complain, then why are you still here? What am I? your babysitter. If you want to go, then go. You. Only slow me down anyway. Mr. Five was silent for a moment. Then, he got up. Let's go, Miss Valentine, he said. His partner agent didn't hesitate for more than a second before she rose to her feet as well. 
She shot Miss Golden Week an apologetic glance. We're slowing you down? It's ironic that you'd say that, Mr. Five said. I know you're not really that blind to the situation. The only one here in danger of being chased across the Grand Line. He turned back to the wax man in apathy. Is you, Mr. Three. Miss Valentine may be officer agents, but we're not high up enough to be a threat to the organization if left alive. Neither is Miss Golden Week for that matter. Even if she's your partner, she's not privy to most of the secrets that you've been privileged with. The three of us aren't worth the resources and time it would take to track us down. As long as we're with you, on the other hand, he trailed off as Mr. Three narrowed his eyes. Do you know why we came with you? Mr. Five asked suddenly. It's because Miss Golden Week asked us to. We were simply respecting the wishes of our fellow agent and superior. One that we actually like, I might add. This news finally evoked a reaction from Mr. Three, whose eyes widened as he turned to the girl in question. She averted her eyes from him, staring at the ground. No matter. We're leaving while we still have the chance, Mr. Five concluded. I suggest you do the same, Miss Golden Week. With that, he and Miss Valentine left the dome and headed back the way they had come. Mr. Three gritted his teeth. Go with them, he said to his partner agent. Her eyes widened. He's right. You're not the one in danger, he continued. This is my problem. So get the hell out of here. His voice was almost bitter. Miss Golden Week didn't move. But I treat that as an order. Her eyes glistened as she slowly got up and reluctantly left the dome as well. She turned back toward him on her way out. Good luck, she mumbled, before turning away and following behind the Mr. Five pair. Mr. Three was jolted out of his thoughts by the voice of Miss Double Offinger. How did you even find this place? The officer agent asked. We didn't even know where we were being taken until we arrived. I was tailing you all since Spider's Cafe. I hid in the back of the carriage, Mr. Three explained, snapping back to reality. How clever of you, Crocodile said, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Now would you kindly explain why you're here and why I should refrain from gutting you? I came to request a second chance on my mission, Mr. Three stated. A second chance? Crocodile repeated. What do you take me for? I always assumed you were content with my zero tolerance policy for failure. Now that you've failed Demisio. For the first time, you expect to receive special treatment? It isn't that, Mr. Three said quickly. It's just that considering the circumstances. The circumstances aren't going to help you here, said Crocodile, his voice raising a little. If you were going to come here groveling for forgiveness, then you shouldn't have given me that goddamned false mission report. If there's one thing I hate more than a failure, it's a coward. Mr. Three's eyes widened in shock and confusion. A false mission report? I'm afraid I don't know what you're... Stop making a jackass of yourself, Crocodile spoke in a low tone, standing up from his chair. If the growing tension wasn't enough to make the rest of the number agents flink. This single action was... Only Mr. One seemed to be keeping his cool through the encounter. You reported that you killed the straw at St. Princess Vivian Little Garden. Because. You lied to cover your own ass, the straw ads were able to meet with the rebel army. He began walking toward the stuttering wax man. Now you have 10 seconds to enlighten me on why I should continue to humor your little request. Why you must be mistaken. I didn't even use my transponder snail once on Little Garden. I didn't give any report. Mr. Three defended. Crocodile froze mid-step, his eyes narrowed. H. Continued to stare at Mr. Three, as if searching his face for any sign of deception, an act that unnerved the wax man to no end. Eventually, his scowl lightened and then disappeared. Replaced by a chilling smile. Wait dot 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 what? Mr. Three rubbed his eyes to make sure he was seeing right as Crocodile burst into laughter. Clever bastard, the Sandman muttered. I'll kill you, make no mistake. 
It barely registered in Mr. Three's mind that Crocodile wasn't even talking to him anymore before he was yanked off the ground by a disembodied hand. In any other situation, he would have had enough clarity of mind to notice the sand trailing behind the lone appendage. As it was, he was busy gasping for air as he was suspended by his neck. A series of emotions flashed through Mr. Three's mind at that moment as he began to feel his throat drying up. They ranged from panic, to despair, to resigned acceptance, and quickly succeeded each other. But there was something else mixed in there as well. Regret. Not regret that he was dying. That he had expected to an extent. But his mind kept flashing back to that conversation outside Spider's cafe. He had already known that his th fellow agents could have left without him. That's why he had kept subtly telling them to stop following him. But to find out that they all realized it as well. It meant that they hadn't just been following him out of a need for survival. They had been following him out of loyalty. At the very least, his own partner had. No one had ever extended that type of courtesy to him before. And he had spit in their faces. No matter how much he kept denying it, that was bothering him. So it wasn't so much that his time had come that made him feel this regret. It was that his time had come, and he was so purely, hopelessly alone in the world, just as he always had been. Shrivel up and dry, Crocodile said with a sinister grin on his face. Stop! A new voice yelled. Crocodile turned his head in surprise to see none other than Miss Golden Week standing in the doorway. His eyes narrowed and he quickly dispersed into sand to avoid the circle of paint that was was splattered at his feet a split second afterwards, dropping Mr. Three unceremoniously to the floor. His body reformed a few feet awa, and his countenance conveyed unspoken promises of murder. It wasn't long before Mr. Five and Miss Valentine came running into the room. So, you all want to join him? Crocodile asked menacingly. Leave some for me, Mr. Zero. I was getting bored, Mr. One said as he walked towards the lower ranked agents, Miss Double a finger following behind him. Crocodile scowled. Kill each other for all I care. He was in a fairly bad mood right now, and his venomous tone was indiscriminate. Mr. One smirked. I myself don't feel like dying. Mr. Three watched the scene unfold in shock. He had never really counted on the slim probability of receiving a second chance to kill the straw ats. He was fully prepared to die her. He never expected that his fellow agents would come after him, especially after their previous fallout. So why? Why did they come back? He didn't have much time to think about it as Mr. One's arm morphed into a blade before his eyes. Supisipano me. Mr. Three immediately recognized in horror. He instinctively formed a wall of wax in between the blademan and his partner, sparing her the fate of being pierced. Between the eyes. Mr. One scoffed in annoyance. He turned toward Mr. Three but was interrupted as Mr. Five charged towards him. His explosive fist met Mr. One dead on, and the blademan was sent hurtling back by the force of the blow. He quickly righted himself, however. The lower officer agents were horrified to see that there wasn't a scratch on him. He almost looked bored. They're lining up to die, he commented as he walked back towards them. Miss Golden Week started to wave her brush again but was interrupted by Miss Double Off Finger. She was caught off guard by the woman's ability and yelled in pain as her hand was impaled by a spike that stemmed from the higher agent's finger. She dropped her brush to the floor. You have quite the troublesome ability, if I remember correctly, Miss Double a finger drawled as she retracted the spike. She prepared to drive another spike through the girl's head, but was blocked by a candle wall. Another one simultaneously sprung up in between Mr. One and Mr. Five, who was also saved the fate of being impaled by the durable materia. Mr. One grunted as his steel arms rebounded off the wax. Miss Valentine made the next move jumping high above Miss Double a Finger's speed and maximizing her weight. In a surprising show of reflexes, the spike woman leapt out of th. Way as her assailant came crashing down. Neat trick, 
she commented as she walked up to the crater her adversary had made. But it does leave you ever so vulnerable. In a split second, Miss Valentine's abdomen was pierced through by a spike that grew from Miss Stubble a finger heel. She screamed in pain as her blood leaked onto the floor as she was brutally pinned to. Mr. Five lost his head and ran at Miss Double Off Finger, but Mr. One was right behind him. Mr. Three was forced to divide his focus as he attempted to separate Miss Double Off Finger from Miss Valentine and shield Mr. Five from Mr. One. While he succeeded in the former, Mr. One anticipated the latter and slashed across Mr. Five's back regardless. The bombman groaned and felt he the floor. After only a minute, Mr. Three was the only one in shape to continue fighting. As Mr. One and Miss Double a Finger turned their attention to him, he quickly created Mar Wax. Candle Lock The quickly hardening wad of wax was fairly easily dodged by both agents, who both ran in to gut him. Not knowing what else to do, Mr. Three surrounded himself W. Wax. Bladed and spiked arms met the steel like substance head on but barely left a scratch. While Miss Double a Finger was beyond annoyed, Mr. One gave War a frightening grin. I think you overestimate the power of that wax of yours, Mr. Three, the Blademan said. Suddenly, Mr. Three could hear what sounded like a buzzsaw coming from the other side of the wall he made. Soon afterward, he felt an incredible force collide with it, and was horrified to realize that his wall was being shaved away. He was slowly losing ground to the spinning blades on Mr. One's arms. Miss Double a Finger smiled. Well, while you're busy with that, I suppose I should finish off the rest of them, she said, as she walked toward the other three defecting agents. No. Longer in a shape to defend themselves, they could only watch as spikes grew out of all of her fingers. Wait. Mr. One and Miss Double a Finger both halted what they were doing as they heard the voice of Crocodile. They looked back towards him, and noted with some annoyance that Mr. Four and Ms. Merry Christmas were sitting back and enjoying the show. Crocodile grinned menacingly. I have a better idea. Kaza frowned as he looked outside the carriage. They were on their way to Alubarna, but they seemed to be straying off course a little. Was it just his imagination? deciding to ignore it for now he pulled his head back inside and faced kebby you're nervous his follower commented lightly kaza sighed how could i not be what is he going to think of me if vivi is right about his innocence dot 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 how can i face him whether or not it's difficult you're the leader of the rebellion kebby said sensibly it has to be you it would be an even greater insult if you sent someone in your place. Don't you think I know that? Kaza muttered irritably. Kebi was silent for a while. Something else is bothering you, he said. Damn it, Kaza thought. That's what happens when your right hand man is also your childhood friend. Kebi read him way too easily. I just have a bad feeling, he admitted. Like we should have announced the ceasefire to the rest of the army. You know what would happen if we did that, Kebby argued. They would want an explanation, and if we released intel like that, it could reach Crocodile. That man has already manipulated us as if we were puppets tangled in strings. We can't risk it. We have to at least wait until after the negotiations so the leaders of both sides can come to an understanding. Yay dot 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 you're right, Kaza said reluctantly. Suddenly. The carriage stopped. Kaza and Kebi looked confused for a moment before they both climbed out to meet the steerer, WH. Had also gotten out. Hey, what are we doing here? Kebi asked, looking around. Why'd you stop in the middle of the desert? The soldier kept a blank face. I was ordered to, he stated. Kebi raised an eyebrow and looked at Kaza, who had his eyes narrowed suspiciously. I never gave you an order like that. The soldier smirked, causing both of the men's eyes to widen. No, you didn't, he said as he raised his rifle. Kaza reacted immediately, raising his leg and kicking the gun barrel to the side in one swift motion. The unloyal soldier looked surprised as the shot fired off to the side. As he tried to aim the gun back towards them, 
Kebi rammed into him with his shoulder, knocking him off his feet. He proceeded to kick the gun out of his hands. The solder gritted his teeth and tried to lift himself up, only to be roundhouse kicked across the face by Kaza, who then kicked the gun up into the air and caught it, aiming it directly at his assailant. Who are you working for? He growled. The soldier just smirked again. I don't know. But he's far more intimidating than you. Don't screw with me. Kaza shouted. Who is it? Is it that damn warlord? Surprisingly, this elicited a reaction from the man, whose brows furrowed. Warlord? He asked in confusion. Don't try to deny it, Kebi said. We have intel that states he's your leader. The soldier suddenly started sweating heavily, and not from the desert heat, as his expression morphed into one of overt fear. And judging from the look on your face, I'd say we're right. Hey, stop. You don't know what you're talking about. The man shouted. Kaza wondered why he was just now showing fear when he had been unfazed with a gun pointed at him point blank. I think we do, Kebi said, now the one smirking. The royal warlord, Sir Crow. Shut up. The man suddenly tried to lunge at Kebi. Kaza grimaced, but didn't hesitate as he shot the man directly in the head. He was dead even before he slumped back. Against the sand. Kebi rubbed his eyes. Just what was the point of all of this? He asked as he raised his arms and gestured to the barren desert around them. Does he think we're stranded? That. Neither of us can drive a damn carriage through our home country? Look at the tattoo on his arm, Kaza said, ignoring the rant. Kebi knelt down and looked it over, frowning. What is that? The mark of their organization? He asked. Perhaps. But regardless of what it is, we need to keep an eye out for it. From now on, anyone in the rebel army who is seen with this mark is to be brought in for questioning. Kebi nodded as they both stood up and started towards the carriage. Kaza frows. However, as he caught sight of something, or rather someone, out in the distance, it looked Lee. A dot 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 ballerina? I apostrophe M dot 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 ha dot 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 gonna dot 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 ha dot 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 ha dot 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 die. Usopp said miserably, his sentence made choppy by endless pants. Not before me. Chopper replied unenergetically as Zoro pulled him across the desert sand on this sled. The reindeer-human hybrid had been reduced to a semi-conscious, sizzling ball of fur. Being better suited to colder climates, he could barely walk in the desert heat. At least Chopper has an excuse, Sanji grumbled. You're just being melodramatic Usopp. Hey, I sure as hell do have an excuse. Usopp argued. I've suddenly come down with I can't walk through the desert anymore or I'll die itis. There's no disease like that, Chopper stated matter-of-factly. Sanji smirked. You heard the doctor long nose. Keep walking. Usopp's jaw dropped. Chopper, you traitor. As if to make his case more convincing, Usopp suddenly collapsed backwards onto the sand, making unconvincing wheezing noises. Can apostrophe T dot 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 go on? He groaned, raising his hands toward the hazy sky. Zoro sighed in annoyance and walked back to him. Don't make me carry you too. Come on, do you want to fall behind? I dot 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 won't make it. Go on without me dot 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 Zoro. If you say so, Zoro said with a shrug, before leaving him there in the sand and catching up with the rest of the crew. Usopp suddenly bolted up onto his feet and ran after them. Hey wait. Don't leave me. Zoro ooh ooh. Will you calm down you idiot? Nami reprimanded. All you're doing is wasting energy that you should be using to walk. Keep it up and you're just going to need more water, and... That's something we can't spare right now. Sanji had to agree. Most of them weren't faring very well with the sun beating down on them. Chopper was immobile, Nami refused to let him carry her, saying he wasn't to be trusted, which was probably true, some part of his mind supplied, Usopp was dot 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 well, he was Usopp, and he himself was sweating heavily. Zoro was toughing it out, but Sanji 
could tell even he was at least mildly uncomfortable. The only ones who seemed to be beating the heat were Luffy, Vivi, and dot 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 well, Seal. You three don't seem to mind the hot climate at all, Nami commented, voicing Sanji's thoughts as she looked at the three in question. Well, I was born and raised on this island, Vivi said, smiling. You could say I'm used to it. I'd imagine the same is true for Seal. Said Dugong nodded confidently before. Flashing Nami what could be interpreted as a thumbs up dot 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 minus the thumbs. Oh. I guess that makes sense, Nami said before turning to Luffy. But what about you? There aren't many deserts in East Blue. Nah, my home island had really good weather, Luffy replied. The reason I'm fine is that I can control my body temperature. This got the attention of the rest of the crew. Especially Chopper, whose head perked up in interest despite his severe discomfort. You mean you can keep your body temperature steady at will? Nami asked in amazement. Is that even possible? I guess so. I do it with a technique called life return. It lets me stay cool in the heat or warm in the cold dot 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 among other things. Life return? Chopper repeated in wonder. Come to think of it, you were walking around Drum Island in nothing but a t-shirt. Were you using the same thing back then? Luffy nodded. Yep, that's right. But what kind of technique is that? Chopper asked. His discomfort seemed to be momentarily forgotten, overshadowed by his interest in the medical phenomenon. It almost sounds like a type of biofeedback. Biofeed who? Luffy asked, his mouth suddenly watering at the thought of being fed. Biofeedback, Chopper corrected. It's an ability that a select few people can access through meditation and mental discipline. It allows them to achieve a higher degree of control over the body by exploiting its biological connection to the mind, gaining a greater awareness of bodily functions that most humans wouldn't be conscious of, and in turn, being able to regulate them. Luffy said, nodding sagely. Fascinating. You didn't understand a word he said, did you? Zoro inferred. Nope. What's wrong with you? Nami asked in exasperation. He's saying that biofeedback is the scientific explanation for the technique you use, one which you evidently don't understand. Luffy stared at her, the conspicuous lack of comprehension evident on his blank face. Basically it's a mystery technique Luffy, Zoro added. Ah, Luffy said, smacking his hand with his fist. Why didn't you just say so? Nami looked extremely annoyed now, whereas Chopper was in deep thought. Luffy, the reindeer suddenly spoke up. What else can you do with that technique? Luffy thought for a moment. A lot of things actually. For one, I can eat until I'm really fat and then turn all the food into pure muscle and energy. That's really useful before a fight. In fact, if I'm injured, it'll heal me to an extent. Chopper looked like he was in candy land. His eyes were shining. That's amazing. You're manipulating the enzymes in your body in order to convert the nutrients in the food to suit your needs. From the sound of it, you can even speed up digestion. How did you learn to do that? Luffy scratched his head. I just sort of dot 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 did it one day, he admitted. Come to think of it, when was the first time he did that? Was it an impel down? No, maybe Shabundi? He remembered healing injuries by eating meat since after his first fight with Crocodile, but that wasn't really an effect of the technique. Life Return just let him do it faster. What else can you do? Chopper asked eagerly. Well, I can increase my resistance to pain and fatigue. So you can actively release adrenaline into your system? Yay, let's go with that. I think I can also counteract some types of poison. By forcing your immune system to create specific types of antibodies? Sure, why not? Other than that, it does let me automatically activate my gears, and it also lets me maintain them longer. Gears? Sanji interrupted. What are those? They're ways that I can enhance my fighting style by taking advantage of my rubber body. Like this. Steam suddenly started rising from his body, which took on a red tint. 
Chopper's jaw dropped as he sat up. Luffy. You're showing signs of a dramatic increase in heart rate. He said in a panicked tone. Luffy just nodded as he continued smiling. Yep, that scare second. It increases my strength and speed. The crew looked on in amazement. The one who was most impressed by far was Seal, who shouted a series of high-pitched barks that was unintelligible to anyone other than Chopper... And evidently, Luffy. No, I can't teach you that. The only reason my body can withstand it is because I'm made of rubber. Seal looked deeply disappointed as he let out a noise akin to a sigh. Chopper's medical mind was going haywire. Are you insane, Luffy? Even if the increased blood flow enhances your bodily performance in the short term, the long term effects could be catastrophic. You're putting way too much stress on your body. Ah, it's fine Chopper. When I first started using it it was exhausting, but now my body is much tougher. Plus, with life return I can control how much I increase the blood flow. And choose which part of my body to direct the blood to. Like my muscles, or even a single limb. Actually, when he first started using it, he didn't realize that the blood was being distributed evenly throughout his body. It was before the crew was separated in Shabandi that Chopper had informed him that most of the extra blood he was pumping through his body was being wasted when he fought. Luffy. You're still in gear second as you're talking. Stop doing that. Chopper shouted indignantly. Luffy, realizing that he was right, quickly deactivated the technique. So is there a gear third then? Sanji asked curiously. Luffy grinned. You bet. He raised his arm, and the limb started to expand before their very eyes, until it was the size of a giant's. The crew, minus Zoro, looked on in shock. Usopp stumbled. Back. Seal pulled a quick 180 and was in awe again. What the hell? Your arm crew. Usopp shouted. Yep, because I inflated my bones. Cool huh? The crew stared dumbly and he laughed, shrinking his arm back down to normal size. So is there another one after that, or is that the limit? Usopp asked. His curiosity beyond peaked at this point. Luffy might have answered him, but Vivi chose that moment to point out a large rock formation that they could use for shade. The crew immediately rushed over to the rock. Usopp forgetting his own question entirely. Man, it really is hot out here, Nami complained. I wish we had something to ride. Like a camel maybe. Not all of us would fit on a camel though, Vivi pointed out. You're right. Nami admitted. A camel that only gave rides to us girls would be nice. Vivi's brow furrowed. What kind of camel is that? Nami shrugged. Is the plan in motion, Miss All Sunday? Crocodile asked. His tone contained a hint of impatience. It is, his partner agent replied. Mr. Two has reported that his infiltration was successful. Good. Then our rebel friend should be arriving any minute now. Crocodile stated, turning around in his chair to face her. Make sure they're comfortable with our other guests. We're moving ahead of schedule. Tomorrow, we move into Alubarna. Miss All Sunday's features were carefully blank as she nodded. Yes sir.